My name is Edward, and I'm a horror movie fanatic. Whether it's the classic movies or the newer ones, I usually enjoy them all. And to be honest, the reason why I can do that is that they don't scare me anymore. This is not because the movies are bad or because I'm a very brave person. No, quite the opposite. The reason I'm not afraid of them is that I lived through something much worse. As everyone says, many times, reality overcomes fiction. It all started the day Lucy, my sister, separated from her boyfriend. They had been dating for more than three years, and the moment she saw his messages and found out he was cheating on her, he left her. We told her that he was no good for her and that she would be better off, but she refused to listen. She was obsessed with him. As time went by, he stopped responding to her and she became more and more depressed. I did not live with her or my parents, but my parents told me that she hardly ate. She just locked herself in her room. From what little I could talk to her, I knew what she was doing. She was watching horror movies. You see, Lucy was never a fan of horror. In fact, she hated these movies. But her ex-boyfriend, Frank, loved them. Surely she was trying to win him back. This must have been nothing more than a last-ditch attempt. I knew that as a brother, I should try to comfort her since there was no way I would pay any attention to my parents. So one day, I decided to surprise her. How many times do I have to tell them not to come into my... Oh, it's you, Ed. Hey, did I come at a bad time? No, no, I was just starting to watch a movie. Do you want to join me? Of course. That day, we spent the whole day watching horror movies. The movies were not particularly good. They were all modern movies that were not scary. I took advantage of the time to talk to her about her life, her ex-boyfriend, and how she must be doing better. In the meantime, I recommended better movies. So when we finished the second one, she agreed to watch Chucky, my favorite movie. During the first few movies, Lucy was unfocused and lost. Her face was going from one place to another. She looked like a different person. When we saw Chucky, something in her seemed to change. She was focused, staring intently at the movie, almost obsessed. It seemed she had made the right choice. I left the house with a bittersweet taste. On the one hand, I had managed to talk to my sister. On the other hand, I found out something I didn't like. In a week, she was going to see her ex-boyfriend. During the whole week, Lucy was talking about Chucky every day. I assumed she was doing it because she was nervous about meeting Frank, so I went along with it. Everything was going great until that fateful day came. That day, a call came from my mother. She told me she was scared because she heard Lucy crying and screaming a lot. Our father was already pretty big, so there wasn't much I could do if there was a fight. I started my car and sped towards my parents' house. It didn't take long, but it felt like it had been forever. When I arrived, the door was open, and I was met with a totally different scene than I expected. Instead of two teenagers fighting, my father's corpse was in the dining room, lifeless. His body was all cut up. Someone had really taken it out on him. I ran as fast as I could to my sister's room, but on the way, I saw blood in the kitchen. I knew what this meant. My mother's body was behind the bookshelf. As with my father, her body was full of stab wounds, but this was different. Her fingers, her fingers were gone. Someone had made much crueler cuts than my father. So cruel that it didn't seem like an act of madness. Whoever had done this seemed to have enjoyed it. I fell to the floor crying, forgetting about everything else. 
My parents were dead. Suddenly, a scream brought me back to reality. It was my sister, screaming desperately from her room. At that moment, I understood everything. Her ex-boyfriend had done this, and now he was probably going to do it to her. I grabbed a knife from the kitchen and ran to my sister's room, ready to fight the man who had killed my family and was probably attacking my sister. When I opened the door, I fell to my knees in disbelief at what I was seeing. Frank was there, just as I thought, but he was not the one with the knife. Frank was on the floor wounded, covering a wound. With the knife in hand, Lucy was behind him, dressed as Chucky, screaming in pain. Ed, you're just in time! Lucy, what are you doing? I'm strong, brother. Just like you wanted me to be when you showed me that movie. What? This is all thanks to you. Thanks to you, I'm now strong enough not to depend on anyone. Mom and Dad won't order me around anymore. It won't hurt if Frank leaves me. I'm going to be as cruel as Chucky. I'm going to be Chucky. When I turned around, I understood why Lucy was screaming. Her face, it was like Chucky's. A needle was piercing different parts of her face, probably to imitate the wounds that the doll has in the movie. Only, hers was different. She was wounded. She was bleeding with a maniacal look running all over her face. This wasn't my sister. It wasn't even Chucky's look. It was as if a monster was looking at me. Lucy, you've gone crazy. This is not you. So it's not me, huh? I see, brother. You'll be a nuisance like mom and dad. What? What are you saying, Lucy? I just help you. I don't need anyone's help, Edward. I am happy now. And if you can't understand that, it's because you're just like mom and dad. And you know what? You'll have the same fate as them. At this threat, I pulled back and showed her my knife. But she didn't react to it. She didn't seem to care. It was as if she knew I wouldn't do anything to her. And she was right. She slowly approached me with her bloody face brandishing her knife, having fun for every second that passed. I'm sure the same thing happened to my parents. Everyone could have stopped her, but no one did. No one wanted to hurt Lucy. When she was in front of me, she lunged to attack me, but something saved my life. Frank had rammed her before she could give me a fatal blow. Run! It's too late for me. Get out of here now! In response, Lucy became angrier than ever and began stabbing him until Frank stopped breathing. I ran as fast as I could. I ran as if my life depended on it. And indeed, it did. I reached the end of the house, and as I turned around, I realized that Lucy was not behind me. She had never chased me. She was too busy stabbing her ex-boyfriend. I called the police and within minutes, they arrived at the house. I didn't want to see what happened, but one of them told me she was still stabbing Frank's corpse with a tetric smile. Luckily, she didn't turn on the police. She just gave them a blank stare as they took her away. Lucy was sentenced to life imprisonment. At first, I visited her every week, but eventually I stopped. She was no longer my sister. With each passing week, her voice and facial expressions became more and more Chucky-like. Her face wound had healed, but the marks that remained made her look just like the doll in the movie. I never understood how a movie could do so much damage. Maybe she was predisposed to it. I never got to see Chucky again, and I will never forget that day. The day that I not only lost my parents, but I also lost my sister. Hi, my name is Aiden, and I have a question for you. Have you ever worked at a fast food place? What's the weirdest thing that ever happened to you? I know a lot of people who have never really had anything happen to them other than drunken customers making a mess or family fights. In the beginning, I had never experienced anything like this, and I didn't think it would really happen to me, since I only worked in a humble neighborhood of Popeye's Chicken. I never knew that in just a few months, I would have the worst night of my life. The beginning of my night shift at Popeye's went along with the typical routine of a quiet night. 
It was around 10 o'clock at night, a time when we usually receive more customers, and the atmosphere was chaotic, with the intense murmur of conversation scattered among the tables. But among all the people talking, one person stood out. A very tall, thin man had entered. His eyes were small but terrifying, as they were wide open. He sat in a corner away from the rest of the diners, and what disturbed me most was not simply his appearance, but his fixed, penetrating gaze. He watched each individual with an intensity that sent chills down my spine. As the night progressed, more customers joined the scene, but this man remained static, making no requests, simply observing. It was as if he was analyzing people, studying their every move. On the other hand, no one noticed him. He was like a ghost that only I could see. Suddenly, the man walked towards a family having dinner. As soon as he arrived, he looked at them all and gave them a smile. However, there was something wrong with that smile. It was rather forced, as if he was practicing an emotion that did not come naturally to him. As he engaged the family in conversation, I could sense the discomfort in them, as if something was undoubtedly out of place. The man who seemed to be a stranger to everyone approached the tables uninvited. As he walked, his smile widened, but his eyes remained wide open. They never seemed to close. It was as if the man never blinked. Each word he spoke seemed more intense than the last, and families became increasingly terrified after meeting him. Some even grabbed their food and left. At first, all the families he spoke to tried to be polite and friendly, but as time went on, the atmosphere became more and more tense. The man's gestures were disproportionate and his laughter was enormous. I kept watching him from my position behind the counter, attentive to what was happening. Some children were crying and parents were looking at me sideways as if looking for help to get rid of this man without having to fight him. The man didn't seem willing to leave. It was as if he was enjoying the discomfort he was generating in others. I decided to approach, trying to remain calm. Excuse me, sir. Do you need anything? I asked with a forced smile, trying to hide the uneasiness that his presence generated in me. The man turned to me slowly. His gaze was fixed on me. It was penetrating and terrifying. I must admit that I froze. Oh no, I don't need anything at all. I'm just enjoying the company. Isn't that the charm of a fast food restaurant? His words chilled my blood. There was nothing in what he said that could be considered threatening, but something in his tone and look was sinister, as if he was toying with all of us. After a defiant smile, the man simply walked out of the restaurant as if nothing had happened. I could hear people still talking about the strange man who had appeared in the restaurant, but unlike before, they were now telling it as if it were an anecdote and making jokes no longer afraid that the man would approach their table and do something to them. Shortly after, the clock struck 11 o'clock at night, and I decided to go out for a short break. I walked out to the parking lot of the restaurant with a cigarette in my hand. I was still quite nervous about my encounter with the scary man, but I feel I handled the situation really well. Even so, I still felt a sense of discomfort. It was as if something was still wrong. As I walked out into the parking lot, my eyes adjusted to the darkness. I headed towards my car, but in a moment, a strange hunt made me pay more attention. There in the shadows, I made out the figure of the man. He was standing near my vehicle, watching it carefully. Hey, what are you doing here? The man slowly turned to me, his smile widening eerily. His face reflected an unsettling calm as if he was enjoying my surprise and fear. Without a word, he began to walk toward me with slow, deliberate steps. My heart began to pound. I instinctively backed away trying to get back to the restaurant. I didn't know how to handle the situation. The man, with his erratic gaze and unpredictable attitude, kept getting closer. Each step he took intimidated me more than the other. I was so scared that I could barely react. You don't need to be afraid. I'm just here to have a conversation with you. The man continued to advance toward me with a slowness that seemed intentional. I tried to run away, but suddenly something happened to me at the worst possible moment. As soon as I started to run, I fell to the ground, dizzy. It was hard to breathe, and I felt like I was going to die. I couldn't feel my arms, my legs. I couldn't feel almost anything in my body. Please, please stop. I'm having a panic attack. Please, don't do anything to me. Hey, what's wrong with you? 
Why is this happening to you? Are you afraid of me? I just wanted to talk. I'm s sorry. I'm not feeling well. I told you I need to talk. Suddenly, his expression changed. His head began to shake and his eyes got even bigger. It looked like they were going out of place. His scream was so loud that it made me cry out in fear, still unable to escape. Don't you understand? Can't you see I've been nice all night? Why can't I have a normal conversation with anyone? Have you all gone crazy? I want to talk. I want to talk. I want to talk. As soon as he finished the last word, the man lifted me off the ground with his two hands and threw me away from him. Crying, thinking I was going to have a heart attack, I started to drag myself to the restaurant. After mustering up some energy, I got up from the ground and made a great effort to run, but I stumbled. I fell to the ground, hitting the rough pavement with bated breath. Come on, can't you even run? Hey, come on, you can do it, just a little run. If you can't even run, some bad guy will hurt you. With the help of the psycho, I got up crying and ran again. I was limping, crying, humiliated. The sounds of footsteps behind me stopped. I dared to look back, and the man just stood there waving at me. With my heart pounding, I arrived at the restaurant. I tried to tell him everything that happened, but I fell back to the floor. I have had many panic attacks in my life, but this was the worst. I felt like I was going to die at any moment, but I still tried to talk. I needed the police to be called, or the psycho would hurt someone. Once I recovered, I was able to tell the manager to call the police, as there was a psychopath in the parking lot. Without hesitation, the man went to the cash register and started pushing the panic button under the counter. It didn't take long for the police to arrive, but the man was gone. Although I never saw the strange individual again that night or any other night, his presence continued to haunt me in every shadow, every dark corner of the store. As the restaurant closed, my manager called me a cab. As soon as the car started, I swear I could see a silhouette in the shadows looking at me. I could see the silhouette raise a hand and with a sinister smile, wave at me from a distance. That was the last time I saw that man again. To be honest, that was the last time I ever went near Popeye's. Nowadays, every time I leave my house, I do it with fear. There is no way for that psycho to know where I live but I always feel that he is near me, stalking me, ready to kill me. There is a misconception about actors. Everyone thinks that once we start acting, a world of luxury and fame awaits us if we have enough talent. The truth is that the world of cinema is ruthless and only a few manage to become famous. Sometimes it is because of the innate talent that the great figures have, but other times, the best actors are left behind and only those who are lucky or have contacts make it to fame. In my acting days, I don't know if I had the talent, but I had no contacts and definitely no luck. Or yes, maybe I had some luck, but not the kind of luck that leads you to stardom. But I was lucky to be alive. That day, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And sometimes I really don't know how I'm here to tell that story. Let me tell you the story from the beginning. My name is Alan, and along with my friends Elsa and Clive, we made promises to each other that we were going to be famous actors and we were going to do it together. We were all very supportive of each other before an audition, and most of the time, we were unlucky. The most we'd ever managed to do was work on a few commercials or do extras. We had never worked together until that day. That day, the fact that the three of us had been friends interested the director of a small independent film. He sent us an email saying that he was very interested in us. Since being real friends, we all fit together for a small project he had planned. A slasher movie about a killer ice cream man. The three of us were really excited. This would be our big debut in a movie and a horror one at that. Our favorite genre. We had always dreamed of this and no matter how the movie did, which we knew was a low-budget film, we would be happy. Or so we thought. We met the director a few days before. 
He was a quiet man with a very low profile. We didn't imagine him as a person who would make horror films. But you never know. Horror is a very curious genre, and it didn't surprise us that the quietest people can come up with such terrifying ideas. He showed us the film set. The ice cream man costume, everything. He seemed very excited about his movie, and I must admit that, as he excitedly told us about it and handed us the script over coffee, we got a little bit of his excitement. We slept in a cheap hotel room and took the opportunity to practice our scenes. The first scenes we were going to do was going to be inside the basement. Already being victims of a brutal ice cream man who was going to kidnap us and torture us to death. Since there were three of us and the director planned to have four friends in his movie, he hired another external actor to be with us. We hadn't met him yet, but that day, he would go before to film other scenes, so we would surely meet him there and we could coordinate to get together another day. Who knows, maybe he would end up becoming friends with us too. We went to the film set. These shots were going to be in the director's basement, where the psychopathic ice cream man would kidnap the victims and execute his tortures. When we entered, we were greeted by the director. Before we went in, he offered us something to drink to take with us, but we all declined his offer. We were really anxious to go to the film set and see the magic happen. We entered the basement and the image we saw surprised us. The ice cream man was really scary. He was dressed as an ice cream vendor on the table. He had a huge pot of ice cream. A young man was sitting there trying to scream in panic without success as he had something that was supposed to be ice cream in his mouth. We all thought it looked very real and were impressed. Until everything became even more real. As soon as we walked in, the actor who played the victim looked at us very scared and crying. He was acting really very well. But why was he looking at us? We were not in the scene and this was not part of the script. Suddenly, the director came in behind us and closed the door. The ice cream man kept shoving ice cream in his mouth, squeezing it inside and forcing him to swallow. This was not normal. The ice cream man seemed to be really hurting the actor. We quietly asked the director if he was being too rough, but he just smiled without looking at me. The man's muffled screams intensified. I could tell he was trying to resist, but he couldn't as he was tied up. Something in his desperation seemed all too real. Wondering if this man was giving the performance of his life. When suddenly something happened that made us realize what we had gotten ourselves into. While all these scenes were going on, we noticed that a camera was on and filming us. Part of me wanted to believe it was doing it for the bloopers, but no. This was really happening. This was really happening. There was no way an actor could take what the victim was taking. That man was not acting, but an ice cream man was really forcing him to swallow ice cream without letting him breathe. My friends and I arrived at the same performance, and my friend reached out to open the door, but it was closed. The director noticed this and called the ice cream man who stopped attacking the victim and approached us. At that moment, everything came to light. The director laughing, said that there was a small change in the script. He said that the movie he really wanted to shoot was about young actors who wanted to become stars until they got into the wrong movie. A movie where they weren't really going to play victims, they were really going to be victims. At that point, we panicked. We all tried to bang on the door and open it, but it looked like someone in the back was jamming it. When I turned to confront the director, I noticed that he had already taken quite a distance, and the one standing next to us was the ice cream man, who grabbed Clive with one hand and began to choke him with brutal force. Elsa and I tried to stop him, but it was impossible. Suddenly, we were surrounded by other men who were holding us from behind. The ice cream man continued to choke my friend with one hand. He resisted as best he could. He kicked him, tried to hit him, even tried to bite him, but nothing worked. He had less and less energy until he gave up. And when he did, the huge ice cream man made a strong movement with his hand, which was accompanied by a horrendous noise. 
Clyde fell down. His neck had been broken. After that, the men approached Elsa. Please don't hurt us. Please don't hurt us. Yes, yes, keep talking. This is gold. I wasn't going to let anyone else get killed in this. So in one strong and surprising move, I broke free from the two men who were holding me and rammed the door open. I made every effort to escape and call the police before someone else got hurt. But behind the door, there were two men waiting for me. They grabbed me and beat me brutally until I was knocked out on the floor. From there, I could only see Elsa crying. The ice cream man slowly approached her. He ordered the men holding her to let her go. He gave her a blow and she fell to the ground. And from there, he began to step on her head. I turned to the other side and did not see how Elsa died. What I did see was the director of the movie who was filming her passionately. No, no. <laughs> After Elsa, it was my turn. The man dressed as an ice cream vendor grabbed me by the hair and dragged me to the side of the first victim who had lost consciousness and still had ice cream in his mouth. Once there, the ice cream man plunged my head into the ice cream and began to choke me. I can tell you that was the worst feeling of my life. Not only could I not breathe, but the almost melted ice cream was getting into all my cavities, freezing me and causing me the most horrible pain I had ever felt in my life. Breathing became more and more difficult. I felt like I was fainting. What would happen to me first? Would I die from lack of oxygen or from the ice cream all over my head? I had already accepted my fate and had stopped fighting. Until salvation came. The guy who I thought was passed out and was still tied up stood up with the chair attached to his body and rammed the psychopath. Everyone threw themselves at him and I took advantage of that to recover my energy and run as fast as possible out of that place. They tried to chase after me but I had already taken too much distance. Crying, I managed to get out of the house. I almost collapsed on the sidewalk, crying for help. Luckily, there were police nearby, and before I fainted, I could see them running towards me. If there's one thing I'll take back from that day, is that I fainted at that moment. If I had been conscious, I would have told the police everything I knew. Maybe the young stranger would have been saved, Instead, by the time I woke up and was able to say what happened, it was too late. When the police went to the house where everything had happened, it was empty. They were unable to identify any of the criminals as the house was not even theirs. The victim or the corpse of my friends never showed up either. It was as if none of that ever happened. I moved on with my life and gave up my dreams of being an actor. I knew it wasn't the right thing to do and that these things only happen to one person in a million. But I already had that bad luck once. Who's to say it couldn't happen to me again? Today, I try to live a normal life. I'm afraid of people and I'm very antisocial. Sometimes I see the ice cream truck pass by my house and I remember that psycho who killed my friends. In those moments, no matter where I am, I fall on the floor and cry. I have been working at Burger King for the past three years. I have two teenage daughters to look after and a mortgage to pay. But due to lack of high paying jobs, I am stuck working at this fast food restaurant chain for so many years, despite having a degree. Most of the time, this is not such a bad place to work, but there is a man who has made all our lives hell. Now, you must think this man is our manager. But surprisingly, our manager is a lady who is super nice and understanding. However, there is a regular customer who loves to harass us, especially the female staff members. His name is Mr. Beck, and he is the fattest man I have ever seen. Not that I'm fat phobic or anything, but this dude is a creep. I'll describe this guy so you can paint a picture. So, this dude is very fat. He always wears a three-piece suit with a tie and all. 
However, he cannot walk on his own, as his legs cannot take his body's weight. So, he uses an automated wheelchair that he can control with a control near his hands. He is bald and as pale as snow, and wears expensive shoes and watches. Everyone knows he is loaded, but instead of eating some good food, he prefers eating two burgers, large fries, and a large chocolate milkshake from Burger King. But that's not even the worst part. Because he is our regular customer, our manager expects us to give him special treatment. And in the beginning, we weren't against it. However, the more familiar he got with us, the worse he behaved. For example, we often reserve a table for him, or at least make sure the one nearest the exit is available for him. We also bring him his food. Whenever a waitress brings him his order, he tried to grope her or touch her inappropriately. He had pulled this stunt so many times that now only the male members of the staff served him. He also passed lewd comments at some of the younger girls. However, he never did it around our manager. So even if we complained about him, our manager used to ask us to adjust a bit. However, this one time, he crossed the line. As all the male waiters were busy, a new girl who had started working there had to bring him his food. Now, I myself have two daughters, and this girl was like a little sister to me. Hey, you look new here, gorgeous. Mr. Beck said to Myla, the new girl. Not knowing anything about this creep, the poor girl replied. Yeah, are you a regular here? Yeah, I am. Mr. Beck said with a mouthful of burgers and fries. Nice to meet you. Now I'll leave you to it. Myla pointed to his food, smiled, and started to walk away. But just then, the man wrapped his fat, chunky hand around Myla's waist and pulled her into his lap. Before the poor girl could make out what was happening, Mr. Beck goes, If you sit on my lap and feed me this food, I will give you a hundred bucks. <laughs> then he started laughing like a maniac. Myla sat there frozen for a second, looking at us all behind the counter. Then she started struggling against his hole while the huge man laughed. All I could see was red. I instantly went over the counter and freed Myla from his grasp. The young waitress hugged me and started crying. You need to leave, sir, or else we will be forced to call the cops. Oh, you think you can get me arrested, miss? What are you, a mere waitress? You think you can get a man like me behind bars? I knew it was wrong to comment on someone's size, but this time I couldn't hold myself back. I had to give him a fighting comeback. Well, looking at you, I don't think you'd fit in a single jail cell. But I'm sure the cops could starve you enough to put you in one. This got the whole restaurant laughing. Everyone had seen what this man had done, and none of them were about to pity him. But I could see the rage in the man's eyes. He flipped his food tray, and in seconds, there were fries, pieces of bread, and chicken along with some spilled milkshake all over the floor and his table. You, you think you can he humiliate, humiliate me, you, you bitch? Now Mr. Beck was yelling at me. In one instant, he tried to get up from his wheelchair, but the fat man couldn't take a single step and fell face first into the mess he himself had created mere minutes ago. This got another round of laughter from everyone. Even Milo was giggling. But before anything more could happen, there were cops in the Burger King, and after hearing about the incident, the cops helped the man into the chair and arrested him. More of the staff members stepped forward and complained about his harassment, and he was forever banned from Burger King. Now all the staff members were very relieved. Even our manager supported us after the shit that went down. After that day, we never saw the fat Mr. Beck in the Burger King again. It was like a hex was lifted from our restaurant. However, a few weeks later, someone anonymous started ordering the same order Mr. Beck used to order. This order was to be left at the door of a big mansion. None of the delivery boys saw who picked up the order, but every day in the evening around five, the order used to be placed. Everyone was sure it was Mr. Beck, as he was, according to Daphne, one of our waitresses, addicted to junk food, but we didn't care much as no one had to deal with the fat man anymore. However, one day when the delivery boy delivered the order, which we thought to be Mr. Beck's, he returned and told us that the food he delivered yesterday was still by the door, which meant Mr. Beck 
had not eaten his order. Or he must have forgotten it. Some of the staff members even joked that the fat lad must have croaked with all the eating he does. We all laughed it off. But the next day, the delivery boy said that the food from the last two days was still by the door. This got us a bit concerned. However, if he was indeed dead, then who was making the phone call to order the food every day? We all hated the man a lot, so we did not think much of it that evening as well. But when the delivery boy reported the same thing the next day, our manager decided to call the cops and report the incident. Initially, the cops did not think it was serious either, because we were receiving the payment for each order on our online payment portal. But when this continued for five consecutive days, we requested the cops to take a look. Just to be sure everything was okay, I and my manager decided to go to the mansion while the cops checked it out. One of the cops decided to check through the windows when the owner of the mansion, whom we thought was Mr. Beck, did not answer the door. As soon as he peeked inside through the glass, he yelled for backup. Soon, there was a bunch of cops and paramedics breaking into the mansion, all while I and our manager were standing there clueless. Oh yeah, this is his mansion. His full name is Mr. Lambert Beckham. And didn't anyone tell you what's going on? No, officer. Well, looks like this dude died of a stroke weeks ago. Plus, he kind of choked on a fry, could not get to his milkshake, and due to the fear of choking, died of a stroke, and finally dies. But that's not even the worst part. There are like a dozen cats of multiple breeds in there, and he wasn't able to feed them for a week. These felines ate half the dead man. The medics will take whatever is left of his body. Looks like the cats didn't starve themselves and didn't mind eating their owner. Saying that, the officer left, and I and our manager just waited there not knowing what to do. A few minutes later, there was a strong rotten stench in the air, and then we spotted the medics carry some remains of what looked like a half-eaten Mr. Beck on a stretcher. I kid you not, that was the worst thing I had ever seen in my 35 years of life. Looked like the man got what he deserved after all. Have you ever heard of the legend of the Wendigos? They are supernatural and mythical beings that feed on human flesh. Their cold, powerful skin is resistant to almost anything except fire. And although they are blind, they make up for it with accurate hearing, unbeatable speed, and tremendous strength. Fortunately, it's not easy to become a Wendigo. Unlike werewolves, Wendigos don't infect you with their condition by biting or scratching you. The only way to become a Wendigo is to eat human flesh in the cursed area they inhabit, consisting of a forest and a huge cave. You may wonder why I am so interested in these monsters, right? Well, today, I will tell you about the time I encountered a Wendigo, and that encounter almost cost me my life. The day it all happened, I was very happy as my uncle gave me the keys to his cabin for two weeks. I was going to meet my friends the next day, but since I had plenty of time, I thought it would be a great location for my Tinder date. I had been talking to Angela for almost a month. I honestly couldn't bring myself to take the step to get off Tinder and meet her in person. I felt there was already some trust between us. We were already following each other on all the social networks, and we had stopped chatting on Tinder a while ago. With a lot of fear of her response, I told her to go to the cabin, and she accepted. The trip was long and annoying, as it used to be, but this time, I was not alone, so it was better. When we arrived, I felt at home. As soon as we arrived, we enjoyed the fireplace while listening to music and talking while cooking. The food was technically done, I just had to heat it up. The evening was going perfectly. Angela was fantastic, and I could tell that she was having a great time too. But something interrupted the date. Angela and I started to hear footsteps coming from upstairs. Was there an invader? How was that possible? Everything was locked and no one had forced their way in. There were no stairs nearby and the house was high enough not to enter through the chimney. Maybe it was our imagination, but just in case, I grabbed a knife 
and carefully made my way upstairs while Angela waited downstairs. As I approached the room, which was where the sound was coming from, I walked slowly to its source. Each step I took was quieter than the next. The sound became louder and louder. I could no longer deny that there was something. With a violent kick, I opened the door, and there I found the cause of the commotion. It was a small rat crawling out of a pizza box. Ugh, we're lucky we have a room downstairs. Hey, Angela, it was nothing. I'll be right back. Okay. At that moment, I remembered that my sister joined her friends a little over a month ago. Part of me was relieved, and part of me was furious with her for leaving something like that in the house. I turned around, ready to rejoin Angela. But in front of me, there it was. A huge six-foot being was a few feet away, walking in my direction. I wanted to scream, to run, to cry. I couldn't do any of this. I was paralyzed with fear, and when I think about it today, I realize that was the reason I am still alive. The being slowly approached me. At that moment, I saw its eyes. They were light blue like water, but strangely crystallized. This monster had something strange in its eyes. It was as if it was lost. That's when I realized that it was blind. At that moment, I remembered all the legends my grandfather told me about this cabin. Our parents would get angry when he told it, and we listened attentively, very amused. We never thought any of it was true. We never thought when dingoes really existed. I stood still while the being walked lost, looking for the source of the sound. Once it moved away, I walked slowly down the stairs. With each step I took, I felt more terrified than the last. Every fiber of my body was cramping. I felt an icy chill run down my spine. Somehow, I managed to hold it together until I had the worst luck of all. The same rat from before ran past me, and from the shock, I let out a little gasp of surprise. When I raised my head, the Wendigo was with his face in front of mine. He knew I was there. I could feel his breath on my face as he moved his head around looking for me. The monster opened his mouth for a moment, and I thought it was at the end of me. I could feel his horrible death breath coming in through my nose. I was terrified. I wanted to cry as hard as possible and succumb to my instincts to run, but I knew it would kill me. Silence had taken over the room, but this was a good thing. As long as I didn't make any rash moves, I could wait for the opportunity and escape. But this would not be so easy, as a voice would interrupt the absolute quiet and attract the monster's attention. Hey, is everything all right? Seeing that I was late, Angela came up the stairs looking for me, and without realizing it, she made herself an easy prey for the terrifying monster. <coughs> the monster ran violently towards Angela. This was my perfect opportunity to escape, but I couldn't leave her there. Almost as a reflex, I jumped at the Wendigo and threw it to the ground, knocking it to the ground as Angela desperately ran away. My beating off the monster lasted only as long as I surprised it, as it took control of the fight, grabbed me with its huge, sharp teeth, threw me out of the door, and I fell down the stairs. I took that opportunity to gather my energy and escape through the front door. Behind me, I could hear the monster running and jumping at an enormous speed, reaching me almost instantly. I slammed the door in the monster's face, but it started banging on the huge wooden door. When I got out, my car was gone. Angela had escaped. The monster was about to break the door. If I ran, it would surely catch up with me. I didn't know what to do. Luckily, a noise and a light behind me gave me the relief of my life. Angela was back. After opening the car door for me, I jumped in, and as we saw the cabin door destroyed and the monster running towards us, my tender date started the car and we escaped. After that, I called my friends and told them not to come. Thinking it was a joke, they went anyway. None of them encountered the Wendigo, but they found out 
that my house was destroyed inside, and they believed me. After that shared experience, Angela and I went on another date. But this time, it was a restaurant in the city. We never went to that cabin again, which was forgotten with time. Hello. I'm a YouTuber who is dedicated to showcasing serial killers and government conspiracies. Obviously, I won't tell you the name of my channel because I'm already a pretty big YouTuber and I don't need to bring that kind of attention among my followers. To tell you the truth, I'm a little uncomfortable telling you the story I'm about to tell you since I'm not very proud of it. But I need to do it so you don't make the same mistake I made when I was younger. Mistakes of being afraid of ghosts or spirits when there is something much more dangerous out there. At the time it all happened, I was only 19 years old. They were my first videos as an urban explorer, but I knew I had support from my friends and other urban horror explorers with much more established YouTube channels. They were the ones who recommended me to start YouTube, and as I was a very charismatic guy, they thought I would do surely well. But I'd have to make really good content from the beginning, and they would help me do that. That same Saturday, we planned to do an urban exploration in a cemetery. Even though I had a caretaker, the cemetery was really huge and my friends were convinced that we could make good content out of it. We all prepared to go to the cemetery that night. During that time, all my friends had a huge amount of subscribers by that time. That night, they were all going to be filming a video for their YouTube channels, which would also work in my favor since they were going to name me in the video asking their subscribers to follow me. That night was going to be my big night. There was no way I imagined it was going to turn into my worst nightmare. That night, we all got together at Greg's house for pizza. He had the biggest channel of all, and he was the one who made the equipment to start the exploration. I hadn't known Greg for over six months, but during that time, we became pretty close. Once the time was right, we all went to the cemetery. The place was large, and we knew that the guard spent most of his time at the main gate. The rest of the cemetery was covered by walls and big wires, but the cemetery was very old and neglected, so many of these wires were broken. We started passing our cameras and tape recorders through the holes and then went in ourselves. We went in one by one until all four of us were through. It was only a few minutes after we started entering the cemetery, and just like that, we were inside. Honestly, I didn't know much about the cemetery and I always fantasized about exploring it at night. I thought it was going to be fun since we were going to be among friends and that would take the tension out of the whole situation of being in the cemetery. But the opposite happened. We were all very scared. There was a very strange aura, as if something was wrong, as if we were disturbing something we had no business disturbing. We kept walking through the cemetery shining the light on the terrifying graves. The cemetery looked destroyed and the mausoleos were broken, revealing sarcophagi and wilted flowers. My friends kept walking, ignoring most of the graves. They seemed determined like they knew where they were going. Greg's attitude was the one that caught my attention the most. He looked scared, but he was still determined and went ahead of everything. Suddenly, they all stopped in a huge mausoleum. Well, guys, here we are. What's in here? Didn't we tell you? We didn't just come to explore a destroyed cemetery. This is the grave of a boy who was brutally murdered on his way out of school. Normally, his parents would pick him up since he lived far away. But that day, the boy was leaving early and his parents forgot that. As I said, he lived far away from home but he wanted to walk home anyway. He didn't feel like waiting for his parents, and he didn't mind going through dangerous places. And that's when... What? What's wrong? Are you all right? There was something. Someone peeked out of the mausoleum. A black shadow. A head. We all took a few scared steps back, but with the camera up. Hey, you should get closer and film. What? Why would I do that? You're the new guy. You should get closer. I hated to admit it, but they were right. They trusted me to be part of the team. They were going to recommend my channel and make me grow. The least I could do was to encourage me to be like them. 
I slowly approached the mausoleo. I felt that something I shouldn't play with was in front of me, but I didn't care. I just turned off my brain and kept walking, terrified, but with a courage I had never had before. I pointed the camera inside the mausoleum, and there it was. Guys, there's nothing here. When I turned around, I received no answer, but everyone was looking at me with a look of absolute panic on their faces. When I turned around again, there was a strange figure looking at me. It was a girl, but she was dressed as a bride. Her face was white and terrifying. Her body was full of blood. I wanted to run, but I was paralyzed. Without warning and aware that I couldn't move, she ran towards me. All I could do was close my eyes. I was paralyzed, full of fear, waiting for whatever I had to wait for. Suddenly, there was silence. The silence went on for a few seconds until I heard something else. Was it laughter? When I opened my eyes, all of my friends were laughing loudly. The girl in front of me didn't look so threatening anymore. She was laughing too. She wasn't a ghost, a zombie, or a demon. She was Greg's girlfriend. The cameraman was also laughing loudly while he kept filming. At that moment, I understood everything that was going on. This... This isn't about me, is it? You guys are not doing this to help me. You just want to upload the videos to your channels and make everyone make fun of me, right? Oh, come on now. You really thought you considered yourself brave? You're a cowardly kid with no talent whatsoever. There's no way you're going to become as famous as us. <laughs> hey, hey, don't be so hard on him. Don't be so hard on us either. This will help you too. You see, everyone may laugh at you now, but this will bring you a lot of views. People will love you. <laughs> For being a coward. <laughs> Isn't that what works on YouTube? I walked towards him with every intention of punching him, but something made me stop. There was a shadow behind him. While everyone was still taunting me, an adult approached Greg from behind, attacking him with a huge machete. We all ran, but the man threw the machete at us, hitting me in the leg. All my friends stood there watching me, nervous. I know they could have reached me. I know they could have helped me but they didn't even try. They all ran away in desperation, escaping from the cemetery. A few seconds later, the man was next to me, reclaiming his machete that was stuck in my leg. The wound was not serious, but it left me totally immobilized. I tried to crawl before the eyes of this terrifying man, but without mercy, he began to step on my head and move it from side to side as if I were a cockroach. So you like jokes, do you? Do you like laughing at the dead? Do you like to film yourselves and then laugh? I tried to answer that I had nothing to do with it, but every time I tried to speak, the men stepped on my foot harder and harder. I saw how your little friends were filming the mausoleo. Did you know there's a dead girl there? My wife's grave is a few meters away. Would you make fun of her too, eh? Full of fury, the man raised his machete, ready to bury it in my skull. When the least expected help arrived, the security guard lunged at him to save me, and the two men began to fight. Although he was doing his best to save me, it was easy to see that the security guard was losing the fight. The psychopath was able to take him down easily, and kneeling on top of him, he beat him brutally. I gathered all my strength to jump towards the psycho, and with the last of my energy, I bit his ankle as hard as I could. In the face of this distraction, the guard hit him with a stone and the psychopath vanished on the ground. It was all over. The police arrived shortly thereafter and were horrified by the crime scene. The man was arrested for manslaughter and to this day, he is still not out of prison, nor do I believe he will be. As for me, I never heard from my so-called friends again. They blocked me from all social networks and never spoke to me again. On the other hand, I did make one friend. 
The security guard at the cemetery saved my life, and from time to time, I would visit him until I moved. On those visits, he told me all about the psychopath. Apparently, he had seen him several days before, sneaking into the cemetery at night with his huge machete, looking for unsuspecting victims to attack. His true identity was never known. Shortly after, he confessed that his wife was not buried there. He didn't even have a wife. The only thing that became clear to me is that you don't know who you might meet or what things he will do to you. That day, I stopped being afraid of the dead. You know, the living scares me more. The 7th of November, 2014, was a day that marked a turning point in my life. Before that faithful day, I was someone who enjoyed experiencing new and exciting things. But after the horrors I witnessed at the Velisca Axe Murder House in Velisca, Iowa, I hadn't had a good night's sleep since. To fully understand my story, I'll need to take you back to the 9th of June, 1912. One of the most horrifying days the state of Iowa has ever seen. It all began with a family called the Moors. The head of the house was a man named Josiah B. Moore, and his wife was Sarah Nee Montgomery Moore. The couple had four children named Mary, Herman Montgomery, Arthur Boyd, and Paul Vernon. The Moors were a very well-known and affluent family in the community, and they were liked by everyone. That Sunday, the couple's 10-year-old daughter, Catherine, invited two sisters over to spend the night at their home, as they were her friends. Catherine's friends were named Lena Gertrude and Ina May Stalinger. Lena was 12 and Ina was 8. After the visitors had settled in, the entire Moore family, in addition to Lena and Ina, went to the Presbyterian Church that evening. The family visited the church because they were participating in a Children's Day program that Catherine's mother, Sarah, had coordinated. The Children's Day event lasted until 9.30 p.m. that night, and when it was finally over, the family and their guests walked home. They all arrived at the Moore's residence between 9.45 and 10 p.m. And that was the last time the family and their guests were seen alive. On the 10th of June, 1912, sometime around 7 a.m. that morning, a woman named Miss Mary Peckham started to get worried after she noticed that the Moore family had not come out to do their morning chores. Miss Peckham was one of the Moore's neighbors, and not seeing them out and about this early was odd. She knocked on the door to see if everything was okay, but nobody answered. She knew that eerie silence was strange, so she tried opening the door, but it was locked. With no other options, she called Josiah's brother, Mr. Ross Moore, to help her check on them. When Ross arrived, he called out to his brother, but no one answered. So he and Miss Peckham decided to get into the house with Ross's spare key. When they finally got in, they were met with a horrific sight. The disfigured bodies of the Moore family and the Stellinger sisters were found in their home by Ross Moore and Miss Mary Peckham on the 10th of June, 1912. The authorities were immediately called to the scene, and an investigation revealed that the murders had taken place between midnight and 5 a.m. The killer, who had been waiting in the attic for the family to fall asleep, started the massacre from the master bedroom where Josiah and Sarah Moore slept. The killer used an axe to repeatedly hack Josiah's face. The cuts to his face were so vicious that Josiah's eyes were missing, and his corpse was unrecognizable. The authorities also noticed a gouge mark in the ceiling of the master bedroom, from where the killer had lifted the axe to murder him. When Josiah was dead, the killer set his sights on Sarah and he brought down the axe's blade on her head, shattering her skull with his continuous blows. As for the couple's children, he used the blunt end of the axe on their heads as he crushed their skulls. The vicious killer had bludgeoned them all to death in the same morbid manner as their parents. After that, he went downstairs to the guest bedroom and killed the Stellinger sisters. Josiah Moore was only 43 when he was killed and his wife Sarah was 39. As for their children, Herman was 11, May Catherine was 10, Arthur was 7, and Paul was 5. The gruesome murders of the Moore family and the Stellinger sisters shocked the entire town of Velisca. A manhunt was carried out to find the person responsible, but the killer was never found and the crime still remains unsolved. Now, I'm sure you're wondering how this gruesome case has anything to do with my experience. But just like the Moores and the Stellinger sisters, I too had a horrific experience in their family home located at 508 East 2nd Street, Velisca. Just like most people in Iowa, I've known about the murders for as long as I can remember. I was born on the 13th of October, 1978, nearly 66 years after the murders. But even after all that time had passed, this gruesome case was still being talked about. The gruesome case was dubbed the Velisca Axe Murders, and it's often been called the most mysterious case in the United States. During my early teenage years, 
I always wondered why the Velisca Axe murder case still maintained its longevity. There were many other disturbing cases in the United States that have left the minds of the masses, and I often asked myself why the Velisca Axe murders case was so different. I looked into it a bit more when I grew older, and I soon realized why this particular case was so different than the rest. It's because, while some people believe the Moors are long dead, many others are convinced that the Moore family and their killer still roam the halls of their family home in Velisca. The rumor started a little while after the gruesome murders, as many people claimed to hear the screams of children coming from the house. Most of the Velisca residents wrote these rumors off as jokes. But as time passed by, people who visited the house came back telling more unexplainable and bizarre stories. A couple who visited the home said they could hear the Moors' children laughing as they ran around the home playing. Two young women also reported capturing strange phantasms and apparitions on their cameras. The stories got even crazier over the years, and in 1994, a woman named Miss Martha Lynn bought the house and restored it to its 1912 condition. She stripped the Moore family home of electricity and plumbing, and she turned it into a tourist attraction. Since then, people from all over the world have come to the Velisca Axe Murder House to stay overnight and undergo paranormal experiences. The Velisca Axe Murder House has had a slew of visitors ranging from paranormal investigators to ghost hunters, and it was eventually named one of the most haunted places in America. The house grew to new heights of popularity from there, and it seemed like everyone wanted to visit there. Well, everyone except me. Even though I grew up in Iowa, I always stayed clear of the place. As I said earlier, I was the kind of guy who enjoyed experiencing thrilling and exhilarating things. There were very few things I would say no to, as I was always down for anything. However, the only time I drew the line was whenever it was anything paranormal related. It had been like that since I was little, as I was always against exploring the supernatural or paranormal world. My grandmother was a strong believer in the paranormal, and while most people called her crazy, I always felt there was some truth to her crazy stories. I had sworn to never visit the Velisca Axe Murder House. But all that changed when my longtime friend Ron Lancaster visited me in Iowa. I'd met Ron during my years in college, and we'd been brothers since. Just like me, Ron enjoyed trying crazy new things, but he didn't have the same issues with anything supernatural or paranormal. Ron thought both the supernatural and paranormal worlds were all hocus-pocus, and in a bid to convince me of the same, begged me to go with him to the Velisca Axe Murder House. I told him no, and nothing was going to change my mind. Ron was persistent, and he kept asking, but it didn't work. With no other options, Ron told me that he was traveling abroad the very next month and that he really just wanted to go on a crazy adventure for old time's sake, as he wasn't sure when we'd see each other again. I wasn't sure if he was trying to guilt trip me into going or if he was serious, but his visit was almost over, so against my better judgment, I agreed. On the 7th of November 2014, my friend Ron and I made our way to the Velisca Axe Murder House. The tourist attraction cost $428 per night, and I felt that was far too steep. But Ron offered to pay for two nights. Once everything had been settled, they showed us to the rooms. I remember being really freaked out throughout the night, but Ron kept cracking jokes and trying to lighten the mood. We eventually went to bed that night, and I didn't hear anything out of the ordinary. I actually had a pretty good night's sleep. The very next day, Ron couldn't stop saying, I told you so. And even though I didn't want to admit it, he was right. I told myself that all the so-called paranormal experiences were a hoax, and I was completely over my fears. After the first night, we both spent the second day making corny ghost jokes and laughing. I was enjoying myself at the time, and I was really glad I came with Ron. But little did I know that I'd grow to regret that decision in the following minutes. Ron had gone up to his room to get his phone around 12.25 a.m., but it had been about 10 minutes, and he hadn't come back down. I wondered what was keeping him, so I went upstairs to check. When I entered the room, I saw Ron sitting on the chair with a wide grin on his face. I thought he was trying to pull a prank at first, so I told him to cut it out, but Ron didn't respond. I was about to smack him across the head when I noticed his eyes. They were filled with pure fear, and I could tell he was terrified. In an instant, the room went cold, and I couldn't move. A few seconds after that, 
a foul smell of rotting flesh began to fill the room, and that's when I saw it. I've always been at a loss for words whenever I try to explain what my eyes were seeing, but it looked like some unseen figure was controlling Ron. I couldn't make out its shape, but I could tell something or someone was tugging at Ron's mouth and forcing him to smile. I also noticed Ron couldn't move by himself, and this unseen presence was playing with his body like a puppet. The scene looked like a puppet show from hell, as it seemed like Ron's limbs were being controlled by strings. I watched in horror as Ron's hand reached for the blunt scissors on the table. I could see the terror in his eyes as he struggled to make sense of what was going on, and we both tried to scream, but our lips wouldn't move. I then watched Ron take the blunt scissors and ram them into his right eye. I felt like throwing up as I watched the blood gush down from his face. I thought he was possessed at that point, because even though he was bleeding profusely, he still had a smile on his face. Ron then stabbed himself in the left eye before proceeding to repeatedly stab himself in the chest. My brain couldn't really process what was going on or why this was happening, and it was amidst all this chaos that I finally saw it. The thing I had sensed behind Ron had finally taken shape. It was a rotting corpse that stood at seven to eight feet tall. Its facial features had been eaten away by maggots, so it didn't look human, and its right hand was shaped like a large axe. Within seconds of its manifestation, the standing corpse disappeared, and I let out a scream before collapsing on the floor. The staff rushed to our room to see me lying on the floor and Ron bleeding in the chair. We were both rushed to a nearby hospital, and luckily, we were able to be saved. I don't really remember what happened during the week after that experience, but according to the doctors, I kept screaming until I lost my voice for three days straight. It would take me six months and serious therapy before I was able to speak again, and even after telling my story, people found it hard to believe. Ron, who had lost both his eyes, was the only person able to corroborate my story, but he was put into an asylum as he kept muttering gibberish whenever he was asked to speak. The news took the headlines by storm as the authorities struggled to explain what had happened that day. It would take me two years of serious psychological care before I was able to acclimate back into society. I've also been going to therapy every single day since then, and I was ordered to move back in with my family as I still showed some trace of insanity. And I wasn't allowed to be alone. The therapy isn't really working as I can still see it every time I close my eyes. I really go out and I have to be watched 24-7. Even if it's been nine years, I can never forget the valuable lesson I learned from my visit to the Velisca Axe Murder House. As every day I wake up, I remind myself that the dead are not to be disturbed. The story you just heard was loosely based on the real case of Robert Stephen Larson Jr., on the 7th of November, 2014, 37-year-old Robert Lawson from Rhinelander, Wisconsin, was found alone in the northwest bedroom of the Velisca Axe Murder House with self-inflicted stab wounds in the chest. After the investigation, Montgomery County Sheriff Joe Sampson stated that Robert arrived with a group of friends for a recreational paranormal investigation at the Velisca Axe Murder House. A few minutes after entering the northwest bedroom, Robert called the rest of the party, who were standing outside for help on their mobile two-way radios, Sampson told me. His companions found him stabbed in the chest from a strike that was apparently self-inflicted. They immediately called 911, and Robert was brought to a nearby hospital before being helicoptered to Crichton University Medical Center in Omaha. The police report also stated that the strange incident happened around 12.45 a.m., a time frame that mysteriously coincided with the approximate time that the brutal murders of the Moore family and the Stellinger sisters took place. Luckily, Robert Lawson was able to recover from his injuries, but he declined to speak publicly about what occurred that day. The owner of the Velisca Axe Murder House, Miss Martha Lynn, told the press that the incident was very upsetting and made a statement on the incident saying, It's publicity, but it's not exactly the kind of publicity you desire to have. I don't want people thinking that when they come to the Velisca Axe Murder House, something's going to happen that is going to make them do something like that. Despite the strange and unexplainable incident with Mr. Robert Lawson, the Velisca Axe Murder House remains open for tourist visits and overnight stays to this very day. 
My name is Jake Andrews, and I've been running for too long. It's been three years since that night in college, and it's my story. Back in college, I was a member of my school's debate team. Now at the time, our debate team was among the top ten in the country, and as such, we regularly traveled cross state to represent and compete against other schools. One particular trip in my third year of college, our group was expected to travel to Illinois, Chicago, to participate in one of the largest debate competitions of the year. Due to some complications, however, we couldn't head out as early as we hoped, and it ended up getting dark while on the road. Instead of driving late at night, our supervisor decided that it would be best to check into a hotel and keep moving first thing in the morning. We ended up in a small town near Chicago, and after driving for a while, we finally found a hotel that stood alone, away from the rest of the buildings. Just by looking at it, I could tell there was something wrong with that place. But I was tired, and there weren't many other options that night. Its exterior was old and the building gave off this eerie vibe. We were greeted at the door by one Mr. Anderson, who said he was the hotel manager. Stood about five foot five, had bright blue eyes, yellow teeth, and a large nose along with a smile plastered on his face. After a while, he showed us to our rooms, pairing us two to a room and leaving us to get comfortable. The rooms of the hotel were just as eerie as its exterior. The wallpaper was peeling, the floors creaked, and the lights were constantly flickering. I was paired with my best friend Jesse, and not long after, Nico, one of the members of our group, knocked on our door to tell us Mr. Anderson had invited us all down for dinner. I was sleepy at the time, but the thought of a good meal and bed was tempting, so I decided to go down. It was only as I was heading downstairs that I realized it seemed our group was the only people in the hotel. I got downstairs to the side of all 11 of my mates seated at a long table with lots of food. I noticed our supervisor and driver weren't at the table, but I figured they were just tired and quickly sat to eat. We all talked and laughed as we ate, and for a while, the eerie and silent hotel didn't feel in any way creepy. Eventually, I moved a bowl of food closer to me, and surprisingly, it revealed a note I assumed had been hidden under it. The note was stained with what looked like hot sauce, but as I looked closer, the room fell silent as we all realized what had really stained the note. We looked around for Mr. Anderson, but we seemed to be the only ones in the room. Nico slowly collected the note and read its contents aloud. Evening, lovely guests, and welcome to my playground. Within these walls, you will partake in a truly revolutionary game of survival. Worst where the strength of your humanity shall be tested. Only one among you shall leave. For the rest of them, for the rest must embrace the role of the condemned. To emerge from this abyss, you must confront the darkest facets of your humanity and reckon with the haunting truth that life is fragile, easily extinguished by the specter of death. If you decide not to participate in my game, none of you shall leave and I will be forced to believe that none of you have the right to live. To he or she who shall prevail and prove humanity's darkness, you have until sunrise to rid of your compatriots. The words silenced the room and left a feeling of dread hanging above us. None of us were murderers, but whatever twisted gang this was demanded we became killers. I could see panic on the faces of everyone in the room as we looked around, suspicious of everyone else. Vanessa, the oldest of the group and the head of the debate team, then said, This is ridiculous and an extremely stupid prank to play on people. We've all had dinner now. Let's all go to bed. Everyone got up slowly and headed to their rooms. Jesse held my hand to stop me. This seems a bit too weird to be a prank. I immediately decided he was right and responded with, yeah, I agree. So what do we do? We should probably go get Mr. James and the driver, he said. We walked upstairs to the room where they were staying and knocked, but there was no answer. We knocked again, but no answer. We knocked again for the third time, and this time, the door slowly creaked open. We walked in, and I almost threw up from the disturbing scene of our supervisor, Mr. James, and the driver lying in bed, tied up with their throats slit open and eye sockets empty. We quickly ran out of the room horrified, but as we turned to leave, we saw Vanessa headed our way from down the hall, saying something. I couldn't make out exactly what she was saying, but before she could get any closer, 
a door beside her swung wide open, and Jessica, another member of the debate team, quickly stabbed her in the chest several times. Vanessa fell to the floor immediately, and Jessica, who was now standing above her lifeless body, stood for a while before dropping the knife and trembling as she processed what she had just done. She turned to us and ran, as she probably assumed we would do to her what she had just done to Vanessa. What the fuck is going on, man? I said before resting my head in my hands, panicking. Jesse was also panicking at the time, but we couldn't afford to stand the corridor as a piercing scream filled the hotel. Jesse got out his phone, but there was no service, and all the exits had been closed off. Hey, Jake, look at me. We have to stay calm. We need to move and get to our rooms and hide until this is all over, he said. I pulled myself together, and we quickly ran to our room before proceeding to lock the door and move the bed behind it. We sat there for a while, and occasionally we would hear loud screams and noises come from behind the door until eventually everything went radio silent. Jesse had spent all the time looking out the window. It was barred, so there was no way to escape from it, and absolutely no one had come close to the hotel this whole time. The silence began to bother me again, and I began to feel with no one left in the hotel, the killer would find us and finish us off for not playing his sick game. Jesse, I said the first time. Jesse stayed focused, looking out the window. I could tell he was desperately praying for someone to walk by. Jesse, we can't stay in here forever. There was nothing close to this hotel. We just have to find another way out of here, I said. Jesse looked at me, and I could tell no matter how hard he tried to stay calm, he knew we'd been cornered. We moved the bed slowly, and I held my breath as we prepared to open the door. My heart raced as I turned the knob. I slowly creaked open the door, and standing behind it was Nico with a bloody knife clenched firmly in his hand. He was wounded and had blood all over him. His eyes looked completely empty, and he let out a sigh of relief, as though he was thankful we had finally opened the door. I'm sorry, guys, but they're all dead. I'm sorry, but I can't let you go. I need to leave. I need to leave now. He said as he approached us slowly. We began to walk away from Nico slowly, but before he could reach us, an arm was quickly placed on him, holding him in place before slitting his throat open. The room was filled with the sound of a grotesque gurgle as Nico collapsed. Life extinguished in an instant. Mr. Andrews was standing behind him with a large knife in his hand. The sick grin on his face sent chills down my spine. He laughed before finally saying, Oh, don't be so shocked, boys. He wouldn't have made it far without those wounds. Besides, your friend has proven one of my points. In order to survive, humanity will reach the darkest parts of themselves and awaken the demons that they think they don't have. But there's something your friend Nico couldn't answer for me. You see, I've been watching, and the bond you two have is something special. He paused to look at us both in the eyes before throwing two blades in the front of our feet and saying, Nico didn't care about most of you, but would one of you be able to kill the friend you consider a brother? Make the choice or you both die. Jesse immediately replied with, then I guess we die, because neither of us are killers. At that point, my mind had begun racing. I couldn't kill Jesse. I would never. But what about all those things I hadn't done yet in my life? I wanted kids and a wife. I wanted to be a lawyer. I hadn't even seen anything I'd wanted to see in the world. Tears began to fill my eyes as I bent over and picked up the knife. At that moment, Mr. Anderson and I made eye contact. He then looked at Jesse and with a wicked smile said, Are you sure about that? I immediately turned and stabbed Jesse in the stomach. His eyes were immediately filled with sadness and soon after, tears. In that moment, regret instantly filled me and I began to choke out apologies. My voice trembled as he bled out and fell to the floor. I'm sorry, man. I'm so sorry. Mr. Anderson's maniacal laughter quickly filled the room as he began laughing hysterically. In a few seconds, Jesse's coughs were soon drowned in blood, and after a while, he was dead. Well, that was fun. Congratulations, Jake. You can now leave. But I'd hurry if I were you. Mr. Anderson stopped talking and I could hear sirens in the distance. I quickly ran to the window and could see police lights in the distance. Confused, I turned to Mr. Anderson and said, What did you? 
Before I could complete my sentence, Mr. Anderson thrust his knife into his stomach and fell to the floor laughing. My heart sank as the horrifying truth dawned on me. I stood frozen for what felt like an eternity before I quickly hurried down the stairs, burst through the door, and disappeared into the night. I've been on the run for three years now, and I have no place to live and no reason to live. Every passing day, my guilt worsens for what I did to Jesse, and I feel it's time to atone for my sins. Mr. Anderson was on TV a few weeks after the incident, and he lied blatantly about the events that took place that night. This letter details the events of the hotel massacre and Mr. Anderson should be charged accordingly with several counts of murder. If this letter is being read, then I have now turned myself into the authorities and will likely face numerous charges without this letter ever being considered as evidence. But advice to the readers? Beware of what hotels you sleep in, as they might be the very last place you ever sleep in. I find it very ironic how the woman I once called the love of my life was the very same person who destroyed everything I held dear. She wasn't always like this, though, as I can still remember when I first met her 20 years ago. Her name was Susan, and she was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. I'd met her at school, and we hit it off immediately. We were basically inseparable after that. Susan was a wild girl who liked guns, and even if we didn't see eye to eye on everything, I still loved her with all my heart. We dated for a while after graduating before I popped the question and she made me the happiest man by saying yes. We then got married in a beautiful ceremony and we settled down. It wasn't long after that before we were blessed with a beautiful baby girl and a few years after the birth of our first daughter, our second daughter was born. I truly admired and cherished my little family. Susan loved her girls as they were her pride and joy and we were really happy. But unfortunately, our happiness didn't last long as over the years, things started to get worse. I can't remember when I first noticed it, but I slowly watched the woman I love turn into someone else. Susan's entire character had now changed as she became overly anxious and paranoid. At first, I thought she was going through a phase that would soon pass, but things took a turn for the worse as Susan attempted to take her life on numerous occasions. I still loved Susan with all my heart, so I did everything I could to help. I started by checking her into a private mental health facility. And it was at this facility that I was told Susan was suffering from depression, anxiety, and other mental health issues. Due to this, the therapist had to put her on numerous prescription pills to help. Things got a bit better for a while after that, as Susan started doing well and we were finding our footing as a couple again. But tragedy struck as Susan's grandfather died. Susan loved that man with all her heart. He was also the reason for her love of firearms as she'd inherited a 38 caliber handgun from him. She really struggled with the news as her grandfather's loss hurt her deeply. To make matters even worse, she also lost her mother just two months after that. All of this was too much for Susan to handle as she fell into a downward spiral. All the progress she'd made instantly went down the drain and she was now worse than before. I knew she was going through a lot so I tried my best to support her and help get her through it, but no matter what I did, nothing worked, as Susan just kept getting worse with each passing day. All this took a huge toll on our relationship, as expected, but even with everything she was going through, Susan's relationship with our daughters remained perfect. She talked about them all the time, and she was so proud of them. I also loved our daughters and the women they'd grown to become. Our eldest daughter was 22 now. She'd just graduated and started working. She was also seeing a long-term boyfriend who I liked, and it seemed like they were going to tie the knot soon. My youngest daughter was also doing well. She was 17 and in high school. I loved my girls so much that I was willing to try my best to make things work with Susan. I doubled my efforts and tried all I could to recreate the spark that would revitalize our dying relationship, but it felt like I was pouring water on a hard rock. It was so hard for me to admit, but I now knew that after more than 20 years of being together, our marriage was over. I waited until my upcoming 45th birthday to tell Susan that I didn't want to be in our marriage anymore. I figured it'd be the best time to tell her as we'd all be there as a family. The celebration didn't start off well as Susan and my eldest daughter got into an altercation earlier that day. She was opposed to our daughter marrying her long-term boyfriend 
and Susan threatened to lock her up in order to stop the marriage. I told Susan that I supported the marriage, and our eldest daughter and I wasn't going to allow her to stop it. All this just made Susan furious, as she had an attitude for the rest of the day. After the argument we'd all just had, I thought telling Susan about my plans for divorce would have been a bad idea. But I decided to get it over with, so I called her somewhere private, and I told her I wanted to leave. After I broke the news to Susan, her eyes turned crazy as she looked at me and said, You don't want to do this, Mark. I'm telling you that you do not want to do this. I then responded with, But I've tried all I could, Susan. You know that I've tried, but you just don't care anymore. Our marriage is dying and I'm tired of doing everything I can to save it when neither of us wants this anymore. Susan then looked at me dead in the eyes and said, I'm going to make your life a living hell if you even think about living with me, Mark. I swear that I'll make you suffer and you'll feel a pain that you've never felt before. I had never seen Susan like that before, so her words shocked me. But I wasn't going to be bullied into staying, so I said, There's nothing you can do about it, Susan. I've made up my mind about this, and I hope you can be mature enough to do the same. We aren't happy, so why would you suffer anymore? Come talk to me when you've calmed down. And with that, I left the room. A few minutes after that, Susan called a family meeting in the living room. I told myself that she'd probably thought about our recent conversation, and she was ready to tell the family about our separation. But after we'd all been seated, my heart dropped to my stomach, as Susan was now holding her grandfather's gun and pointing it directly at her own family. My girls started screaming as I begged Susan to drop the weapon, but she didn't listen as she cocked the loaded gun. I instinctively put myself in front of my daughters because I assumed I was the one she wanted to shoot. But Susan wasn't aiming for me as she brutally shot our youngest daughter in the neck. I screamed as I rushed towards her, and Susan took the opportunity to shoot our eldest daughter in the back. Horrified, I immediately took out my phone and dialed 911. As the call went through, I put some distance between Susan and my bleeding daughters, and we managed to run and scramble out of the house. My youngest was bleeding profusely, so she didn't get that far before she collapsed. I could see the fear and terror in her eyes during her last moments, as she wondered why her own mother shot her in cold blood. My eldest was still able to run into the street, but Susan didn't let her escape as she shot her twice in the back of the head. Susan tried to shoot her again as my daughter was still moving, but she was out of bullets. She went inside to reload and she came back to shoot her eldest child again in the head. I watched in horror as my two daughters now lay motionless on the street and their own mother loomed over them with a gun. At that moment, I didn't care about anything anymore as I just wanted Susan to shoot me so I could be with my girls. But she didn't. Instead, she looked at me with a devilish grin as she knew she had made me suffer the worst thing any parent could experience. Even though she was standing in front of me, I didn't see my wife anymore. All I saw was a heartless demon. Rage soon filled me and I wanted to kill her with my bare hands. But before I could do anything, the police arrived. They ordered Susan to drop her weapon, but she didn't listen. And after an extra warning, she was shot dead by the officers as her body fell to the floor. I didn't feel relief because all I felt at that moment was pure anger. She'd gotten the easy way out after all she'd done. And I wanted her to pay for the atrocities she had committed. It left a bad taste in my mouth because as much as I hated to admit it, Susan won in the end as she made sure I saw hell on earth by putting me in eternal suffering as I completely grieve the loss of my daughters. It's been about seven years since this gruesome night, but every single day I find myself going back to that night when I let my daughters die at the hands of their own mother. There's no day that I don't blame myself as I always wish I could have given my girls a better mother. She took everything away from me and she made sure what she did would destroy me. I can still see her grinning face every time I close my eyes as she laughs and enjoys her victory. There's no moving past this as no amount of therapy can fix me. And I know that I'll suffer this torment for the rest of my days. The story you just heard was loosely based on the real-life case of Christy Bird Sheets. On the 24th of June, 2016, at around 5 p.m., Christy Sheets brutally shot her daughters, Taylor and Madison Sheets, with a 38 caliber handgun on the street outside their home in Houston, Texas. After the authorities were called, 
The Fort Bend County sheriffs shot and killed Christie soon after they arrived at the murder scene as Christie refused to drop her gun. Her eldest daughter, Taylor, died on the street in front of their home, and her sister, Madison, was quickly flown to the Texas Medical Center, where she unfortunately couldn't be saved. These gruesome murders happened on Christie's husband, Jason Seat's 45th birthday. She pulled the gun right in front of him and their children, and Jason begged Christie, saying, don't do this, there are kids. But his pleas fell on deaf ears as he was unable to stop the atrocities that happened that night. Jason and his daughters can be heard begging Christie on the 911 call that was made on that fateful night. Mr. Sheets lost his mind after the incident and he was quickly taken to a nearby hospital as he was suffering from severe emotional distress. A few days after the incident, Jason Sheets was interviewed by the Fort Bend County Sheriff's Office and he told investigators that his wife had several opportunities to shoot him as well, but he believes she wanted him to live and make him suffer by killing their daughters. Fort Bend County Sheriff Troy E. Nils gave a closing statement on the case saying, we look at him as a victim. This is something he is going to have to live with for the rest of his life. She accomplished what she set out to do, which is to make him suffer. As for Jason Sheets, he's currently trying his best to move on from the horrific acts carried out by the woman he once called his wife. A strange man entered the bar and sat at a table in a secluded part of the room. He was a heavyset man with large eyes and shifted uncomfortably in his chair. He looked tired and irritable and yet was carefully observing everything that was happening around him. His eyes darted back and forth at all the customers and then shifted towards the girls waiting tables. I immediately felt a chill when his eyes locked with mine. There was something about him that made me feel very uneasy. He lifted his hand and gestured me to come to him. He kept looking at me as I reluctantly approached him. I have been a Hooters girl for a little over four years now. The work has had its share of high and lows while I navigated my way through medical school. But it has helped me pay my bills while also allowing me to look after my five-year-old nephew. Anyways, this was increasingly looking like one of those uncomfortable nights at the workplace. Welcome to Hooters, I am Stacy. What can I get you? I asked. He continued to stare at me in the face for a while and finally growled back, beer and chicken wings. I smiled and nodded. Even as I turned back to place the order, I could feel his gaze fall upon me, like he was measuring my every move. Creepy. He had a voracious appetite, cleaned out five plates of wings and chugged half a dozen bottles of beer. When I finally approached him with the bill, he asked, How much? That would be $147, I said. I meant how much for the night? I am not that kind of girl and... This isn't that kind of place either. I replied back calmly. This was not the first time a drunk customer was making a lewd pass at me. I placed the bill at his table and he suddenly caught my hand. Where do you live? You have nothing to worry about. It's just single night of fun. No harm done, right? He smiled back to reveal two missing front teeth. I yanked my hand away from his grasp and reported the incident to my manager. He was quickly escorted out of the building after being made to foot the bill. He looked back at me one final time before heading out. When my shift finally ended, I was exhausted. I packed some dinner for my nephew and got out of the restaurant to get to my car. As I was walking in the parking lot, I saw an old black sedan with tinted windows slowly go past me. I got in my car and started driving. It looked like the same sedan I had seen in the parking lot. Was this the same guy who was at the bar? I thought to myself while also panicking at the same time. I stepped on the gas to create more distance between me and the other car. The sedan picked up in speed as well. Every time I slowed, the driver also slowed, and when I hit the accelerator, he did the same. I was being followed, there was no doubt. I slowed down at a traffic signal when the light turned red. Luckily, the sedan and I were separated by another car in between. I sped off before the light turned green and kept driving without stopping. A few moments later, when I looked back in the rearview mirror, there was no sign of the sedan anymore. I had a huge sigh of relief. As I kept driving, I suddenly felt a piercing pain run through my body. The sedan appeared out of nowhere 
and crashed into my side window. As the black sedan crushed into my car, I caught a glimpse of the driver for a split second. He was the same man who I saw at the bar with a frightening smile on his face. I woke up from my bed with beads of sweat dripping down my face. I ran my hands over my body to check if I was hurt. It was a dream. I then slowly looked at the clock and realized it was already 7 a.m. I was running late for medical school and my nephew was late for his school as well. Woke up, got my nephew, got him ready and prepared a quick breakfast for the two of us. As I saw my nephew Rudy enter the building, thoughts of the recent years flashed before my eyes. Rudy was the son of my sister Emily. Emily and I were inseparable as kids, but had a falling out in our late teens. As a result, I had cut off all contact with my sister. So after not talking to her for more than seven years, it was a shock for me when I received a call from Child Services asking if I would take in Rudy. Emily had died in an accident and they could not trace Rudy's father. To have not been a part of her life all these years and to find out about her son in this manner really broke my heart. I felt a huge pang of guilt when I learned of her demise and it remains the biggest regret of my life. As I reached the medical college, I rushed to the lab to be in time for class. All the students were already assembled around a table and listening to the professor. As I inched closer to get a better look, my face turned white. I was looking at the naked, lifeless body of the man who came to the bar last night. There was a huge knife wound in his chest. What on earth is going on? Why is this man repeatedly coming into my life in the most bizarre ways? As I was beginning to question my own sanity, the professor took a scalpel in his hand and asked all of us to lean forward to get a closer look. A wave of uneasiness enveloped me. It was bad enough to face abuse from this pervert, but now I have to see him get medically disemboweled? I suddenly felt like vomiting and I cupped my mouth with my hands to prevent any sort of gag reflex. As the professor worked on his intestines, I could hold no longer and I barfed all over John Doe. My morning's breakfast of cereal and oats, forming a nice little puddle in the place where once his stomach was. When I slowly lifted my head, I could see the professor looking at me speechless and horror-stricken. He then came to his senses, his face turning a deep crimson red. He started yelling at me at the top of his voice. I became even more pale as his voice echoed through the entire building. I could feel like I was going to faint as my legs began to give away. My batchmates caught hold of me before I fell to the floor and helped me get to the cafeteria. They gave me some electrolytes to deal with the nausea. After a few minutes, I felt much better even though I was still shaken from the episode. I then received a phone call from my nephew's school. It seems there was some large suspicious man looking around the school for my nephew. The panic started once again. Who is at that school now? I am the only family Rudy has anymore. So why would anybody come looking for him? And who was the man lying dead in the cadaver lab? What on earth is going on? I kept repeating to myself as I rushed towards my car. When I reached the school, Rudy was sitting by the principal's office. The man who had come asking for him had left abruptly when the principal insisted on calling me first. I was relieved to find Rudy safe and thank the teachers for being vigilant. I decided to take Rudy back home. Fear and paranoia were gripping me. It was a crazy day, and I could do with some rest before contemplating my next course of action. As I opened the door to my apartment, I could feel my heart stop in my chest. The man was standing in my living room. He had tossed my home and was clearly looking for something. He saw me standing by the door, and my nephew was there as well. An evil grin appeared on his face. As I thought of fleeing, he lunged quickly at me caught me by the hair and pulled me back into the apartment. He slapped me so hard that I crashed into a piece of furniture. He then reached for my nephew and growled. Where is it? Where is it, little boy? Where is that musical box? My nephew started crying. I don't know, he cried out loud. I don't know any box. He was weeping as he was speaking. Don't play with me, stupid boy, he growled back. Where is the musical box your mother left you? He added as he cornered Rudy and pinned him against the wall. He was really hurting my nephew now. For the first time, things began to make sense. When I received a call from child services following Emily's death and met Rudy for the first time, he was holding onto a small music box. It was his most prized possession. 
He never let go of it and carried it with him every day to school as well. I saw Rudy's backpack strewn on the floor. The box must definitely be inside. Should I tell the guy about it to save our lives? Or will he kill us both after getting his hands on it? Then I saw he was carrying a gun in the small of his back. I slowly scrambled to my feet and lunged at him with all my might. Both of us hit the ground as I fell on top of him. I managed to lift the gun from his trousers and pointed it at him. Do you even know how to use that thing? I wouldn't recommend you to do anything stupid or you will be really sorry. Who are you? What do you want with us? I asked him with the gun still pointed at him. He slowly began to move forward. Stop right there or I will shoot, I yelled back. But he lunged at me and I fired two shots. We both crashed to the floor, his massive frame on top of me as he lay there lifeless. I tried to wiggle free, but he was a heavy man. I could see a puddle of blood forming around us. Rudy came running towards me to help, and with great difficulty, I managed to break free from him. I then called the cops. When the police came, I learned about the identity of the man. He was Tony Sanchez and a notorious bank robber. He also had a twin brother by the name of Curtis Sanchez. Both of the Sanchez brothers were arrested following a heist, but the authorities never managed to recover the stolen loot. The police also recovered a small folder from a black sedan parked near my apartment, which of course belonged to Tony. It had a picture of Curtis and Emily who was cradling an infant Rudy in her arms. Curtis was killed during his stint in prison when he got involved in a gang fight. The body I saw in the lab must have been that of Curtis. There was also a picture of me and Emily smiling. So that is how Tony managed to track me down following his release. He was in some way looking to recover his stash. After the police left, Rudy and I took the music box from the bag. I closely inspected it to see if there was something valuable about it. Rudy then pressed a button which opened a secret compartment. Inside was a small key which looked like it belonged to some safety locker. There also was a slip of paper which contained a bank name and account number. The following day, I tracked down the bank location and got the safety locker opened. There was a small pouch inside. It was full of diamonds. Hey, my name is Alan. I'm just an ordinary ice cream man with an ordinary life. I know there are more interesting professions like policemen or firemen, but even with a life as ordinary and boring as mine, I have a story to tell you. A story that you might think could happen to one in a million people. Until you turn on the TV and you see that reality is different. But I'll tell you about that later. First of all, I have to tell you about my personal experience. It all happened when I was young. I was only 13 years old. I was too old to be so curious. I still had the excessive idolism of a little boy, but I was too old to get into trouble. That day, my parents went to the supermarket. I didn't feel like going and I was old enough to take care of myself. So they had no problem leaving me alone, even if I was a bit of a troublemaker. I wasn't planning on leaving my room, honestly. I was playing video games in my room and having fun until I heard it. Like every day, the neighbor's dog started barking. To be honest, I never saw the neighbor's dog, but listening to it was horrible. Every day I heard their barks of pain, of fear. They were not coming from the yard or from inside the neighbor's house, but from his basement. Sometimes I would hide in the neighbor's yard and spy on them through the window. They looked like two normal people, but I didn't like the way they treated their dogs. From the window, I could see how the door to their basement was always closed, and from there, the dog would cry, bark, and scratch at the door. The elderly couple who lived there always treated me well, but I hated the way they treated their poor dog. My dog had died a few weeks before, and I was going through a phase where I wanted to rescue and bring in as many dogs as possible, but my parents wouldn't let me. Not only were my parents gone that day, but the neighbors weren't there either. This was a double opportunity. Not only would I get to play with the dog, but I would let them out of the basement for even a little while. I slipped into my neighbor's house through the window from their yard and walked slowly into the basement. I didn't want to scare the dog, so I knew I had to proceed carefully. I approached the door and tried to open it as slowly and quietly as possible, but it was locked. Hell, I knew this couldn't be easy. 
I started looking for the key everywhere, and at the same time, I took the opportunity to see the house for the first time. It was a normal house. Nothing in it was striking. The two old men who took care of it seemed to have a happy life, going on all kinds of vacations together. All the pictures were from when they were young. To my surprise, in all of them, there was a child. Something must have happened to him. All this was quite surprising to me, as they seemed like good people in general. I was surprised that people like this could treat an animal so badly. While I was looking at the pictures, I noticed that behind one of them, there was a small key hidden. This was the key to the basement. With a big smile, I almost ran to the place, and as I put the key in, it fit perfectly. With anticipation, I opened the door and took the first steps into the basement. Finally, I was inside. The basement looked very dark, and the stairs down were very dangerous. I didn't hear the dog, but I did hear a four-legged animal walking curiously, not knowing who was entering the basement. I took my first steps on the stairs. I couldn't see the bottom of the basement. It was too dark, and the light switch was at the bottom of the stairs. I continued advancing carefully so as not to break those old wooden stairs. I was considering that maybe this was not the best idea, but I was already too involved to stop moving forward. I had to at least see the dog. It was a bad idea to be afraid of him at that height. As my father used to tell me, the one who was more afraid than me is the dog. Once I got down, I happily turned on the lights without knowing what I was about to find. That one there, that wasn't a dog. It was a human. That poor man was chained up. He had a collar and was standing on all fours, looking at me curiously. Hey, are you all right? Did the old people do this to you? Suddenly, the man jumped on top of me to attack me. This person was totally crazy. I really thought he was a dog. All this time, those screams and cries were not those of a dog, but those of a human. I fought for my life and protected myself as much as I could from this terrifying person. Until luckily, there was a noise at the door and the chained person was distracted for a few seconds, giving me the opportunity to escape and hide under the stairs. While I was waiting in hiding, the old man, the owner of the house, arrived furious with some chains and began to attack his prisoner violently. I told you not to bark. Do you want to put on a show? Haven't I taught you enough? In response, the prisoner began to cry. The dog trying to attack the person, but he couldn't because the chain wouldn't stretch far enough to reach him. Suddenly, the man stopped attacking the dog and became thoughtful. Hey, wait a minute. Why are the lights on? I could have sworn I turned them off before I left. Taking advantage of this opportunity, I rammed the man with all the force I had. The damage was minimal, but with those three steps, I pushed him back, and I had achieved my goal. You! You came in here! Now you can't! That was the family that owned the house before they were killed by those two psychopaths. The only thing they kept was the kid in the picture, and they spent years and years training him to behave like, you can imagine. A dog. The boy, who was already over 20 years old, received all the psychological help he could, but the psychological damage was so great, but he took his own life before he could improve. As I said at the beginning, be very careful. Something as hard to believe as this can happen every day. When you are leaving your house, Stare into their eyes and ask yourself, how well do I know this person? You never know if that elderly couple you have around you might be the most wicked and cruel people you will ever meet in your life. Have you ever been to a carnival? Well, who hasn't? As a kid, I always loved them and drove my parents crazy to take me there. I got to know the amusement park that was just a few miles away from my house almost by heart. And even then, I kept going and going. Once I grew up, I admit I stopped going for a few years. Eventually, it started to seem a bit boring to me. I guess that's part of growing up. However, it didn't help that I knew all the attractions by heart. I came to believe that I would never set foot in a carnival again. That maybe I had been so many times that I would never be attracted to it again. But time would prove me wrong. I was a freshman in college, and my friends wanted to take advantage of the break 
to go to a carnival a few miles from campus. To my surprise, none of them were from the area, and that carnival was the one near my house. Surprised, I told them I was from around there, and we all coordinated to go on a Friday night. The carnival was at its best when we arrived, with colored lights flashing and the music thundering from the rides. The aroma of cotton candy and popcorn filled the air as we took in the world of entertainment. Unlike when I was a kid, there were a lot more people. Everyone was dressed up in over-the-top costumes. Among all those people, one caught my attention. It was some kind of clown. I remember that he was the one I looked at the most, but only because he was looking at me and my friends. The clown was an identical copy of the clown from the movie Terrifier. He was a combination of a clown and a mime. His smile was huge and revealed his broken and bloody teeth. Unlike the original clown, his costume was much more bloody and broken. This man definitely saw the movie many times as he mimicked it to perfection. My friends may have been so distracted that they didn't realize he was watching us, but I could see him watching us from afar, waving at me. I decided to ignore him. I was going to have a good time tonight and no teenager trying to scare me was going to ruin it. My friends and I toured the different rides from the Ferris wheel to the skill games. It was all fun, but I had done it when I was a kid. I wanted to go to a new attraction, an attraction that I couldn't stop looking at since I arrived. That place was the House of Mirrors, a ramshackle, twisted structure that stood in a dark corner of the carnival. I was always afraid of Houses of Mirrors. I saw many movies where the same thing always happened. People lost among the mirrors, reflections that moved on their own, and eerie whispers. We challenged each other to enter, and finally, curiosity overcame our fear. The House of Mirrors was a maze of corridors and rooms filled with distorting mirrors. It was amusing to see our deformed figures in the mirrors, and we couldn't help but laugh at our grotesque appearances. However, as we moved deeper into the house, the laughter began to fade, and an uncontrollable feeling came over me. As we walked down the crooked hallways, I began to notice that the mirrors seemed to reflect something other than our distorted figures. At first, I thought it was my imagination, but then I saw him between the mirrors. It was the clown. The clown that was watching us from afar was in this place with us. At first, I thought it was just a teenager trying to scare us from a distance, but now he entered the hall of mirrors with us, and I couldn't help but think, what if the danger was real? I turned to tell my friends, but when I turned around, the hallway behind me was empty. I was alone in the house of mirrors. The feeling of fear came over me, but I thought maybe it was a joke, so I decided to move on. I walked slowly looking around me as the mirrors continued to show glimpses of that creepy clown. No matter where I looked, he always seemed to be nearby, as if he was following me. My heart was pounding, and my steps became more hurried. I wanted to get out of there as soon as possible. Finally, I came to a room full of mirrors that surrounded me on all sides. I didn't know which way to go, and I was trapped in a glass maze. It was then that I saw something much worse. The clown was still there. But now, he had a huge hammer in his hand. I don't know who you are, but this is not funny. Stop and leave now. I'm with my friends. They'll beat you to a pope if you do anything to me. At my threat, the clown just started laughing, but without making a sound. I turned around and started desperately looking for a way out. Every time I looked at a mirror, I saw the clown in my reflection, getting closer and closer. My hands were sweating, and my heart was pounding so hard I could feel it in my throat. Once in front of me, I surrendered and put myself on guard to face the clown. I didn't know how to defend myself, as his reflexes were everywhere. Out of nowhere, the clown took off running and slammed into my direction with everything. Several mirrors began to break, and in my confusion, I saw my own reflection in the mirror, and behind me was the clown. I turned around to confirm that he was behind me, but before I could defend myself, the clown put his huge, cold hands on my neck, throwing me against one of the mirrors. Before I could recover from the blow, the clown was on top of me, laughing his head off in a frantic manner and scratching my face with his filthy fingernails. The pain was too much, and my face burned in a fierce sting as I fell to tearing chunks of skin off my face. Every move I made to protect myself was in vain, as his cold, twisted hands held me with supernatural strength. For a moment, I surrendered. I was at the mercy of what this psychopath could do to me. But at that moment, something awoke in me. I knew I had to fight for my life. I knew I had to do something with all my strength. I managed to hit him in the face, making him recoil momentarily. 
Taking advantage of that small opening, I got to my feet and ran for the exit. Now that several mirrors were broken, it was easier to find my way. Finally, I found my way out of the house of mirrors. I staggered out, bleeding and disfigured, but hoping that the clown would not follow me. My relief was short-lived, for as I looked back, I saw the clown standing at the entrance to the house, his ghoulish grin even more terrifying. He seemed to enjoy my suffering. I ran to my friends who were waiting outside for me, having no idea what I had just experienced. I told them about the nightmare I had experienced inside the House of Mirrors, but no one else seemed to have seen this sinister clown. Needless to say, everyone believed me since I had my disfigured face as proof. My friends wanted to go back into the House of Mirrors. They wanted to look for the clown and take revenge for what he did to me, but not me. I understand that everyone knows that in those cases, you have to go to the police, but no one understood how I felt at that time. I just wanted to get this night over with. I wanted to go home. I managed to convince my friends to leave the carnival. My friends still think they could have caught him, but a part of me told me that if they had gone back into that place, they would not have come out alive. The experience scarred me for life. I never went back to any carnival, and I am terrified of that movie. The nightmare of the clown was always present in my thoughts. Every time I close my eyes, I see him laughing at me, <laughs> pointing at my disfigured face with his grimy fingers. In time, my wounds healed and barely left me with a few scars. I may look like a normal person on the outside, but inside, I'm torn, and I fear I may never heal from it. Hello, everyone. We are thrilled that you have been enjoying our videos. Your support means the world to us. If you've liked what you've seen, please consider liking and subscribing to our channel. We would love to hear which one of our videos is your favorite. We're on a mission to reach 100,000 members in the SSG family, and with your help, we can achieve that goal. Thank you for being a part of our journey. Hi guys, my name is Albert. I used to be a YouTuber who used to travel the world to try Airbnbs and rank them. But nowadays, I'm retired. Don't confuse me. My channel was successful and never stopped being successful. But I had an experience that ruined my experience on it. Something that to this day, I still can't get over. It all started while watching a humble Airbnb in Colombia, Bogota. Luckily, the owner spoke perfect English. From his accent, it was easy to tell that the man was British. He showed me the Airbnb, and when I walked in, I was very impressed. It was an ordinary place, nothing like what the legend said. Oh yeah, I didn't tell them. One of the reasons I traveled so far for a simple Airbnb is because, according to the YouTube comments and emails I was sent, this place was haunted. It was said that no one could spend more than 24 hours in this place. Most of the people disappeared or simply escaped and went crazy. The police never found out what was going on. I didn't believe in any of these legends, so without further ado, I went into my room and closed the door. The longest hours of my life were about to begin. The day passed normally. I did some sightseeing and got to know the beautiful city. When I arrived at the place, it was already dark and still nothing was happening. But everything changed a few hours later. Late at night, almost dawn, a strange noise woke me up. It was something at the door. I walked toward it to see what was going on, and I smelled a strange odor. Was there a gas leak? No, it was a different smell, like sweet. The same smell that the victims had reported. I must admit that I got a little scared and walked quickly to the door to ventilate the room a little. But when I got to it, I reached out my hand to the handle and was startled to realize something. It was closed and locked. This couldn't be happening. I went back to the bed to get my cell phone and contact the owner of the place. But when I reached the bed, a hand came out from under it and grabbed my foot, knocking me to the floor. From the floor, I looked under the bed and screamed in terror. There were two terrifying red eyes staring at me from under the bed. I moved my foot away and went backwards. Suddenly, I heard a noise in the air duct. Something was moving through it. From a small opening, I could see something slowly coming out. It was a black being with a distorted and deformed face. He was staring at me and trembling with anticipation. 
I could see in detail how saliva was dripping from his mouth. I knew this monster. All the survivors gave an identical description of him. Was the legend real? Once the being finished coming out of the duct, it started to walk slowly toward me. I tried to run, but my body was paralyzed. What was happening to me? Screaming was not an option either. It was as if my body was not working. The being stepped in front of me and started to put his finger in my mouth. It was going deeper and deeper and applying more and more force. The pain was too much. I felt that it was going to tear me apart inside. That it was going to break my jaw. My heart began to race faster and faster. And what I thought would be my last seconds alive, I saw something that totally disconcerted me. My cell phone was on the floor, and in the reflection of the screen, I could see myself, alone. In the reflection of the screen, there was no demon, no finger, nothing. I turned my head and looked straight ahead. I was alone. Slowly, my body started to work, and I stood up. I noticed that the monster was still staring at me from the door of the Airbnb. I quickly grabbed my cell phone and with the camera on, pointed it at him. Again, there was nothing. My senses began to sharpen and I discovered something I hadn't noticed. There was a strange noise behind me. When I turned around, I noticed a small tube coming out of the wall and gas was coming from it. Was that the strange smell I felt before coming from there? With all my strength, I rammed the door until it broke. But without needing to do so, it opened by itself and behind it, the owner was waiting for me with a shotgun. His face was terrifying. His eyes were huge and red and his smile was from ear to ear. He didn't look like the same friendly person who had greeted me before. This was his true personality. I'm sorry, Mr. Albert, but as the legend says, you can only leave here mad or dead. He readied the shotgun. I see you have chosen death. I see there are no monsters here. You trick people with hallucinogens, and those who discover you, you kill them. You'd be surprised how a good urban legend can be for business. Since the day I was told about this ridiculous legend, I had to buy this place. And I see it's paying off. <laughs> You're crazy. Oh, of course. But this crazy man will become a millionaire here. Okay, Albert. Enough talking. Time to die. Knowing that this was my only chance of survival, I threw myself wildly toward the man and managed to grab his gun before he fired. We began to struggle for it, but before he could shoot me, I managed to push him into the room. I grabbed his gun that was on the floor, pointed it at him, and forced him to stay locked up until the police came. And that's how my life was saved. But the owner of the place was not so lucky. When the police arrived, we opened the door, and when we entered, we found the man's body. His body had been destroyed from the inside as if someone or something had attacked him. It seems that the legend wasn't so false after all. After that, I could never go to another Airbnb. I'm terrified of legends and decided to get a quiet job. I'm never going to laugh at an urban legend again. Because... I can fall victim to it. In December 2018, during the New Year's Eve, Edwin Campbell was arrested at his home after kidnapping a pizza delivery driver and murdering a neighbor after being discovered. The man was charged and then locked up in a psychiatric hospital. In this dramatization provided by the pizza delivery man, we will learn his story. You know, I used to be one of those people who thought the streets weren't dangerous. I mean, I always thought that insecurity was something they only showed on TV and that in reality, no one was really in danger as long as they didn't do anything risky. Today, I still regret how innocent I was. Sometimes there are things that change the way you look at life. Things that turn everything you believe in upside down and make you start from scratch. In my case, it all happened one night. One night, a person made me rethink everything I think to the point of being terrified of the night. 
It all started at my old job. I used to be a pizza delivery guy at night. It didn't make good money, but it was supplemented by my morning job. That day was December 31st, and I was working nights before the party because I knew the tips were huge. In between my deliveries, I had to go to an apartment. Once I rang the doorbell, the door rang, inviting me into the apartment. I'm not going to lie. Normally, I don't go into apartments and wait for the customer to come down, but I was in a hurry. I just wanted to give him the pizza, have my tip, and leave. Once I knocked on the door to the right room, the door opened, and a shy but neurotic man opened the door for me. His house was horrendous. It was full of cockroaches and dirt everywhere. I handed him the pizza and let him pay me, but in a terrifyingly thin voice, the man spoke to me and caught me totally off guard. Hey, would you like to stay and eat with me? It's a new year, and I feel very lonely. I would like someone to eat with me to celebrate. Sorry, man. I have a family, too. Please, stay. I don't want to eat alone. This is a special day. I tried to free myself from his hand, but his fingers were like sharp claws. I understood that I was in a compromising situation, so in a firm voice, I told him that I had other orders and that I should keep working to celebrate with my kids. He looked disappointed, but finally let go of my shoulder. I walked quickly to my bike. This person was totally insane. I admit, I may have been a bit harsh with him, but I preferred to get that problem out of the way. While I was absorbed with my thoughts, I heard someone running quickly towards me. By the time I could react and turn around, it was too late. All I remember is seeing the man I had delivered the pizza to next to me, putting a strange smelling handkerchief to my nose. After that, everything went blurry and with no energy in my legs, I fell to the ground. That strange smell? The one that the man had put on the handkerchief? That was chloroform. Confused and not knowing where I was, I opened my eyes after a long nap that could have lasted minutes or hours. As I looked around me, I began to remember everything that had happened and tried to scream, but I couldn't, because I had a sock in my mouth. Even though I had seen it for a few seconds, I recognized the place. This was the apartment of the psychopath I had delivered the pizza earlier, only this time it was inside the house and not outside. Next to the door, I saw him again. Next to the door, I saw him again. He was sitting there with the same psycho face, staring at me with a huge grin. Desperate, I moved around violently, trying to get out of his grip, but there was no way. The man had tied me so tightly that there was no way I could escape unless someone untied me. Seeing how helpless and terrified I was, the man approached me with the pizza box in his hand. Hey, you were rude before. Were you really going to let a customer spend the holidays alone? What if he's depressed? A depressed person during a New Year's Eve party can do crazy things. <laughs> Please let me go. My family is waiting for me. I just want to be with them. Don't worry. I'm not crazy or something. <laughs> Once he told me this, my skin crawled and I began to cry inconsolably. I knew it wouldn't help me at all, but it was the only way to unload all the sadness and despair I was suffering at that moment. Ignoring me, he approached me and after opening the box, revealed a rotten pizza full of cockroaches. This was not the pizza I had delivered. Noticing my confusion, he spoke to me again and what he said next made me realize what I was dealing with. He told me that he was going to save the pizza I gave him today to eat it in a few weeks. In the meantime, we were going to eat an old pizza that had been sitting in that box for weeks. I looked around and noticed something else. The house was full of pizza boxes, which may or may not have been empty. Trying to think of my chances of escape, my stomach turned as I watched the man eat the rotten pizza. I wanted to vomit, but the little liquid I managed to expel from my mouth was trapped in the sock in my mouth, forcing me to swallow it again. Meanwhile, he was still enjoying the disgusting rotten pizza. When he finished taking the first few bites, the nightmare continued. The psychopath began to mention to me how lonely he felt eating alone and how glad he was to have company at mealtime. He grabbed a piece of rotten pizza and passed it over my face, trying to shove pieces of mozzarella in with his fingers, which was forcing the sock into the side of my mouth. Happy New Year! <laughs> oh, wait. It's bad luck to say it this soon, right? Now eat up! <laughs> My only reaction to this was to cry and cry, trying my hardest not to vomit and choke. Suddenly, in a moment of salvation, I heard something. Someone was banging on the door. 
The psychopath noticed this too and slowly approached to see what was going on. Once he did, I could see for a few seconds that there was a lady behind the door and she looked furious. Once the psychopath approached her, the lady asked him several questions about why there was so much screaming or if something had happened. The psychopath denied everything and the situation quickly escalated. They both raised their voices and in an act of impulsivity, the lady peeked into the apartment and saw me. Her reaction was obvious. She began to scream in desperation as she ran to her room. After removing the lock and opening the front door, the psychopath ran in the direction of the lady. Since I was tied up, I couldn't see anything, but what I was hearing was enough. First, I heard the psychopath's footsteps running towards the lady. Once he caught up with her, he used his hands to slam her head against the floor. The lady's screams became more and more muffled, but by the fourth or fifth blow, nothing could be heard anymore. After a few seconds of silence, the footsteps were heard again, and they returned to this room. He was home again, and there was blood in his hands. Before he could lock himself in, some neighbors entered the psychopath's house and began to beat him. They saw what he did to the old lady from their homes. When they saw me, they automatically released me, and I called 911. Shortly after, the police arrived and took the psychopath away. The neighbors told me that they came out of their homes because of the screams of the lady. During that same night, more than 10 bodies were found in the basement of the building. This man had been killing with impunity for months. After the police interviewed him, he kept saying that he was innocent as he only invited people to join him for a meal. The man was locked up in a psychiatric hospital, and I find it hard to believe that he will ever be released. So far, they have never found his family or anyone to come take care of him, and his case is only going downhill. As for me, that was the last time I ever worked delivering pizzas, or with any job that involves interacting with people. I feel like something in me was broken that day. Just thinking about what that psychopath would have done to me if the lady hadn't interceded, it just turns my stomach. Hello everyone. We are thrilled that you have been enjoying our videos. Your support means the world to us. If you've liked what you've seen, please consider liking and subscribing to our channel. We would love to hear which one of our videos is your favorite. We're on a mission to reach 100,000 members in the SSG family, and with your help, we can achieve that goal. Thank you for being a part of our journey. It's undeniable that some people find it easier to find a job than others. The job market is very wide for young university students hungry for success. For me, on the other hand, it's very different. My name is Alfred, and I am 50 years old. But this is not a story about how hard it was to find a job. Today, I will tell you how the job I got with a lot of effort is almost the last job of my life. Because of life, I was never able to study or finish school. Looking for a job at my age was really very difficult, but I am the only breadwinner in my family, so I had to do it. Every job I went to, they told me different things. Some would tell me that they would call me after talking to other candidates, but I could see in their eyes that they knew they wouldn't. Others were more direct and told me I was too old for any job, even something as simple as a supermarket cashier. I went from failure to failure, but just as I was giving up, I got an opportunity and started working right away. The job was quite simple. I was going to be the caretaker of a soccer field. The team was pretty humble, so the stadium was pretty modest too. I'm used to everyone at work pretending I'm not there, and when they noticed my existence, it was to ask me for things in a bad way or make fun of me. But this place was different. All the players and workers at the club were really warm and welcoming. They all made me feel a part of a big family that started with the president and ended with me. The people at this job were very nice, and in the beginning, I was very happy. Until I discovered something that changed everything. Although it felt like a warm and friendly place during the day, the locker room was pretty old. When no one was in them, they looked abandoned and very scary. To tell you the truth, I didn't feel scared or anything like that. I was a grown-up person, and I wasn't in the mood for superstitions or getting scared just because I was alone. The players told ghost stories and said that the field was haunted. They would tell me to be careful at night when I was alone, but I could tell that they were all laughing and not taking themselves seriously. My first nights guarding the court were pretty quiet. I came close to falling asleep several times. I really had nothing to do, but eventually I would get used to it and have a routine prepared, like carrying a book that I would read after cleaning up. 
I must admit that I heard several noises inside the locker room or in the facilities in general, but none of them caught my attention. Wherever I go, there will always be noises. If I am scared by each one of them, I would have to dedicate myself to something else. The important thing was that there were no people sneaking into the facility or a rat problem. I was pretty quiet all night and didn't let anything break my peace. Little did I know that this tranquility would give me a false sense of confidence that would endanger my life. That day, my shift was just beginning. I had just finished cleaning the player's locker room and I was leaving to clean a hallway. But I heard a noise that caught my attention. The noise was coming from inside the locker room and it was too loud to ignore. Surely, no animal could have done it. It was like a thump as if someone had tried to destroy a dugout. But there was no one there, as I had just exited through the only entrance to that locker room. Confused, I took out my cell phone and went back into the locker room, recording everything I saw. I didn't realize it at the time, but during the recording, a terrifying shadow passed by the wall at an enormous speed. Even though I didn't see the shadow, I felt like something in the locker room had changed in the three minutes I had left. It may have been the same locker room visually, but now there was something about it that terrified me. The place felt icy cold, as if a huge, windless, gelid chill had taken over the whole place. Immediately, I got goosebumps. Not because of the cold, but because I felt that I was no longer alone. Before I could react, the battery of my cell phone ran out and it turned off. Which made no sense, because until a few minutes ago, I had it at more than 80% charge. Without seeing anything, but knowing that I was not alone, I ran out of the locker room as fast as I could. But it was not going to be that easy. Halfway through, I ran out of air and fell to the ground. It was a horrible feeling. I couldn't breathe and my lungs felt like they were going to burst. I gathered all my strength to get up again, but there was someone in front of me. There was a man, a local soccer player I didn't know. Why was he dressed as if he was going to play a match? Confused, I got up as best I could and at that moment, I realized that something was wrong with this man. His skin was whiter than that of a normal person. It was too pale a white color unnatural as if he were dead. His eyes were glassy and his body was full of bruises. The moment our eyes met, the man began to cry tears of blood running down his face at enormous speed. Whatever this was, it was not human. While still trying to catch my breath, I tried to run past him, but he grabbed me by the neck with one hand. As I stood up, the man looked at me with a desperate and sad face and shouted, you must help me. Who are you? Let me go. Please, you have to help me. I didn't ask for this. I was desperate. I'm married. I have a three-year-old son. It can't end like this. Help me. Hey, man. I have a family, too. I don't know who you are, but please don't hurt me. I just want to see my family. You don't understand the things they do to me. I can't go back. I don't want to go back. I just want to have another chance to hug my family. I want to see them again. I don't want to do this. I was lost and no one would help me. I beg you, do something. Make no mistake, I was terrified. Every fiber of my body was screaming that I was in enormous danger. But while he was saying these things to me, while this man was screaming at me and squeezing me with his arm... I felt that there was no evil in him. There was desperation. Suddenly, he let go of me and screamed for help again. But this time, he wasn't looking at me. He was looking behind me. The temperature dropped even lower, and even though the light was on, the room got darker and darker with each passing second. I looked behind me and saw a bunch of shadows going from one place to another, slowly approaching where we were. <laughs> they are here! Don't let them take me, please! In a matter of seconds, the shadows surrounded the whole place, and ignoring me, they threw themselves against the terrified man. The shadows began to surround his entire body as he screamed louder and louder in despair. He dropped to the floor and began to spin as if on fire. And in my presence, something invisible began to drag him around the place until I lost sight of him. I could not believe anything I had just seen. My only reaction was to stay on the floor in the fetal position, crying and praying that this was all a nightmare. As soon as I got home, I saw my family surprised that I had arrived early. Without saying a word to them, I hugged them and started crying. After I didn't answer them when they asked me what was wrong, they just hugged me. The next day, 
I went to present my resignation. When I told the president of the club the whole story, he was shocked. At first he thought it was a bad joke perpetuated by the players. But when I told him about the man, he believed me. This man was a soccer player who had been with the club when it was founded. Being a small club, not many people know this, but this man had taken his own life by hanging himself with a rope, leaving his family alone. The last thing he told me was that, normally, he would not have believed me. But the night before, someone with the voice of the deceased player knocked on his office door asking for help. But when he went to see, there was no one there. After accepting my resignation, he told me that he only hoped that he was now in a better place and had found peace. I was left thinking with some bitterness that by the looks of those shadows that took him away, I don't think that happened. Most of the best moments in my life happened during camping trips. My mother was an avid nature lover and worked as an environmental consultant. She made sure to pass on her love and passion for nature to me and my siblings. As long as I can remember, I've been surrounded by nature. We lived close to the woods when I was a kid and my mother would take us on camping trips every weekend. These camping trips in the forest were my childhood. I remember all the steps to set up the tent and the best type of wood to start a fire. I also remember the scary stories we told around the fire while eating roasted s'mores. After we'd finish our s'mores, my mom would put out the fire and we would watch the stars as I fell asleep in her arms. As I said in the beginning, those were the happiest days of my life. But as the saying goes, all good things must come to an end. My father was a very different person from my mother. He rarely came on any of our camping trips, and when he did, he didn't participate in any of the activities and stayed at the tent until it was time to go home. My father was one of those men who married his work, putting nothing above it. I couldn't really tell during my younger years, but as I grew older, I realized it was putting a massive strain on my parents' marriage. They managed to stay together for most of my childhood, but it wasn't long before their marriage finally broke down. It was a very messy divorce. Both my parents wanted custody of my siblings and me, and neither of them was going to budge. At the end of it all, my father managed to get full custody of me. Once the divorce had been finalized, our family was torn apart. I moved to a new house in the city with my father, and my siblings stayed back home with mom. It took me a while to adjust as I had never been a city kid. Changing schools was also hard, and it was one of the hardest periods of my life. Things got better as the years passed by. It was difficult, but I eventually managed to make friends, and it wasn't long before I was a senior in high school. I remember being ecstatic about my last year of high school. A lot of years had passed since the divorce, and I managed to move on from it, but I still couldn't move past my love for camping. None of my friends were as enthusiastic about camping as I was. I knew it was because they grew up in the city, but I wanted to share the joy of camping with them. It's been so many years, so I can't really remember the exact date, but I know it happened a week before graduation. I had planned a camping trip that week with three of my friends. It wasn't easy, but I managed to get them on board. Even after getting them all to agree, I still had one more person to convince, and that was Natasha. Her full name was Natasha Lopez. I'd met her during English class in the sixth grade, and I had a crush on her ever since. Before the trip, I'd spoken to her about camping before, and I knew Natasha wasn't a fan of the outdoors. I remember a particular conversation with Nat, where she told me that our generation wasn't built for the forest. I knew the odds weren't in my favor, as I planned to convince someone who hated camping to go on a camping trip. It was a daunting task, but after a lot of talking and persuasion, Natasha finally agreed. With Natasha on board, all that was left to do was the preparations. As I said earlier, people in my city didn't go camping, so none of my friends had any camping gear. Due to this, I had to get everyone's tents and camping supplies. Once that was settled, I borrowed Uncle's old RV and cleaned it out. The nearest forest was miles away, which meant we'd have to take a road trip to get there. After mapping out a route and sorting out the remaining necessities, we were finally ready to begin the camping trip. I can never forget that morning. I had a huge smile on my face as I picked up Nat, Cole, Susie, and Tyler, and we made our way to what I believed was going to be the greatest camping trip of all time. It was a pretty long drive, but we eventually reached the forest. I led the way, finding a clearing and setting up camp. Things went smoothly at first. We were setting up our tents and making good progress with our camping site, but that's when Natasha screamed, What the hell is that? Alarmed, we all turned to see what she was talking about, but there was nothing there. Confused, I asked her, What's wrong, Nat? What did you see? Natasha then responded with, 
I know I'm going to sound really crazy, but I could have sworn I saw a six-foot-tall rabbit standing behind those trees. We all chuckled at Natasha's statement as we found it pretty hard to believe. Cole, who couldn't stop laughing, said, We've only spent five minutes away from civilization. Natasha is already losing it. I remembered the worried look in Natasha's eyes as she said, This isn't funny and I'm not joking around. I know what I saw. I could tell she was concerned, so I tried to calm her down, saying, Look, Nat, I know this is a drastic change from your normal environment, so I understand. It can be jarring at first, but you'll get used to it. Trust me, I've also seen the craziest things in the forest that weren't there. What I said managed to calm Natasha down for a while, but I could tell she was still on edge. After the tents had been set up, we split up to gather some wood that we used at night. I got paired with Natasha, and while we were gathering the wood, she told me that she felt like we were being watched. I tried to calm her down again, but it wasn't working. And that's when she looked at me and said, I'm not really keen on this camping trip anymore, Jace. I'm getting a really bad feeling and I want to go home. I knew Natasha didn't like camping, but I didn't think it was that bad. So I walked up to her and said, Wow, Nat, I didn't know you were feeling this way. The last thing I want to do is make you feel paranoid or scared. And I don't want to put you in an environment where you're uncomfortable. So say the word. I'll personally end this whole thing and take you back home. But I'd be lying if I said that it wouldn't make me sad. Natasha seemed calmer as I spoke, so I continued with, I promised to take you on the greatest camping trip of all time, and I still plan on delivering on that promise. I won't lie, you were one of the major reasons why I planned this whole thing. I just wanted to spend some time with you before we all went off to college. You can rest assured that you're in the best hands here, and I'm the best camping expert in the whole city, and I promise you that I'll protect you from anything lurking in the woods, be it six-foot rabbits or Bigfoot himself. Natasha laughed at my Bigfoot joke, and then I gave her a huge hug. After that, we finished gathering up the firewood, and I held her hand on our way back to the camping site. With the tents set up and enough firewood to burn, we started the fun camping activities I had planned out. We played silly child games like Chubby Bunny and Tag. These games helped us to move past the nerves as we had a lot of fun. I can still remember us running around the forest like we were little kids that day. We ran around till the sun started to set, and after resting for a little while, we brought out the s'mores to roast. We all sat around the fire as the s'mores cooked, telling jokes and crazy high school stories. Natasha, who had been laughing the hardest, then looked at me and said, <laughs> Okay, I'll admit I was wrong. This is the best camping trip of all time. I'm really glad you brought me on this trip, Jace. I smiled sheepishly as Natasha talked. I then thought this would be the perfect time to tell her about my crush on her, so I said, Hey, Nat, you know there's something I've been meaning to tell you since the sixth grade. I know this might sound a little corny, but I've had the biggest. I never got to finish my sentence as I was abruptly cut off by some strange rustling noise coming from the trees. We all went deathly quiet as we turned our attention to the noise, and when the origin of the noise finally came to light, we were all dumbfounded as right in front of us was a six-foot rabbit that emerged from the shadows. The massive creature that stood before us was difficult to describe. We could only make out a little of its full appearance from the campfire but it looked like an enormous rabbit with the body of a human. The first few seconds of the encounter put us in a state of confusion and disbelief. But as the minutes passed by, we realized that it was an extremely hairy man wearing a lifelike rabbit mask. Upon the realization, Cole, who never took anything seriously, burst out laughing as he said, <laughs> Who the hell are you, dude? And how much did they pay you to wear that silly mask and prank us? The man said nothing in response, so Cole continued with, Seriously, and I thought Nat was crazy. Either this is a bad prank, or you're on shrooms, dude. But a word of advice. Only crackheads run around in the forest this late at night in a rabbit mask. The man didn't respond again, and an eerie silence filled our camping site. I noticed that both his hands were behind his back, which meant he was holding something. But before I could point it out, the bizarre man finally looked Cole in the eyes and said, This is sacred ground, and you're trespassing. My divine force isn't meant for unworthy humans to march around and pollute. You greedy and tainted humans have stolen so much from our forest to build the hell that you call civilization, and yet still you want more. My faith is what gives me the strength to do what I must, and now you will feel what it is like to be a tree that is unjustly cut down. We didn't even have time to react to the outlandish monologue we had just heard. We were all in a state of confusion, wondering if this was still a prank. But before we could say anything, the man brought out a hatchet from his back and drove it straight into Cole's head. I can still hear the morbid crack as Cole's skull split in two. 
Susie let out a blood-curdling scream as she tried to get away. But the man swung the hatchet with such force that the blade cut into her torso and almost tore her apart. Terrified, we all screamed and ran into the woods. But unfortunately, Tyler wasn't fast enough. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see our assailant pounce on Tyler, bringing him to the ground and viciously hacking into his back with the hatchet. As I ran through the woods, a billion questions ran through my mind. I wondered how things suddenly got to this morbid point, and I couldn't figure out why this had happened to us. But I didn't have time to think, as all my body wanted to do was run. It wasn't long before I reached the road, and I knew my RV wasn't that far from there. I could hear Natasha running behind me, and right when she was about to reach the road, she screamed. I turned around to see our attacker looming over her with his bloody hatchet. He had taken off her leg with one of his strikes and started to chop off her limbs. It lasted for a couple of minutes, but felt like an eternity. I watched Natasha get hacked away and torn to pieces by a deranged psychopath. And amidst all the unimaginable pain and gore, I can never forget the look in her eyes. Apart from pain and fear, I also saw anger. And while she didn't say anything, the look in her eyes told me that I was the one who did this to her and that I was responsible for all this. I willed every part of my body to help her, but my legs didn't listen. My mind told me that if I went back for her, I would also die at the hands of that man. I was a coward, and rather than doing something, I ran and didn't look back. I kept running down the road, screaming at the top of my lungs for someone or anyone to help me out of the living nightmare I had just experienced. The nearest police station sent out all officers after hearing what had happened. Numerous cops littered the forest, going through the crime scene, and a small hut was formed not far from the crime scene. The authorities managed to identify the man from a few documents that had been left behind. And his name was Alder Pine. After initial investigations, it was revealed that the name Alder Pine was an alias used by a former member of the troublesome religion called the Children of Silva. This particular religion was made up of avid worshippers of the forest. They were established in the late 70s, and Silva, which is the Latin word for forest, was the religion's motto, branded onto the skin of the religion's members. The authorities viewed them as an unruly cult, and further investigations showed that there were a couple of incidents of the group protesting at construction sites where forests needed to be demolished. They carried on their activities for five more years, during which they proclaimed themselves as the keepers of the forest. But their passionate movement abruptly stopped in the year 1979, when they all went mad and told their followers to live out the rest of their lives in the forests. The group hadn't been heard from ever since, and they had been completely forgotten over time until that gruesome night. With no feasible leads apart from the recorded alias, the detectives found it incredibly difficult to begin an investigation into the gruesome murders. I was frequently questioned since I was the only survivor, but since I never saw his face, I didn't help the detectives much. Even if I wanted to, all I could describe was his disturbing rabbit mask. A massive search party was formed a little while after that, and they combed through the forest for weeks on end. But even after repeated thorough searches, Alder Pine was never found. As time went on, the investigation went cold, and the families of the victims were urged to bury their kids. I will never forget the way Natasha's parents looked at me with pure hate during her funeral, as they knew I was the one who forced her to go on the camping trip. I didn't blame them, as I didn't need anyone to tell me I was the only one responsible. Once all my friends had been buried, I left the city and moved back in with my mother for some time. She tried as much as possible to get me to move on from the incident. She often told me that I couldn't have known what would have happened that night, so I wasn't responsible for it. But no matter what she said, I woke up every morning blaming myself. The guilt still eats me every day, and I can still see Natasha's eyes looking at me with hate. Some days, I wonder how many of them are still out there waiting for their unfortunate campers to tread into the territory and share the same gruesome fate. My family and friends don't like it when I say this, but I'm certain I died with my friends during that attack because ever since that night, I've been locked in an eternal chase with a six-foot-tall hatchet-wielding psychopath wearing a rabbit mask, and I know he will keep chasing me for the rest of my life.
The following story I'm about to tell you may seem unbelievable. I understand that it may pass as just another internet story. I also understand that even though there were witnesses, not everyone believes me, nor do my family or friends. I admit that even though I question if what I experienced is real, but I know it is. It is as real as the marks on my skin will attest. It all happened at my old job. I used to have a massage parlor in my garage, and to tell you the truth, I really liked it. I always enjoyed being a masseuse, and obviously, I studied for it. I'm not going to lie to you. Every once in a while, I received some indecent proposal that honestly ruined my day. But luckily, it happened less and less, and once they got to know me, almost all my clients were regulars. Everything was going more than fine until one day. I got a surprise from one of the men who always came to me for massages. It was an ordinary Tuesday afternoon. Nothing made that day special. The weather was normal, not too hot nor too cold. Nothing had happened to me the day before, nor did I expect that day to be remarkable in any way. I simply got up, had breakfast, and went to work on a day when my agenda was composed of clients I already knew. The first few massages were normal and I was getting ready for my next client, and that's when the nightmare began. Tim was always a normal man. He was a married man, and he never made any kind of proposition or innuendo to me. Tim had a small build. He was quite short and skinny, but I could tell he went to the gym from time to time. His personality was quite calm. He was a very polite, humble, and shy person. Needless to say, he also had a pretty low profile. I was getting ready to have a quiet session with him, but as soon as he walked in the door, I knew something was wrong. Tim was really very nervous. His face was red, and his relaxed posture was all tense, like he was really nervous about something. I greeted him politely, and he just gave me back a shy and forced smile. Something was happening to him. Hey, Tim, sorry for the intrusion, but are you all right? Hi, Barbara. Yes, of course. I'm just a little tense. Oh, I understand. Lie down. I'll do my best to make you better. Tough week. I'd appreciate it. These last few days have been very... tense. Once Tim lay down, with his shirt off, I covered my mouth so I wouldn't scream from the shock of what I was seeing. His whole body was... different. He had marks and cuts all over. But these were not marks from a fight, and he didn't look like he had been attacked. The marks were key points of his body. It was like his body had gotten bigger and his skin couldn't take it. His skin was cut like a t-shirt that he had outgrown at some point. It was all very strange. But you know what? It wasn't the worst of it. What struck me most about his back was his hair. Tim was always a very neat person. He was one of those people who hated having hair on his body. From facial hair to hair on his back to hair on his legs. The only thing he was naturally accepting of were his eyebrows and the hair on his head. That's why I was so shocked by seeing him the way I saw him. His whole body. His whole body was full of hair. It was as if this man hadn't shaved for years. When was the last time I saw him? Last month? This didn't make any sense. Had he taken any medication that caused him to have an allergic reaction? Is there something wrong with my body? What's taking you so long? Oh, I'm sorry, Tim. I was just looking for the cream. I must admit that Tim's comment caught me totally off guard. He would never have spoken to me like that. Somewhat uncomfortable. I rubbed some cream on his back and started massaging him. Something was wrong with his back, and I don't mean the cuts or the farting. His back was moving on its own. 
I thought about telling him to stay still, but quickly realized that would not be possible. All these movements felt involuntary. It was as if something was happening to his back, as if it was changing. Uh, uh, no, not now, not again. From one second to the next, Tim gave a great scream and began to move violently. Terrified, I just stepped back and dropped the cream. His body began to change rapidly. His muscles swelled, and Tim stopped to scratch violently all over his body. I didn't know how to react. I was alone in my house. Should I scream and alert the neighbors? Wouldn't that put me in even more danger? In the middle of everything that was happening, Tim looked at me with a lot of anger and walked slowly towards me, always scratching and with unpredictable and uncomfortable movements. Nervously, I grabbed a shovel and told him to back off. In response, he just pulled it out with one hand and threw it to the side. With some resistance, he grabbed my neck with his other hand and slowly began to squeeze me. I can't describe to you what I felt at that moment. I tried to resist. I tried to fight back. But this person was not the same shy man who always came to me for massages. Nothing I did, no struggle or attempt I made to escape, seemed to have any effect on him. Make no mistake, I couldn't breathe and I was choking. But I felt that rather than drown, I would surely break my neck. I could feel my life slipping away from me as the man focused on trying to kill me. And just as it started out of nowhere, it ended. Instead of continuing to squeeze me until I ran out of air or broke my neck, he simply threw me violently against the wall. Tim threw me with such force that it was a miracle I didn't hit my head against the wall because the damage would have been irreversible. Trying to recover from the blow, I looked up and saw my attacker more furious than ever. He wasn't even focused on me anymore. He was just running all over the garage, destroying everything in his path, screaming desperately as if he was an animal that had totally lost his mind. As he screamed, I could see Tim's body move on its own, to which the man only reacted by scratching, but with such force that I thought he would pull his skin off. It was easy to see that Tim, while visibly furious, was also in a great deal of pain. However, none of this made me question what was happening. No matter how much Tim was suffering, I was the victim, and he was the person attacking me. In the midst of his fit of rage, Tim concentrated on smashing the closet, totally ignoring the fact that I was standing next to him. I took advantage of this situation to slowly approach the huge garage door. Once there, I moved it slowly to open it. The door was very hard, and I could only open it a few centimeters, which served to let some natural light into the garage. Unfortunately, that light went right into the closet Tim was destroying, which alerted him immediately. Before I could finish opening the door and escape, I felt Tim's shadow behind me again. As soon as I turned around and faced him once more, he grabbed my face with both hands and without squeezing, gave a huge, terrifying battle cry with his face almost pressed against mine. That was the most terrifying moment I have ever experienced in my life, even worse than when he had flung me a few minutes before. His scream felt so loud, so violent, and so imposing that I felt it pierced my whole body and took away my will to continue trying to escape. After that scream, I fell to the <laughs> ground sitting down, crying with my eyes wide open. Tim was preparing to attack me once more, but at the last moment, salvation came. The garage door kept opening. It wasn't opening by itself. Several people behind it were pushing it. They were my neighbors. They were trying to get me out of the house. At that moment, 
I realized that even though I had not screamed or warned them that I was in danger, they all knew what I did for a living and that I was always receiving people in my garage. Tim's loud and violent screams and all the noise generated by such destruction alerted my neighbors, and almost all of them came to see what was happening to me. Once they had managed to open the garage door, they dragged me out before the eyes of a Tim who, instead of attacking them, took the opportunity that the door was open to run out of the house in his underwear. All my neighbors came to my rescue and immediately took me to the hospital. I had been saved. I must tell you, that was the last day I saw Tim. Or at least I think it was. From that day on, he never showed up or posted anything on social media again. His family never responded to my messages or tried to contact me. I never understood what happened to this man and how he went from having such a calm personality to whatever happened that afternoon. I must admit that in spite of everything, I always think about him and worry about him. Since that day, all the neighbors report seeing some kind of animal running through the neighborhood at night. I know this doesn't make sense, but sometimes I wonder, what if that monster is Tim? I think one of the most normal activities in the world must be going to the supermarket. I mean, we've all done it at one time or another, right? When we go to do something as common as this, we don't expect anything out of the ordinary to happen. My name is Logan, and I live in a very quiet neighborhood where insecurity is minimal and the police are everywhere. I do urban scouting, and in those cases, I'm always prepared for danger. But on the day where I was most in danger, where my life was most at risk, I was not prepared. The story I'm about to tell you is about the day I discovered that there is no such thing as a quiet place. No matter how ordinary and boring the place is, the unexpected and terrifying will always manage to catch up with you. That day, I was going to do some quick shopping. I really considered not going since I was going the next day anyway, but I didn't want to spend the night short of supplies, so I mustered up the energy to get out of bed and went anyway. The supermarket was pretty empty, as it was a Thursday and Friday was the discount day. I remember that had made me happy. There would be few people in line to pay. A person standing next to me surprised me. The man was bald and very white, but with an unnatural skin tone. It was as if he were a corpse. He was dressed like a waiter, and in his hand, he had a tray with cut pieces of meat ready to eat. Sir, would you like a free sample? He may have said those words to me in a friendly tone, but his face was absolutely terrifying. His eyes were huge and white, and they were shaking almost as hard as his body. His big grin from ear to ear was frozen. But without a doubt, the weirdest thing was definitely that he kept his gaze fixed on me, not blinking for a second. Oh, you scared me. No thanks. Come on, I'm sure you're dying to try this delicious meat. Don't be shy. It's not shyness. It's just that I'm a vegetarian. I'm sorry. As soon as I told him that I'm a vegetarian, the man did not stop looking at me, but his smile looked more forced and the tremors in his body became more intense. Sir, I must go. It was a, a pleasure. Uncomfortably, I pushed my cart away as quickly as possible and went to another section of the supermarket. The man was still there, frozen, staring at me. I took a few more steps and grabbed a carton of milk. I turned around nervously, knowing that the man was probably not gone but I couldn't stop myself from looking in the direction where I had seen him. To my surprise, my hunch was correct. In the distance, walking in slow motion with his eyes focused on me, the man was coming with his tray of free meat samples. I walked away rather quickly and looked at him from behind, not hiding the fact that this man terrified me. As I looked back again, he was still walking behind me, but at a much faster pace. He seemed to be running. What did this man want to do to me? He had gone crazy. We were in the middle of a supermarket. I went to the place where the smallest line was, assuming he wouldn't dare to harass me there. I was wrong. 
The man stood in front of me as he did in the beverage section, and with his maniacal voice, he started talking to me in a much more nervous and angry tone than before, but without losing his smile. Sir, I think you really should try some free samples. You know we have the best meat. Once you try it, you won't be able to say no. I'm five seconds away from calling security. Get away from me now. But sir, the free samples. Are you going to miss this one chance to eat our meat? That's enough. Angrily, I went to the security guard. But on the way, the man dropped the tray and grabbed me from behind choking me with one hand, while with the other, he tried to put pieces of meat in my mouth. Sir, I, ins I insist that you should try our free sample. I promise you, you won't regret it. It's the best meat in the country. The man had almost inhuman strength. He was choking me harder and harder, and as I opened my mouth to get some air, I felt like he was about to shove that disgusting meat in my mouth. There was surely something else, and I didn't want to check what. Almost giving in to his strength, I began to lose consciousness, when suddenly, someone saved me. A security man lunged at him and stopped him, while another came to my rescue. The security guard held him long enough for me to pull away, while the free sample man just stared at me. One of the cashiers stopped to come with me. Sir, are you all right? He, yes, I'm fine now. I don't know what happened to you. You've gone totally crazy. We're sorry. No, no problem. I really don't know what happened to him. We'll take care of him. You carry your shopping for free. No problem. No, no, I couldn't. I'll go pay now. Just let me get my cart together. Anyway, you shouldn't leave without trying a free sample. What? When I turned around... The girl was staring at me with the same smile as the free sample man. I looked at the security man, and none of them were struggling with the psycho. They were all standing there, staring at me with the same macabre smile. It's just some mead. You will be okay, and it's quite good, too. I looked around, and a few other employees were also staring at me, while their co-workers were looking at them in confusion. The cashier started walking towards me with a piece of meat that I don't know where she got and I ran as far away from the supermarket as possible. As I walked away, I could see how the rest of the people were also leaving, scared. From the door, the man at the beginning stared at me smiling, holding up a piece of meat, as if offering it to me. The next day, my neighbors told me that the supermarket had been closed. Some of the more conspiratorial neighbors told me that there were cult meetings at night. I must admit that although it sounds crazy, it could be true. I never understood why they wanted to offer me that meat or why I was the target of those psychopaths. Today, I've come to realize that I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Do you know what the most ironic thing about this is? Some neighbors told me that they tried some free samples the day before all this happened. And they told me that the meat wasn't even that good. Hey, my name is Andrew. You may not know me, but I'm a recognized chef in my country. I don't want to brag, but I'm really very good. I've been a judge on many reality shows. People know me quite well, not by the name Andrew, but by my stage name, which, for obvious reasons, I would not like you to know. But I'll just tell you this story so you can learn from my mistakes. You see, I was one of the best chefs in the world. As a teenager, I didn't even like to cook. I loved people cooking for me, but I didn't know how to cook at all. That is until one Tuesday night. That night, I decided that I was never again going to go to a restaurant or eat something given to me by someone I didn't know. No, after what I experienced that night, I decided I would be the one to prepare my own food. I told them the story from the beginning. The day had already started out weird. I was in a hurry to meet my girlfriend and go get something to eat together until a car ran a red light and almost ran me over. I got out of the crash intact, but I fell off my bike, and let me tell you, it was a miracle I didn't hit my head. Before what had happened, the driver got out worried and came running towards me. He appeared to be a middle-aged man, polite, relaxed, and friendly, although I could see on his face that he really felt guilty for having caused an accident. The man checked that I was okay and asked me if I needed anything. 
He also told me that I was free to write down his license plate and sue him, as it was the right thing to do for what had happened. Laughing, I stood up and told him that it wouldn't be necessary. What had happened was an accident. It could happen to anyone. Grateful but somewhat confused, the man smiled at me and left, telling me that he was late for work, but that he would be eternally grateful for my generosity. Soon after, I met up with my girlfriend and we started looking for a place to eat. We looked everywhere, but there was nothing new. Everywhere we went, we could find burgers and fries or pizza. We wanted something different. Halfway there, as if sensing our dissatisfaction, a man stopped us and invited us to eat at a fancy restaurant called The Feast. To be honest, I didn't know it, but as it was a hidden and quite exclusive place, we agreed to enter the mysterious black door that the man indicated and went in. As we entered, I immediately noticed the peculiar atmosphere of the place. The dim lights and soft music created a peaceful atmosphere, but something in the air was not quite right. I couldn't put my finger on exactly what it was, but an uneasy feeling settled in my stomach. My girlfriend, on the other hand, seemed very calm. She was casually talking to me and telling me that she liked the place. I admit, they gave me some peace of mind, and we were able to get on with the evening. We were seated at a table by the window, and a friendly waiter handed me the menu. There was a wide variety of exquisite dishes, but I decided to go for what I knew I couldn't go wrong. When in doubt, I opted for steak. A safe choice, I thought. As I waited for my food, I looked around. The restaurant was full of people, but everyone seemed to be immersed in their own worlds. There was no laughter or lively conversation, just murmurs and muffled words. I also noticed that there were no people our age. They all looked to be in their 50s and 60s. I decided to just ignore what was going on and started eating. The first bite of steak confirmed my expectations. It was delicious, tender and perfectly cooked. However, as I progressed through my meal, I began to notice something strange. The flavor was becoming more and more intense, almost overwhelming. I tried to remember the last time I enjoyed a meal so much, but something didn't add up. It was then that I noticed that the people around me were looking at me. Their stares were fixed as if they knew something I didn't. I felt uncomfortable, even dirty, but I decided to ignore the stairs and finish my dinner. However, the more I ate, the harder I found it to swallow. The taste, once delicious, was becoming bitter and unpleasant. My girlfriend, on the other hand, didn't seem to notice the stares of the people, but she did notice the taste of the food. She was disgusted and enraged, like a person who had just been ripped off. She wanted to make a fuss, go after the chef and not pay for the food. I told her it was not a good idea, that the environment seemed dangerous, and to at least let me finish my meal. I still don't understand why I asked her to do that, but today I can deduce that if I hadn't, my life would be different. Minutes passed, and finally, I decided to stop eating. I looked around and noticed that the atmosphere in the restaurant had changed. The music had stopped, and the murmur of conversation had died down completely. People were still looking at me but now their faces expressed more than curiosity. They were desperation, anxiety, nerves. Something was wrong with these people, and neither my girlfriend nor I could belong a second longer. Before we left, I got up to go to the bathroom. I needed a moment to recover. As I walked in, I noticed that the room was cold, too cold to be normal. I looked in the mirror and saw my reflection pale and sweaty. My eyes showed a mixture of fear and confusion. I was ready to go back to the kitchen and tell my girlfriend that we were leaving. But before I did, to my surprise, someone grabbed my arm. A man, one of the customers was next to me, grabbing me. At what moment did he appear? Was he in a cubicle in the bathroom and I was so absorbed in my thoughts that I didn't see him? I asked the man to let go immediately, but he didn't. I would even say he squeezed harder. His eyes were lost in mine. The man was drooling and had a terrifying face, full of perversion and evil. But boy, where are you going in such a hurry? The night has just begun. 
Disgusted by his words, I tried to hit him, but it was useless. With a sharp blow to the stomach, I fell to the ground, surrendered, and without the possibility to continue fighting. Realizing that I could not defend myself, the man got on all fours and approached me as if I were a dog, sniffing my face, obviously. My only possible reaction to something so bizarre was to cry. I didn't understand what was happening or why it was happening to me. In my moment of confusion, the man threw me to the ground and on top of me began to choke me with his two hands. His gaze was more obsessive and disturbing than ever. It was as if he was in a trance, lost in what he was doing to me. Little by little, I began to lose the fight. I started to run out of air and was resisting less and less until something else happened. From the restaurant, I heard my girlfriend's desperate cry for help. Filled with new energy, I managed to land a knee to the man's private parts and knock him out. In a hurry, I ran to the bathroom door and when I opened it, looking for my girlfriend, I was shocked at the sight. Everyone in the restaurant went from looking at her to looking at me. They were all standing around, looking obsessive and sickly like the man in the bathroom. They all began to ignore my girlfriend and slowly approached where I was, ready to do who knows what to me. Cornered, I fell against the wall in fear until a man dressed as a chef stepped in the middle. This was the man from before. He almost ran me over with his car. Please, let this one go. I'll make sure you have a replacement for the situation. His voice had changed. He sounded more professional, reserved, and cold. After saying this, people returned to their seats, and he looked at me and my girlfriend, who joined us, still terrified. I hope you will excuse them. These are people from uh, very wealthy circles. They are very intelligent, but once a year, they go with their instincts, and we throw them a special party here. What do you mean? Escorting me out, the man continued speaking. I'm sorry, you have uh, fallen into a little trap of my people. In this place, we do not have the same diet as you. It is a special place for special and distinguished people. I recommend that you do not come here again tonight, as they were waiting for dessert to arrive. Dessert? What are you talking about? I don't understand. Honey, I think he means... You. That means... That means that the meat we ate? At that moment, I understood everything. During that night, I had eaten human flesh. And that man who had stopped me in the bathroom, that man wanted to eat me alive. At this realization, I grabbed my girlfriend by the arm and ran away as fast as I could. As I did so, I could see how the waiter simply looked at me with a smile and returned to the restaurant, satisfied. Once we arrived at my house, we considered calling the police. But what was that going to make any sense? It was the statement of two 18-year-olds accusing a place full of millionaires of conspiring to eat human flesh. Instead, we just spent the night puking in my house, considering how close we came to being dessert for some millionaire psychopaths who wanted to eat human flesh for fun. It's been several years since that day. My girlfriend and I are still together, but we don't talk about it anymore. We feel it's reliving a ghost we don't want to remember. Maybe it was the coward's way out. For sure we would have helped many people so that this does not happen to them, but we were afraid to do it, and no one can blame us for that. Since that day, I don't trust anyone anymore. As I told you, I am the one who makes the food. I will never again be willing to eat food that I don't see how it is prepared on the spot. To have eaten human flesh, even once, is more than I will ever be willing to do in my entire life. Hello, my name is Lindsay. You could say I'm one of those pioneers in urban explorations, although 
No one ever really gave me credit for that. My YouTube channel was always specialized in horror stuff, and at the time, I was pretty well known. But after what I experienced that night, I decided to delete my channel and be forgotten forever. My story began at the height of urban legends and creepypastas. At that time, all you could see of horror on YouTube were gameplays of popular content creators playing games like Amnesia or Slenderman. I was never good at games, but I loved horror and I was ready to go further. I started doing urban exploration. I had already gone to some cemeteries with friends when I was younger, but I had never done anything like this for YouTube, although I didn't think it would be much different. There were already some other YouTubers. I can't say I was the first one to do it, but I realized that this was something new and that sooner or later I would explode and I would be one of the first. I started with some cemeteries and abandoned places. My audience, who were used to me uploading crime investigation videos, reacted very well and wanted more content. Soon after, I upped the ante and started looking for ghosts more aggressively, like playing Ouija or summoning the ghost of Bloody Mary, but none of that worked, until I decided to film myself playing the elevator game. To play the elevator game, I had to follow a set of rules, but if part of the challenge I would do, I could only see the rules on the spot. To start the game, I went to a luxurious hotel with more than 10 elevators, as this was the condition to be able to play the game. I put a camera in my shirt pocket so I could capture whatever happened, even though I knew nothing would happen for sure. I started by taking the elevator to the second floor. Then I pushed the button for the fourth floor, and from there I went back to the second floor. Following the rules, I went to the sixth floor, back to the second floor, and from there I went to the tenth floor. From that floor, I went back to floor five. I was about to see the rules again, but on that floor, something strange happened. A very strange looking woman got on the elevator with me. The woman was very tall. Her face was elongated and deformed. Possibly, she had some kind of disease. Her clothes looked old fashioned as if they were from several years ago. But what struck me the most about her were her eyes. They were red. Was she wearing contact lenses? Before I could see the rules again, the elevator started moving again, and she went up to the 10th floor. Even though I had filmed all this time, the game was ruined by the strange woman getting on the elevator, as I couldn't keep going from one floor to another with another person next to me. Besides, this woman was really very strange and gave me a bad feeling. With her on camera, I'm sure I'd have good content for YouTube by now. I was getting off the elevator, but to my surprise, the woman spoke to me. Where are you going? What do you mean? My room is on this floor. As soon as I told that lie, something surprised me. The elevator doors closed by themselves with me inside. Without anyone touching it, the elevator started to go down to the second floor. The woman didn't answer me. She just stared at me in a terrifying and intimidating way. To avoid the awkward silence, I grabbed my cell phone and looked at the rules, just to make the time pass faster. When I saw the rules, I froze. The rules said that on the fifth floor, a woman I had to ignore would get on the elevator, and on the tenth floor, she would ask me where I was going. The rules said, whatever it took, I had to ignore her. I swear, I can't tell you the horror I felt in my whole body. It was as if a current of fear and pain ran through me from head to toe. As I read the rules, I could feel this woman's gaze scanning me up and down. I could hear a giggling coming from behind me. We both knew we hadn't followed the rules. <laughs> the laughter was getting louder and louder, but immediately I began to feel something very strange. The laughter wasn't coming from behind me anymore. It was coming from my own head. The laughter sounded louder and louder and louder and louder from inside my head. The elevator reached the first floor and when the doors opened, I escaped as fast as I could. The pain in my head was too strong and the voice kept ringing and never seemed to stop. Dizzy and full of pain, I fell to the floor and suddenly I felt something pull my leg with enormous violence. It was the woman from the elevator. When I could see her, Something in her had changed. She no longer had eyes, nose, ears, or anything. 
She only had a huge mouth that covered her whole face. The woman dragged me back into the elevator with enormous violence, and when she had me there, she did nothing. The silence was absolute. It was as if she had left. Only she didn't, because I could hear her breathing behind me. That's not all. From her mouth, I could feel hot saliva dripping down the back of my neck. The woman was behind me, but she chose not to attack me. This was not a wild animal. This was a thinking being, very sadistic thinking being. The elevator doors closed with me inside, and it began to rise. As it did, I could feel the woman's breath behind me, closer and closer to my neck. All I could do was tear up and hope that someone would find my camera. Hope that no one else would make this mistake that I made and not tempt unknown forces. When the woman was behind me, the elevator arrived at its destination. I listened as the woman opened her mouth. She was about to die, so I closed my eyes and cried harder than ever. Are you all right, young lady? When I opened my eyes, there was a man behind me. This was a normal man, and he was looking at me in a confused manner. I turned around, and the woman was gone. The man must have asked for the elevator and broken up the game. This man unknowingly saved my life. When I contacted the police, they looked at the tape of the hotel, but there was nothing. According to it, I was alone all this time, but there was one thing that the face I could detect. In it, you can see somehow, someone invisible grabbed my feet, proving that something weird had really happened. Do you want to know another curious thing? Once I took the camera out of my shirt, I noticed that it was empty. I had never recorded anything, although I was sure I had initiated the recording. As much as I investigated, I discovered that this woman was surely from another dimension, and I had called her while playing the elevator game. Possibly, that was the reason no camera could detect her. A few days later, I deleted all my ideas from YouTube and although they say that the files are always left on the internet, I must admit that this worked for me. Eventually, people stopped talking about me and years later, everyone had already forgotten about me. It cost me a lot to do this, but if anyone had seen the leaked hotel videos or heard my story, they would have gone to try to do the same thing. If you are listening to this story, don't play the elevator game for nothing. The only reason I am telling you this is to let you know that what I experienced is real. And if you don't follow my warning, you may end up in another dimension, and to be honest, you won't be welcomed. They say the honeymoon is supposed to be one of the best times of a person's life. Most believe the days immediately after marriage are seemingly perfect, leading most to expect the honeymoon itself to be nothing less. Believe me, I would have loved for this to be the reality, but sadly, that stereotype is far from the truth as my honeymoon was far from perfect and is nothing but a horrific memory I would soon like to forget. My name is Benjamin Case, and on November 5th, 2010, I got married. The days leading up to the wedding and the wedding itself mostly consisted of my wife's nervous breakdowns and nonstop planning, but in the end, it all worked out and it was finally my turn to make sure the only thing I was in charge of worked out without a hitch. I had spent months prior thinking of where we should go for our honeymoon and what to do. I eventually remembered the countless times my wife mentioned to me how badly she wanted to visit Mexico City as it was her native land and she left at such a young age she could barely remember her culture. At that point, it was a no-brainer and I immediately planned for our honeymoon in Mexico City. We landed in Mexico two days after our wedding. My wife still had the ecstatic smile she got when I told her where we were headed plastered on her face. The package I booked for us online was a seven-day package. It set us up in a romantic resort on the outskirts of the town, alongside another couple and a single mother with her nine-year-old son. The beautiful resort stood alone and had a fairy tale view of trees and a lake around it. For the first five days, we were free to do whatever we wanted so I took my wife on several tour buses and excursions to learn more on where she's from. We also went to see the carnivals and basically got a general feel of what her hometown felt like. In all of this, I noticed she couldn't stop smiling and seemed truly happy. At that point, 
I thought I'd completed my job and our honeymoon had been a success. But little did I know, it couldn't have been farther from the truth. Later that week, our resort manager informed us our package included a special experience for the last two nights. Well, guests, we do hope you have enjoyed staying with us this far, but it is finally time for me to tell you about the best part of your experience. Tomorrow night, we're going to have special performers coming to entertain you with our native dances and songs. This would, of course, all be during a feast of our best meals and cuisines. He paused to smile at us and continued with, The next night is usually an experience for everyone, but most enjoyable for the couples. This is because we take a deep trip in the forests late at night. I'm guessing the worried expressions on our faces were enough for him as he laughed and said, Don't worry, it's completely safe, unless you believe in all the myths. But around 11 p.m., some of the rarest and most beautiful fireflies come out to mate and in the process synchronize and create one of the most beautiful mating dances you'll ever see. It truly is beautiful. One of those things you need to see to believe. I was woken up later that night by my wife who was frantically looking around the room and had a terrified look on her face. Confused, I quickly asked her what was wrong. She quietly replied with, Did you hear that? I looked around our room and listened intently trying to figure out what she meant at that time, but the room was nothing but deathly silent. I don't hear anything. I said. She responded with, I know, but I swear I heard someone crying. The look on her face suggested she was in no way playing a trick on me, so I simply hugged her and took a look around the room to assure that everything was fine. The next day came and went by quickly, and before we knew it, we were surrounded by exotic dancers and food. My odd interaction with my wife was still on my mind a bit, but she seemed completely past it now, as she seemed to be enjoying their native presentations and food. The activities and drinking had everyone asleep at around 10 p.m. I walked in from having a shower and decided it was time I went to bed. I put on my clothes and got in bed. Not long after, I could feel myself drifting to sleep, when suddenly I heard a loud scream from outside. The scream was followed by what seemed to be continuous wails, and I immediately got out of bed and ran towards the window. My initial thought was someone needed help, but all I could see were trees leading to nothing. I kept looking as I was certain I heard a scream, but no matter how hard I looked, there was absolutely nothing and no one. The next morning, I decided to ask the others if they also heard the loud wails I heard the previous night. They all had no clue what I was talking about, so I decided to pull aside the resort manager and ask him, as both my wife and I had heard the same thing and there was no way we were both crazy. The manager didn't seem bothered by what I had just told him. He simply explained to me that some of the locals who had lived in the area for a while still believed their folk tales and sometimes tried scaring the people staying at the cabin by screaming at night. Something about the explanation didn't sit right with me as I was sure what I heard the night before were the screams of something or someone in true pain. The day went by quickly again, and before I knew it, it was nightfall, and we were all headed into the woods to see the fireflies. My mind wasn't on what I heard the previous night, as I'd spent the entire day with my wife, and it being the last day of our honeymoon completely took my mind off whatever happened the previous night. We followed the resort manager till we got to an opening in the woods. A lake sat right in the center, and we all sat around it and waited for the fireflies as the manager said they would begin to come out around 10 p.m. We waited for about an hour around the lake when eventually the fireflies came out and it was truly one of the most beautiful things I'd seen in a while. The whole group watched them dance in silence, but that only lasted a short while as suddenly they began to frantically move around before all quickly leaving the lake. Confused, I decided to ask the manager what had happened. Hey man, did something happen? Before he got a chance to respond, the whole place was deafened by a large shriek similar to the one from last night. And from how clearly we heard the scream, it was obvious that we were not alone. Silence followed and everyone froze as we didn't really know what to do or expect. I could tell from the eerie feelings that began to fill the atmosphere that whatever made that noise wasn't human. A minute later, the silence of the woods was cut open again. But unlike last time, it sounded like someone was crying instead of screaming. Jackie, the single mother who was obviously now concerned for the safety of her son, decided to ask the manager if we could leave. 
but it was only then we noticed the horrified look on the resort manager's face as he mumbled the words, She can't be real. La Llorona. It can't be La Llorona. No one knew exactly what he was talking about at that time or why he wasn't doing his job in handling the situation. The cries of the woman were becoming louder, and as we all began to get up to leave, the manager let out a scream before running into the woods yelling, La Llorona! La Llorona! La Llorona! La Llorona! I was panicked now as we didn't have any clue on how to get back to our resort or why the manager had left us stranded. Suddenly, a tall woman dressed in a black veil began to walk out from the water. She stood around six feet tall, and the parts of her skin that weren't covered by the veil looked like decaying flesh. Josh, the nine-year-old boy, immediately began crying, and the rest of us stood frozen with fear. The woman continued to weep as she approached us, before suddenly standing still and pointing at something. I looked around to see what she had gestured at, but my heart completely sank as I saw she had pointed at Josh, who was now hidden behind his mother's back. Jackie immediately began to plead with the woman, saying, No, please, leave my boy alone. Take me instead. Please just leave my son alone. She was crying as she spoke, and the facial expressions of everyone around her indicated we all felt horrible about the situation, but knew there was nothing more we could do. The pleading only seemed to frustrate the woman as her cries only became louder. She then proceeded to approach Jackie and her son before offering a hand for Josh to take. The kid seemed to have entered a trance-like state as he suddenly stopped crying and put his hand in hers. Jackie held onto his other arm and cried without letting go. But in the blink of an eye, both the weeping woman and Josh were gone. Later that night, we found our way back to the resort where there was no trace of the manager at all. My wife was too scared to stay there now, so we said goodbye to the couple and hoped Jackie, who had stayed back by the lake, would be able to someday see her son again. The next day, we got on our flight back to L.A., and in the coming weeks, we were contacted by Jackie to help spread the word of her missing child. It's been 13 years now, and Jackie still hasn't received any news on her son, Josh. And no matter how many times I've told the story of the weeping woman who claimed a child during my honeymoon, everyone refuses to believe my horrific honeymoon story. Hey, my name is Helen, and I have a question for you. Do you believe in the paranormal? Do you believe that there are unexplained things? Things beyond our understanding? Or do you believe that, given enough time, you could understand the origin of anything? I used to be one of those people. Those people who don't believe in anything. But after that night in the elevator, that night when I received the strange call, I was forced to believe. It all started on a Saturday. That day, my grandmother had called me on the phone, but since I was taking a bath, I couldn't answer it. I received the missed call and immediately called her, but no one answered. I didn't really expect a call from her since we had a very bad relationship. I don't know why I would do it, but I always felt like she hated me. I never did anything but treat her well, but she seemed to have her disdain for me. She never looked at me and always avoided any contact with me. And when we were alone, she would hit me. Once I grew up, I stopped talking to her and cut off any kind of relationship with her. So you can imagine that receiving a call like that seemed very strange to me. Worried, I called my mom to let her know. She told me she had missed a call as well. My mom lived really far away, so I had no way to see my grandmother. So she told me to go check on her and make sure everything was okay. I really didn't like having to see my grandmother. Since I'm an adult, she treats me with a little more respect, but I still feel like she hates me, since she doesn't do much to hide it. Anyway, I knew I had to go. I was doing this for my mother, not for her. Unwillingly but willingly, I put on a jacket and went to take the elevator of the apartment where I lived. There were people taking it on another floor, so I took the stairs. I started to go down the stairs, but in the middle of my distraction, something happened. Suddenly, my cell phone rang, and to my surprise, I almost fell down the stairs. Angry, I got up and grabbed my cell phone from the floor. I hate the stairs. Next time, I'll take the elevator. When I picked up the phone, I breathed a sigh of relief. It was my grandmother. I answered it, thinking that with this call, I would see what she wanted, and I wouldn't have to go to her house. But when I picked it up, I was very worried. On the other end of the phone, no one was talking to me. 
All I heard was agitated, even violent breathing. It was as if the person on the other end was choking. I tried to call 911, but for some reason, the phone wouldn't hang up. I tried to turn it off, but I couldn't either. The call was still active, and on the other end, I heard a lady breathing. That was definitely my grandmother. I sent a message to my mom telling her to call the ambulance and ran to her house, hoping to save her if something was happening to her. Luckily, she lived a few blocks away, so the drive was quick. During the ride, I tried to call her several times, but nothing. I could only hear her breathing getting more and more intense. I couldn't hear anyone else with her. She must have had an accident. When I was about to enter her house, something stopped me. I started to feel a very strong pain all over my head. It was a familiar pain, but intense. I fell to the floor, kneeling in pain, not knowing what to do, but I couldn't stop. I stood up and went into her apartment with the spare keys I had at home. As I entered her apartment, I quickly asked for the elevator, which was luckily nearby. She lived on the 10th floor, so there was no way she could climb the stairs. Grasping my head in pain, I got on the elevator and pushed the button to go to the floor where my grandmother lived. But halfway up, the elevator stopped and the lights went out. After a few seconds, other lights came on again. They were red and somewhat broken emergency lights. I took out my cell phone to send a picture to my mother, telling her to let her know I was trapped. To make matters worse, my head hurt more than ever. When I activated the phone, I noticed that the call was still active and my breathing was louder than ever. Activating the camera, I was about to take the picture, but something interrupted me. The camera was pointing to the floor, and I saw feet that were not mine. I ran the camera, and where those feet were, there was no one. As I put the camera back on, I felt the pain in my head get worse and worse. As a reflex action, I lifted the camera up, and there she was. It was my grandmother. My grandmother was pale, breathing violently as she squeezed my head violently. Now I remember that pain. That's the pain I felt when I was a child. My grandmother used to squeeze my head with her fingers when we were alone. Just like when I was a child, I couldn't free myself. The pain was too strong. I felt as helpless as when I was a child. As she hurt me, I could hear her dark breaths. It was exactly the same as the one I heard on the phone. At that moment, I realized that the noise on the phone was not coming from my grandmother's room. It was coming from next door to me. All this time, my grandmother's spirit was next to me, mistreating me. Was I going crazy? This couldn't be real. My grandmother squeezed harder and harder. I was losing consciousness, and I felt like I was going to break my skull. Amidst all the pain and desperation, I dropped the phone, which crashed to the floor and broke. Immediately after doing so, the light returned to the elevator, which continued on its way. My grandmother was no longer there. Terrified and disbelieving what had happened, I walked to my grandmother's house. Surely she was fine. Nothing that had happened made sense. This couldn't be real. As I entered her house, a deep smell of the dead invaded my nose. The police arrived at the same time I did, and upon seeing me, they recognized the smell and immediately pulled me out. They knew there was a dead body in that room. Soon after, my grandmother was confirmed dead. She had taken her own life in a ritual. From what the cops saw, the place was full of satanic drawings, and my grandmother had not died that day, but the corpse had been there for several days. During the investigation, they discovered that my grandmother was in a cult. There were also several pictures of me with the black candles around them. As soon as they told me that, I remembered that the phone that broke that day was a gift from my grandmother. It was the only gift she gave me in her life, and she had done it with a big smile. Since that day, I only go down or up the stairs to my apartment. I could never take an elevator again. How many of us take public transportation every day? Some of us travel by train, some by bus, and some by subway. Many of us used to take public transportation to get to work. We never think about the things that can happen there at night. I never thought anything could happen to me either, and so I always walked the subway distracted. Little did I know that I was being watched. And when I decided to act, it was too late. It all started one rainy day. 
I got on the train like any other day to go home after work. The dim light of the subway flickered as the train moved through the dark tunnels. I sat down in a worn seat and, as usual, started using Instagram to pass the time. It was then that I saw it for the first time. A shadow, barely noticeable, moved at the end of the carriage. At first I thought it was my imagination, but as the train moved forward, the figure slowly approached. It was a man, but something was not right. His face was hidden under a hood, and his clothes were soaked as if he had been in the rain for days. I tried to ignore him, but I couldn't look away. When the train stopped at the next station, the figure slipped into the doorway and disappeared into the crowd. My nerves calmed a little, but the uncomfortable feeling persisted. In the following days, I saw him again, always at the station, always with the same stare. I began to wonder if he was following me. I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder, but I never saw him in the same carriage. He was always there in the corner of my eye waiting. Normally, someone would take another mode of transportation, change their schedule at work or take a cab, but I wasn't like that. I was always a confrontational person, a person who asserts herself and never lets anyone walk all over her. So I decided to confront him, not knowing what I was getting into. That night, I decided to get off at the terminal station. Everyone gets off at the station before, so the platform is deserted, except for a flickering light at the end. This was no coincidence. I didn't just want to talk to this person in case he was a pervert or something. I would teach him a lesson. I walked over. The humidity in the air was palpable. The figure was standing in the shadow motionless. I couldn't see his face, but I felt his penetrating gaze. I stood a few feet away, feeling the tension in the air. There was no one else around, just the two of us in the deserted station. Finally, I decided to break the awkward silence. Who are you? Why are you following me? There was no answer. The man remained motionless like a statue. I approached slowly, but he backed away, always keeping his face hidden under the soaked hood. So I was right. He was afraid of me. Otherwise, he would not have backed away. This filled me with courage and allowed me to face him with more energy. What do you want from me? The figure didn't speak. He just kept backing up further and further into the subway tunnels. Coward, come here. I won't leave until you tell me why you are following me. If you don't cooperate now, I will make you talk. I started to walk quickly towards him. He kept backing up, going deeper into the tunnels. When I was a few inches away from him, he suddenly stopped and turned around, staring at me. A shiver ran down my spine, but I couldn't stop there. I considered this an invitation to fight. I didn't expect it to come to this. I really thought he was going to chicken out, but furious and full of doubt, I lunged towards him to attack him. When I was a few inches away from him, my body stopped, frozen. I don't know how to explain what I felt at that moment but my body froze on its own as if sensing danger, as if warning me that I was about to make the worst decision of my life. When I looked up, the man was staring at me, unmoving. I started to back away slowly, sensing the danger. The man started walking toward me and my survival instinct kicked in. I turned and ran up the stairs to the exit. His footsteps echoed behind me and the sense of impending danger prompted me to run even faster. I exited the subway and found myself in the rain-soaked streets. I looked back, but the man was gone. I breathed a sigh of relief, thinking that maybe I had gotten rid of him. However, I didn't know how wrong I was. The next few days became a nightmare. I saw him everywhere, on the street, at my job, in my building. He was always there. It was no longer a question of him following me on the subway. This was much more personal. I began to lose sleep. Paranoia took over. No matter where I went, I always felt his eyes on me. One day, when I left work, he followed me to my building. I ran up the stairs, but when I got to my apartment, he was already there, waiting for me in the dark. It was as if he knew my every move. Why are you doing this? As usual, he didn't answer me. He just stared at me, slowly approaching my position. It was then that I knew I couldn't escape him. He was a cunning predator, always one step ahead. 
My friends and family thought I was losing my mind, but I knew the truth. This man had decided to make my life hell without reason. I tried to report him to the police, but there was no tangible evidence. He always vanished before they could arrive. My sanity was fraying more and more every day. No one understood what I was going through, and the shadow of that man loomed over every aspect of my existence. Finally, the day came when I faced him again. This time, I was determined to put an end to this nightmare. With a knife in my pocket, I let him follow me through the subway tunnels, leading me into the darkness where it all began. Finally, he caught up with me in an abandoned subway room. I turned around and showed him my knife, trying to scare him. As usual, he didn't flinch. You think I can't do it, don't you? Do you think you'll torment me? Think again. Furious and empowered by my knife, I threw myself at him. With a simple movement, he stopped my wrist and squeezed it until my knife fell out of my hand. Then he lifted his foot and gave me a strong kick in the chest that threw me several meters backward. Once on the ground, I tried to get up, but the pain was too much. By kicking me, the man had revealed his face for the first time. He was not a monster. He was not a being from another planet, and he was definitely nothing more than a person. Someone of flesh and bone like any of you. Despite this, it was terrifying. His face was badly scarred from many other fights, and I could see he had a false eye. His long beard seemed to hide his mouth, which never seemed to smile. He might be a human, but a much stronger and more experienced human than me. There was no way I could beat him in a fight, knife or not. I had a chance to escape, and I didn't waste it. I ran through the tunnels, leaving behind the dark figure now groaning in pain on the floor. I got out of the subway and didn't look back. The terror I had experienced did not disappear, but at least I was able to put some distance between me and him. I still don't know who that man was or why he decided to turn my life into a nightmare. But one thing was for sure. The subway, once my favorite mode of transportation, had become his favorite place to haunt me. I'm not going to lie to you. Today, he still follows me. I don't know who he is, and he never stops. Even when I'm with my friends and out of sight, I know he's out there, looking for an opportunity to attack me. It happened about eight years ago. I was in my fourth and final year of college, and all I could think about at that time was partying. I wasn't what you would call a typical college student, as while most of my friends found a good balance between studying and partying, I spent all my time in bars, clubs, basically any place the party was. At that time, all my friends used to call me Trevor the Party Monster. I carried that title like a badge of honor as I made sure I was always the first person at every party, event, or get-together that was going on. Don't get me wrong, I didn't just party for the sake of it, and it wasn't because I didn't like to study. I partied because it made me feel free, and I was happiest whenever I was jumping up and down to some loud music with a drink in my hand. However, the freedom I felt from partying all the time turned into nothing but crippling fear after my fateful experience at the midnight bar. It was the 23rd of November, 2015. I'd gotten a text earlier that day saying there was going to be a lit party at the midnight bar. I'd been to basically every single bar in my vicinity at that point, but I'd never heard of the midnight bar before. I assumed it was a new place that had just opened up, and this party was their attempt to get some publicity. Since they were a new bar, I didn't really know the people behind the party, but just like every party I heard about, I didn't hesitate to go. I started my preparations by telling all my friends where the party was located. I then called my friend Jimmy, who was a DJ, and I told him to get his set ready, as I had already talked to some people to get him to play the music at the party. After that, I called my drug guy, Nash, to get some pills that we could party hard with. There were a few other things that I had to do after my calls, but soon enough, all the preparations were done, and I made my way to the midnight bar. The turnout was huge, as I really got the word out there. By the time I arrived, most of my friends were already there, so I joined them. We ordered shot after shot as we started to party hard. Nash had gotten us a wide variety of recreational drugs like LSD, Molly, and Angel Dust, PCP. There were also some magic mushrooms and vitamin K, 
ketamine. We each took a small dose of our picks to take the party to another level. I was having the time of my life at that point. The music was blaring, I had a beer in my hand, and I was dancing my heart out. I told myself that things couldn't get any better than this, but that's when I saw her. I can never forget how entranced I was by her eyes. She was beautiful. I watched her as she danced, and I admired every swish and sway her body made. It felt like I was under a spell as my body moved towards her without hesitating. When I reached where she was, I said, Hi, I'm Trevor. I, I think you're beautiful. She laughed before responding with, Hey, I'm Sandra Hill, and I know who you are. You're Trevor Mount, the party monster. Your reputation precedes you. I then smiled and said, I didn't know drinking booze could make me famous. We both laughed at my joke before Sandra asked, Do you want to dance? That was all I wanted at that point, so I immediately said yes. We spent the entire party together from there. We danced, took some more shots, and party drugs. I was enjoying myself, and I could tell Sandra was also having fun. We'd really hit it off as we enjoyed the party. Now, I don't know why I did this. I'm guessing it's because I was so excited at that point, but I took my shirt off and I kissed Sandra. She kissed me back and it felt like I was on top of the world. I was going to kiss her again when one of my friends, Brian, who was passing by with a camera around his neck, told me and Sandra to smile for a picture. We both looked at the camera for the picture to be taken. Sandra was behind me and I was up front. I then heard Brian say, Smile, Trevor. But before he could take the picture, everything went quiet. For some reason, I couldn't hear the loud blaring music anymore. At first, I thought something was wrong with my ears because I was sure they didn't stop playing the music as I was just hearing it a few seconds ago. My loss of hearing wasn't the only odd thing that was happening as I realized that I couldn't move my body anymore. It felt like time had stopped for me and things just got worse from there as I watched Sandra's lower jaw expand to an inhumane level and how her now lengthy tongue rolled onto my skin. Horrified, I tried to scream, but I couldn't move my mouth. My brain tried to make sense of everything as I asked myself why I was frozen in place and why Sandra had now turned into something that looked like it crawled out of hell. As I felt her tongue on my skin, an unimaginable pain rippled through my body. I don't know really how to explain it, but it felt like I was dying and my life was being sucked away by Sandra's morbidly long tongue on my skin. I don't know how long it lasted, but it could have been an hour or two. Soon, everything around me started to get blurry and eventually, it all went dark. I woke up in the hospital a few hours later surrounded by a doctor and my friends. They told me that I'd passed out from dehydration and the mixing of hard drugs with alcohol. I was still scared of the horrific things I'd experienced, so I started to tell them what happened with Sandra, but my friend Brian, who rushed me to the hospital, told me that there was no one named Sandra at the party. Shocked, I told him that wasn't possible, and I asked Brian about the picture he took. Brian then told me that I was alone when the picture was taken. Frustrated that no one was listening to me, coupled with the fact that they were all looking at me like I was crazy, I started to scream and cry at the same time. I remember screaming the words, She was real! Sandra was real and she's a monster! She's a demon! I was soon subdued and given a sedative that calmed me down. I spent another two days in the hospital as they wanted to check if everything was alright with my head. No one believed me. All the doctors said I'd hallucinated what I saw due to the hallucinogenic drugs I'd taken, but I knew that wasn't true. I had made sure to take the drugs in small doses during the party so it was hard to believe that I hallucinated something that lucid. Plus, I never had an episode like this ever since I started doing recreational drugs. I told the doctors this hoping they would believe me, and even though they confirmed that I'd taken the drugs in small doses, they told me that there was no other possible explanation to what I'd seen. My only hope now was the picture Brian took, but whenever I show the people the picture Brian had taken, they tell me that they can only see me in the image. Things just got stranger from there, as any time I look at the picture, I can still see her behind me. I don't know why I was the only one who could see Sandra in the photo, 
but it drove me crazy and I had to undergo some serious therapy. It's been a long time since this happened, but I still haven't forgotten that incident. I have my theories as I look into the morbid experience to prove to myself that I wasn't crazy. It was hard, but I finally found two people, a man in Slovakia and another man in Greece who said they'd experienced something similar at a strange bar in their countries. At the end of my research, I believed the woman called Sandra Hale was a succubus, a female demon who seduces men and feeds on their life force for sustenance. And the only thing I have to prove it is this picture. I've tried time and time again to get people to believe me, but no one does as they all say I'm not right in the head. So I decided to put my story out there. This entire incident has also put me off parties, especially the ones held in bars. So be careful out there, as you never know if it's your favorite bar where the actual party monsters like Sandra are lurking. Over the years, the world has seen numerous psycho serial killers whose sadistic and twisted murders have given them notoriety and fame around the world. While names like Jack the Ripper, the Zodiac Killer, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Ted Bundy are widely recognized, there are lesser known killers who committed acts more twisted than we could ever imagine. Among them, one remains shrouded in mystery. The Servant Girl Annihilator. These names aren't mentioned much, as while most of them were never caught, others are written off as myths. But many believe the reason these names are hardly mentioned is that history hopes we will one day forget these killers that could only be described as the stuff of nightmares. Three years before the infamous Jack the Ripper terrorized the streets of London, the world was introduced to what could have been the first ever serial killer or killers in the United States of America. It was December 30th, 1884, and the people of Austin, Texas were far from prepared for the killing spree that was about to erupt in their seemingly peaceful town as the new year began. At the time, many well-off families had black servants known as servant girls, and the 25-year-old cook, Molly Smith, would be the first victim of the psycho killer as her body was found the morning of New Year's Eve after she had been awoken by someone who proceeded brutally to stab her in bed before dragging her outside and mutilating her body with an axe. Now what made the scene peculiar to investigators at the time was that Molly had been murdered in the comforts of her bed at home. Naturally, the case caused a frenzy among the citizens of Austin, and a cloud of suspicion and fear quickly covered the town and its citizens. Precautions were put in place by the authorities soon after, and with those precautions came the general feeling that everything would be fine. Sadly, this wasn't the case, as in just the span of one year, seven other murders would be committed in similar gruesome manners, introducing the world to the Servant Girl Annihilator. In 1885, the Servant Girl Annihilator's killing spree officially began. The victims included Clara Strand and her friend Christine Martyrson, who were both attacked by an unidentified individual and severely wounded. Eliza Shelley, a mother of three was attacked in her bed and brutally murdered with an axe. Days later, Irene Cross was also found after being stabbed multiple times and left to bleed to death in her bed. The Annihilator's next victims were Rebecca and her 11-year-old daughter, Mary. Though Rebecca survived, Mary was unfortunately killed. In September 1885, a man attacked Gracie Vance, Orange Washington and their friends, Lucinda Body and Patsy Gibson. While Lucinda and Patsy survived the attack but were left severely injured, Gracie and Orange weren't so lucky and were found dead once again 
in the comforts of their home. The Annihilator's last recorded victims were murdered that same night. They were later identified as Susan Hancock and Eula Phillips. Eula's husband, James Phillips, was also attacked during the assault on his wife, but luckily managed to survive. During 1885, eight murders occurred in Austin, all carried out in a similar manner. The Annihilator's victims were primarily young African-American women who worked as domestic servants, a common occupation at the time. They were attacked indoors while asleep in their beds. Five of them were dragged outside and killed. This psycho killer also raped and mutilated his victims. Three of them were mutilated indoors, while only one victim was mutilated outdoors. Also adding to the brutality, the killer would insert sharp objects into their ears to watch his victims suffer. The Annihilator also attacked anyone present during the murders, including the victim's friends, boyfriends, and husbands, but spared children when possible. Investigators believed that those left alive by the killer were due to the fact that he refused to deviate from his unique and unusual pattern of killing. Survivors provided different descriptions. Some described him as a black American man in his early 20s, while others described him as a white man in his mid-30s. Some claimed they barely saw him, while others believed he wore clothing that covered his entire body. The axe used by the killer was often left behind at the scene of the murder. Bloody footprints were also left behind, suggesting that the psycho killer may have removed his shoes to enter and leave the victim's homes unnoticed. These footprints provided the police with a clue. The killer at large was missing a toe. The police identified someone whose foot oddly resembled that of the killer, a man named Nathan Elgin. However, this lead turned out to be a dead end as Elgin had been shot and killed two days before the killings began. Panic continued to consume the town, and soon enough, curfews and many other safety measures were added to the already existing list of precautions taken by the police. It didn't take long before people began coming up with theories on who the killer was and why he did what he did. Crime scenes were left so bloody with the knives and axes that the population began to ask themselves if multiple individuals or gangs were responsible for the crimes, and not just one man. Over time, the killer also stopped targeting black serving girls only, leading many to believe it wasn't one person behind the killing spree, but actually different individuals for each case. Investigators, on the other hand, believed he would not target Caucasian females in his early crimes because he considered them too risky. But after a string of successful murders, he was emboldened to do so. Eventually, it became difficult for the police to know which cases were directly related to the servant girl annihilator. The town of Austin had been fully consumed by fear, with each citizen wondering if they would be next on the killer's list. To fully comprehend their state of mind, we would have to ask ourselves, if we cannot feel safe in our own beds at home, then where exactly would we hide from the evil that comes after us? This psycho killer ensured that not even the rich could trust themselves. Not even those tasked to protect were sure it was safe, and even those who were criminals hoped for justice. Unfortunately, this justice never came. But after what seemed to be forever, on Christmas Eve, 1885, the servant girl annihilator suddenly stopped killing the citizens of Austin, Texas. And as quickly as he came, he was gone. Many theories came about as to why the killings suddenly stopped. Some believed the police got lucky and incarcerated the culprit for another crime. The religious believed the spirits could not stand for his atrocities and decided it was time for him to atone for his sins. Many couldn't believe he was gone, and for weeks, the streets remained empty. In the end, they were all glad they no longer had to sleep with one eye open. The psycho killer we know today as the servant girl annihilator was never identified and his name was never discovered. However, his alias was given to him by the writer O'Henry during the crisis. O'Henry wrote in a letter to his friend, The town is fearfully dull, except for the frequent raids of the servant girl annihilators, who make things lively in the dull hours of the night. Many questions still surround this case, 
and very few have been answered. But just three years after the killer managed to elude all authorities, a similar killer was born in the streets of London by the name of Jack the Ripper. Could it be the psycho killer simply grew bored of the small town and decided to move on to bigger and better things? These are the questions that remain on all our minds to this day. But I know for sure is, no matter how many unanswered questions we may have, we should never forget the first psycho killer of modern day history. I'd known James Anderson since he moved in next door, and he was the definition of a family man. I would always see him with his wife and their two little girls, and I often told myself that if I ever got married and had a family, I'd want it to be like theirs. They were the picture-perfect family, and they brought a ray of sunshine to our little town. It had been about five years since they moved into the neighborhood, and I had bonded with James over our shared love of fishing. We also worked together as oil field operators at a nearby oil storage facility. Our shared job led us to spend a lot of time together, both during and after work, and it made us grow even closer. It soon felt like I was part of their little family, as they often invited me over for special dinners and trips. Everything was going great for the family at the time. James was doing well at work, and Diane, who was now 13 weeks pregnant, was expecting a bouncing baby boy. But around the month of July that year, numerous things started to go wrong with their perfect family. It was around this time that James invited me to a fishing trip with the family like he usually did, and I was glad to go. This particular fishing trip went perfectly at first. I would wake up early with James and we'd go to the lake to start fishing. James's wife, Diane, would often tell us to spend more time in bed as she worried we weren't getting enough sleep. She would always say, isn't it too early to go fishing? The fish aren't going to grow legs and run off to Mexico anytime soon, so try to get a little more sleep. We usually laughed at her remarks before telling her that we couldn't go back to bed as any true fisherman knows that one of the best times to fish is very early in the morning within an hour of sunrise. After spending our mornings fishing, we'd come back to have a little barbecue and grill what we caught. We'd usually tell jokes and laugh together during these little barbecues as James and Diane's little girls played in the grass. But for the first time, things weren't like that and I could tell something was off. Diane had a worried look on her face and James was awfully quiet. A little while after this, James left to check on the grilling fish. Diane then took my hand and said, Ted, I know you're one of the closest friends my James has. So if you let me, there's something I've been meaning to ask you. I had never seen Diane with such a serious look on her face. So I said, sure, I'll answer anything you need to know. Diane then smiled before saying, Do you know if there's anything going on with James? He's been pretty distant lately. I had known Diane for about five years now. And at that time, I'd come to realize that she was one of the sweetest women I'd ever met. She also had a great sense of humor, and she was a good mother to her kids. I would have never pegged Diane as one of those jealous or paranoid wives who always thought something was secretly going on. It was totally out of character, as Diane was nothing like those women. At first, I thought it was just the pregnancy hormones talking, but I could tell she was very worried, so I told her, Look, Diane, there's no need to worry. James is probably just in one of his moods, and... It'll pass soon. Diane then looked at me and said, Are you sure, Ted? Because I really feel like something is off. I then responded with, Come on, Diane. It's James we're talking about here. That man loves you to death. So there's absolutely nothing to worry about. My assurances put Diane at ease, and I was glad I was able to clear things up. I knew James very well, and he wasn't that kind of man. At the time, I thought Diane was just being anxious and paranoid for no reason. But in the following weeks, I started to notice that there might have been some truth to Diane's worry as James began showing some very odd behavior at work. James would mysteriously disappear for a few hours during work, and he'd come back with no real explanation, as any time I asked, he'd just give me bad excuses. He also started arriving late at home, as I rarely saw his car in his driveway when I came home from work. All this seemed very suspicious, and it was very out of character for James. I decided to pay him a visit and ask him about everything the very next day. I knew Diane had been out of the house on a weekend trip and she wouldn't be arriving until the next day. So I thought it'd be the best time to talk and I hoped nothing shady was going on for Diane's sake. Once I arrived at work the next day, I tried to find James, but he wasn't there. I told myself he was probably running late, so I waited for him to arrive, but he never did. After work that day, I started preparing to go to James's house to talk with him 
but our boss told all of us to stay behind and celebrate with him, as it was his birthday. I couldn't say no, so I ended up staying very late with my boss and colleagues drinking beer and eating some cake. The small party lasted really late, as we were at the oil storage facility until 3 a.m. the next morning. I had completely lost track of time, and I was a little bit wasted because I couldn't hold my liquor. It was hard to walk because I drank a bit too much, so I made my way to my car to sleep for a bit and sober up before making my way home. As I got to my car, I noticed a truck pulling into the oil storage facility, not that far from where I was parked. It was pretty dark, but I was sure that it was James's truck, and I wondered, what was he doing showing up to work around 3 a.m.? I was about to walk up to him when I saw him pull a woman's body out of the back of his truck. The ghastly scene made me freeze as I was shocked to my core. I then watched in horror as James roughly threw the woman on the ground, and even though it was dark, I could tell from the swollen belly that it was his wife, Diane. She fell flat on her stomach, but she didn't scream, and I noticed she wasn't moving. Horrified, I started to move toward them, but for some reason, my legs couldn't carry me. As I said earlier, I had drunk too much beer, and I couldn't even walk right. I then saw James drag out two little girls from his truck. I tried my best to walk again, so I could stop James, but I helplessly fell to the floor as the effects of the liquor were really hitting me. There was a bit of distance from the truck, but I could still hear the little girls' screams as they were forcefully dragged out of the car. James then picked up the first girl and held his hand over her face. My vision was blurry and I couldn't see well, but I could tell that he was choking the child to death. I could see the little girl's legs thrashing about as she begged and struggled for air, but James didn't let up as he kept smothering his own child, and it wasn't long after that before she stopped moving. James then set his eyes on his second daughter, and he proceeded to carry out the same morbid act as he also smothered his second child to death. Once again, I told myself that my eyes had to be playing some sort of trick on me because there was no way James had just killed his two little daughters and his pregnant wife in front of me. The world started getting foggy around me now, but I was still able to see James taking his girls' motionless bodies to some nearby oil tanks, and when he returned, he took out a shovel and started digging. I wasn't able to see what he did next as I passed out a few minutes later. I woke up on the floor a few hours later and I was still frightened at what I had witnessed the night before. I wasn't sure if I could drive so I walked home. There was only a few hours before work but I didn't want to go to work that day so I called in sick. All I could see when I closed my eyes were the horrific scenes from the night before and they terrified me so much that I didn't leave my house out of fear that I'd run into James. I told myself that I hallucinated it all to keep my sanity, but it wasn't long till it was reported on the news that Diane and her two children were missing. I also saw James on the news urging people to help find his missing family, and I'd known him long enough to tell that he was lying and putting on an act. I thought about going to the police to tell them what I saw, but I knew they wouldn't believe me as I was heavily intoxicated, so my testimony would have been thrown out. Plus, it was my word against James, and I didn't have any proof. He was also both the husband and father of the missing parties, so I knew the police will likely side with him. I was furious that James would get away with murdering his family, but unbeknownst to me, justice was close by, as James was arrested the very next day. He had apparently lied during an interrogation, and he failed a polygraph test. The officers, who were now very suspicious of him, backed him into a corner, and he eventually confessed to murdering his wife and his two daughters. The incident took the entire country by storm as it was revealed that James was having an affair. The cops believed it was this affair that led James to kill his entire family in order to be with his new woman. After a search of the oil storage facility, Diane's body was found buried in a shallow grave and the two girls were found in crude oil storage tanks. James pleaded guilty in court and he was sentenced to five life sentences without the possibility of parole. It's been a while since this ghastly incident, but I'm still horrified at the fact that I knew this man for all those years and couldn't tell that he was wearing a mask. It really made me wonder how many people around me could one day become cold-blooded family killers. I also beat myself up for witnessing the murder and not being able to do anything about it. I've sworn off beer since that day, as if I wasn't heavily drunk on that fateful day. Diane... Her unborn child and her two little girls might have been here today. 
At the end of it all, what these gruesome murders have taught me is that the big bad killer isn't always stalking you down a dark street like we've been led to believe. Sometimes, the killer is sleeping in the very same bed as you. The story you just heard was loosely based on the real-life case of Christopher Lee Watts. On August 13, 2018, in Frederick, Colorado, American oil field operator Christopher Watts brutally murdered his pregnant wife, Shannon, by strangulation. He then killed their two children, Bella, four, and Celeste, three, by smothering them. After the murders, Chris shoved his children's bodies into crude oil tanks before burying his wife, Shannon, in a shallow grave close to an oil storage facility. Christopher originally played innocent as he made people believe he was a grieving father, but all the investigations soon pointed to him as the culprit. After his arrest on the 15th of August, he was charged with three counts of first-degree murder, two counts of murdering a child that was 12 years of age or younger, three counts of tampering with a deceased human body, and the unlawful termination of a pregnancy. Chris had committed not only familicide, but also mass murder, feticide, filicide, exorcide, and child murder. He was sentenced to five consecutive life sentences plus 84 years without the possibility of parole on the 19th of November, 2018. And he's currently carrying out his sentence at the Dodge Correctional Institution, a maximum security prison in Waupon, Wisconsin. In recent years, the world as we know it has seen crime rates rise to levels that have never been recorded in history. Luckily, technology and the creation of numerous justice and crime departments have made it almost impossible for one to commit a crime and at the same time get away with it. Although this does not rule out the possibility of getting away with a crime, as every once in a while, there are crimes, be it a misdemeanor or felony, that would completely stump the world and have all defense and justice agencies looking for answers where there are none. A perfect example of this would be the case I'm about to share with you. A case so peculiar that it still has yet to be solved is the case of the Black Dahlia murder. Like every murder case, the Black Dahlia began with the discovery of a body. On the morning of January 15, 1947, a mother had decided to take her child for a walk in a Los Angeles neighborhood, Lemert Park to be exact. But what she didn't expect was that she would stumble upon what the LA police deemed one of the most horrific crime scenes they had ever set their eyes on. The body was located just a few feet from the sidewalk and positioned in such a way that the mother reportedly thought it was a mannequin. But as she got closer, one can only imagine how quickly her heart sank as she realized it was the body of a young naked woman cut clean in half at the waist. When she realized it was a corpse, she rushed to a nearby house and telephoned the police. It was a strange sight to all who witnessed the crime scene as the corpse had been posed with her hands over her head and her legs spread apart, the lower half of her body being a foot away from the upper and the intestines tucked away neatly beneath her butt. Everything about it was strange and horrific, but what seemed the strangest about the scene was despite numerous cuts and extensive mutilation, there wasn't a single drop of blood on the corpse. The consequent investigation was carried out by the Los Angeles Police Department with help from the FBI tasked to identify the body, which they did rather quickly, in just under an hour. She was identified to be one Elizabeth Short, a 22-year-old native of Boston, who many believed was an aspiring actress, despite her lack of acting credits or jobs during her time in LA. After the body was identified, medical examiners determined that she had been dead for about 10 hours before the discovery, leaving her time of death sometime between the evening of January 14th and the morning of January 15th. Elizabeth's body had been washed by the killer, and her face slashed from the corners of her mouth, creating something commonly known in the forensics world as the Glasgow smile. In addition to that, the killer also sliced away entire portions of flesh from her thighs and breasts, leading some to believe she was raped right before being executed. The LAPD and FBI prioritized the case for its gruesome nature and eventually brought in 150 suspects. But interrogations proved useless and yielded no clues as to who killed Elizabeth or why they did so. As the case gained notoriety, Elizabeth was given the nickname of the Black Dahlia, as newspapers of that period often nicknamed particularly lucid crimes. The term originated from a film noir murder mystery that was popular in that period named the Blue Dahlia, 
and even more pressure was put on the FBI and LAPD as citizens grew even more concerned. The FBI eventually contacted Elizabeth's mother, Phoebe Short, to inform her of the death and find out if she knew anything that could help them find and apprehend the killer. It turned out, reporters from a newspaper called The Los Angeles Examiner had contacted Phoebe immediately after the body was identified and told her Elizabeth had won a beauty contest in an attempt to get personal information about her from Phoebe. After getting as much info as they could, they eventually broke the news to Phoebe that her daughter had been murdered and offered to fly her out to help with the investigation, but instead kept her away from the police and other reporters to protect their precious scoop. It's important to keep in mind that this was a grieving mother who had just lost her child, but instead of being allowed to grieve and help, was instead being used by the media to fuel their investigations. The examiner and press later went on to sensationalize the case, making it seem like something it wasn't by describing the black tailored suit Short was last seen wearing as in quote, a tight skirt and a sheer blouse. Phoebe's mother had no additional information for the police and they were eventually right back where they started. Due to the fame of Elizabeth's case, the initial investigation had over 70 call-ins, mostly made by men claiming to be the killer, but they were all deemed false and it seemed all hope was lost. Little did they know that this nightmare of a case was just now starting. On January 21st, 1947, six days after the body was found, a call was placed to the editor of the newspaper that had been following the case, claiming he had been Elizabeth's killer and that he eventually planned on turning himself in, but not before allowing the police to pursue him further. Before ending the call, he also told the editor to expect some souvenirs of Elizabeth in the mail. On January 24th, a suspicious envelope was discovered. It had been addressed to the Los Angeles Examiner and other Los Angeles papers. The envelope had a letter using cut words from newspaper clippings that read, Here are Dahlia's belongings. It included Elizabeth's birth certificate, business cards, and an address book. The packet had been carefully cleaned with gasoline, similar to the Dahlia's body, and this led the police to believe they were dealing with the actual killer. But despite the efforts to clean the packet, Several partial fingerprints were gotten and sent to the FBI to be examined. However, the prints were mysteriously compromised in transit and eventually could not be analyzed. The same day the packet was received, a handbag and a black suede shoe were found just three kilometers from where the body was found. But unfortunately, the items had also been cleaned with gasoline and was inevitably just another dead end. On the 14th of March, a suicide note scrawled in pencil was found tucked in a shoe in a pile of men's clothing by the ocean's edge in Venice, Los Angeles. The note read, To whom it may concern, I have waited for the police to capture me for the Black Dahlia killing, but they have not. I am too much of a coward to turn myself in, so this is the best way out for me. I couldn't help myself out for that or for this. Sorry, Mary. The pile of clothing was reported to the LAPD by the lifeguard captain on the beach, and they included a coat, trousers, a brown and white t-shirt, white jockey shorts, tan socks, and tan moccasin leisure shoes of about size 8. Evidently, like everything else, the clothes gave the police no clues as to whom the owner was. The FBI and LAPD continued an intensified investigation by putting out rewards for information and bringing in more suspects. They went back to all pieces of evidence left by the killer in hopes of finding something new, but sadly, the case of Elizabeth Short, a.k.a. the Black Dahlia, was well and truly over, even though they didn't want to admit that. A total of 750 investigators of the LAPD and other departments worked on Elizabeth's case at the time, and a number of suspects, theories, accusations, and arrests took place. The media continued its pursuit of a hot story, and by the spring of 1947, the Black Dahlia case had gone cold. The media received more notes and cryptic messages from the supposed killers, but eventually, all interest died down, and they too gave up on the case and abandoned all hope of solving the case of the Black Dahlia. I know most people watching would believe the insufficient technology they had in 1947 might have proved a factor in the killer being able to evade the authorities while toying with them at the same time. But it should be stated that although the case went cold, as the years passed, the FBI continued investigations in finding the answer to who killed the Black Dahlia and why. The murderer has never been found, and given how much time has passed, probably never will. It remains a mystery, and sadly, 
a mystery unsolved. It was a bald, wrinkled, almost blue head. Its eyes were huge and white, and as it looked at me, it had a smile from ear to ear that chilled my blood. Have you ever done urban explorations? You see, I'm not a YouTuber. I'm not interested in generating content from this, and I don't even want to become famous. I just enjoy getting into places where other people wouldn't go. To tell you the truth, I never believed in the paranormal, and that's not what I was looking for in these explorations. And that's why I can tell you this story, as I spent months thinking I had gone crazy. It all started on a camping day. I had planned to do an exploration of the forest. Nothing out of the ordinary. I was just going to spend the night in the woods. None of my friends could go, but I had no problem with that. It wasn't my first exploration alone, and it wasn't going to be my last one either. Or so I thought. I spent the whole day going deep into the heart of the forest. I didn't really know what I would find, but I knew that there were no animals too dangerous or anything like that, since I always investigated where I go. When I got deep enough into the forest, I noticed that it was starting to get dark. So I made my camp and set up camp in a part that I saw as fairly open and free of trees. I ate quickly and went to sleep when it was still quite early. As the sun was rising before 6 a.m., I wanted to get up early and with lots of energy. I closed my eyes slowly, and before I knew it, I was asleep. When I opened my eyes, I felt something was wrong. I'm not a deep sleeper, but I can sleep through the night if no one wakes me up. And that night, something woke me up. The night seemed normal and quiet, but something was wrong. Call it a feeling, experience, or whatever, but I knew someone was there. Looking out at the pasture in front of me, I watched as something moved unnaturally. The wind wasn't blowing and it didn't seem to be an animal. Someone was watching me. It's not the first time I've been in danger, but I've never encountered anything like this before. A stalker whose face or intentions I did not yet know was watching me. Faced with this discovery, I did the most logical thing I could think of. I grabbed my flashlight, a knife I had at my side, and went into the opposite direction to where the grass was moving. In that camp, I didn't have anything too expensive. I could go look for it the next day if there was anything left. In one swift move, I took off at high speed towards the pasture and started running as fast as I could. I didn't know exactly where we were, but I had a good idea of it. As I ran away, I could hear someone behind me chasing me, but the footsteps got lost little by little until they ended up disappearing. I walked a little more looking for a place to hide, and that's when it hit me. In front of me was an abandoned building under construction. It was strange for all the things outside. It looked like a hospital. But what was a hospital doing in the middle of nowhere? Why was it abandoned? Whatever the reason, it was a good hiding place from whoever was still walking near me. So I decided to go in and hide until I was sure this person wasn't following me anymore or just that it would be daylight. Once inside, I realized that the place was fuller than I thought. Why would they leave a place like this half-built? I explored the abandoned hospital, trying to get as far into it as possible. I wasn't really afraid of what might be inside the hospital, but it was the man who was stalking me outside that really terrified me. Behind a closed double door, there were lights. How was this possible? How did the energy get here? Why was it coming? Where was I? I admit, that curiosity got the better of me and I walked to the door. Once I opened it, I was met with a new surprise. Behind the closed door, there were no people. There were no guards and they were not performing any experiments or anything I could expect. It was just a hallway with light. I walked a little inside this corridor, considering going into one of these doors to hide. If that person who was stalking me saw this place, he would surely think there were guards and would not want to enter. I walked in with a big smile, thinking that the worst had already happened and that surely this person could not do anything, when something in front of me made me stop in my tracks and fall to the floor with fright. One of the doors to the lighted corridor was open. 
Behind that door, there was no light, just gloom. Normally, this would not be the striking thing. The whole hospital except that room was dark. What really surprised me was that behind that terrifying door, someone was peeking out. For a moment, I thought it might have been a guard. It could also be my stalker or a simple homeless person who was living in the hospital. But no, this was something much worse. I will never forget how I felt when my eyes came face to face with, with whatever that was. It was a bald, wrinkled, almost blue head. Its eyes were huge and white, and as it looked at me, it had a smile from ear to ear that chilled my blood. I didn't know what this was, and it was the most terrifying thing I had ever seen in my life. At that moment, the first thing you think of is to run. Run as fast as you can and leave it behind. Would you believe me if I told you that I didn't? In that situation, I was so scared that my body became totally paralyzed, falling to the floor in panic and possibly victim to whatever it was that was in front of me, looking at me very calmly. As if knowing that I could not move, that being came out the door and walked slowly down the hallway towards me. His body was tall, gangly, and skeletal. His bones seemed to be disproportionate and senseless but he still walked towards me without any problems. What struck me most was the way he walked. I'm still terrified thinking about it. This being, the steps of this being were irregular and difficult, as if it was suffering every step it took. It was strange. It was walking like any other person, but something about that walk seemed forced. It was as if that thing that was coming towards me was trying to walk trying to be human, trying to make me think that I could be calm because I had another human in front of me. Seeing something so horrible filled my body with energy, and instead of using it to fight this being, I used it to run. I ran and ran and ran. I was so desperate that I didn't realize that I was still in an abandoned place. Since I entered, my life never stopped being in danger. Not by ghosts, psychopaths, or accusers, but by myself. As I was escaping from the being in that hallway, I fell down the escape hatches and ended up on the floor below. My body hurt a lot, and it was impossible for me to get up. But even so, I made every effort humanly possible to get out of that area. To keep going down the stairs and get out of there as soon as possible. But it was no use. Because of the blow I had at that moment, it was impossible for me to keep my concentration enough to keep from fainting. And so, as I closed my eyes and saw something or someone crawling near me, my eyes were much heavier than before. And when I closed my eyes, I fainted. When I woke up, it was already daylight. My body hurt a lot, and I still had the wounds from falling off the ladder. I went back to check the area that was lit, but now, not only was there no light coming from under the door, but the door was locked with the chains. To tell the truth, it didn't bother me much either. Anyway, I had no plans to set foot in that area again. When I managed to escape, the first thing I did was to tell the police everything. Once I did, they all told me that what happened to me at the hospital was probably a lie, the results of my nerves being harassed. It could even be the development of a mental illness that made me hallucinate. Whatever it was, I was sure that what I saw there was real. What the police were able to discover was the information about the man who was following me. Apparently, he was an ex-convict who had escaped from prison. This man never planned to hurt me. But he surely would have, if necessary. Luckily, the police caught him a few meters after he ran into me as he just kept running in a straight line. I still wonder what happened that day. Honestly, the older I got, the blurrier the whole story became. Let this be a lesson. To remember, there are things beyond human understanding. Today, I'm afraid to go camping or to hospital. And I know that no one can judge me for it. The only thing I hope is that no other explorer ends up in that scary abandoned hospital again. Maybe I survived by being lucky, but who knows what that thing might do to the next person who walks in.
Streaming games is a very common thing in the 21st century. And while it's a medium used for having fun and bringing laughter into people's lives, it brought me the worst experience of my life. My name is Jason Miller, and what you are about to hear is that gruesome experience. I used to be obsessed with video games as a kid. It actually all started when I stayed the weekend at a friend's house. That was the first time I played a video game. When I got home that day, I remember I begged my parents to buy me one, but they didn't agree. Apparently, my mom had recently read a really stupid article on how video games deplete your mental capabilities. I remember her telling me, those games can kill you. They can rot your brains. My mom's mindset led to me not getting any games throughout my childhood. And when I turned 17, I thought it'd be different as I was older now. So I asked my parents for a gaming PC and they still said the same thing. That's when I decided to get it by myself. So I began to do some menial jobs to get the money. I mowed countless lawns, watched numerous cats, and I even offered to massage my old neighbor's back. And while most of these were really tiring, it was completely worth it. As nothing could beat the amazing feeling I had when I got my first gaming PC. While getting the gaming PC was great, Starting my first Twitch channel was even better. Due to my love for video games, I wanted to become a Twitch streamer ever since Twitch was a thing. So I immediately started my channel the week I got my gaming PC. When I was starting out, I knew numerous popular streamers played mainstream games like Fortnite, Minecraft, Apex, PUBG, and the rest on their stream channels. But I found myself wanting to play a survival game called Dead by Daylight. For those of you who don't know about DBD, it's a survival horror game where you could play as one of four survivors trying to survive being killed, or you could be the killer trying to kill the four survivors by impaling them on huge rocks. I really loved playing the game because it was really good and I loved all the horror elements that were present in the game. And while it wasn't as popular as Fortnite or PUBG, it had a really strong fan base. In a retrospect, I guess I didn't want to be like everybody else, so I decided to try and play something different. Something that wasn't as popular as the games everyone else was playing. So when everything had been set up, I steadily started streaming. I invited my friends to play with me every time I played, and I put a lot of time and effort into growing my channel. And with time, my followers and my viewers began to rise. Before I knew it, I had 20,000 viewers per week, and I remember being really happy and excited about that. I had probably streamed numerous times before this incident happened. I was playing a private game with my friends on DVD, and during the game, we kept on getting harassed and insulted by a particular player called I'm a Real Killer 12. Since I had my chat box on every time during the gameplay, this dude with the player ID I'm a Real Killer 12 kept trolling me and sending weird messages. He kept on saying things like, You guys are useless. You can't even play this game. Your form is all wrong. Killing looks so much better in real life. It was pretty obvious that he just wanted to get my attention, and I didn't like confronting trolls, but it was getting pretty annoying, so I remember entertaining him one day as I asked him, as if you could do any better. Just leave us alone, dude. I came to regret that decision during our next game because the player called I'm a Real Killer 12 had hacked our private game, and he started stream sniping me and my friends. It started when I noticed that one of my friends, Nate, wasn't in the game. As the killer character being used was the character Evan McMillan, popularly known as The Trapper. And again, for those of you who don't play the game, The Trapper was basically one of the major original characters in the DVD game. He used beer claws to catch his victims, and he wore a really creepy mask. Now, once we saw the character being used in the game, we knew something was wrong. As while The Trapper was an original DVD character, we always used more popular characters like Wraith, Huntress, and The Doctor. It was pretty obvious that we had been hacked by I'm a Real Killer 12, and we could also tell that he was stream sniping, as he always knew exactly where our characters were hiding, and he also used speed hacks to kill us faster, as his character was moving faster than the endgame characters were allowed to. Now, I don't know if you've ever been stream sniped before, but it takes all of the fun out of the game you're playing, as you're killed pretty quickly, and that doesn't allow you to get more gaming time for your viewers to watch. And while I didn't report him immediately after the first game because 
I thought it'd be a one-time thing. He constantly kept hacking and stream sniping me throughout the rest of the week. So I did what every Twitch streamer would do, and I reported him. He was banned, and unfortunately for me, that was another decision I'd come to dearly regret. Everything went back to normal after that, and I played and streamed numerous games the following week without any problems. Everything was fine till the 9th of October, a day I can never forget. My parents were out of town with my elder brother, so it was just me, my little sister, and two of my friends who were sleeping over. They had all gone to bed pretty early, so I decided to start streaming. I remember being happy that they were asleep as I didn't want any distractions while streaming. I also remember putting my headphones on as I began the stream. They were saying things like, Bro, sick cosplay. Did you hire an actor? Nice touch to add real screams in the background. This is your best stream yet. Shit, you had him stand behind you. That was really creepy, dude. Dope cosplay, though. I really didn't understand what was going on or what my viewers were reacting to as I was laser focused on the game. But after thinking about it, I told myself that it was probably just someone's antics or prank I didn't understand. So I decided to ignore it and keep playing. I streamed for a long time that night, and when I was done, I began to interact with my viewers. I wasn't playing the game anymore, so I asked them what was going on as I wanted to know what they were reacting to. They then told me that they saw someone wearing the trapper's costume and standing behind me. At first, I thought they were joking as I told them. Really funny, guys. I'm basically the only one awake at home. My little sister and my friends are all sleeping, so you can stop trying to scare me now. But my viewers continued to assure me that they weren't joking, as they actually saw a huge man standing behind me, wearing the trapper's costume. They also said they had heard screams in the background. I still didn't believe them, as I assumed it was just an organized prank. So I took off my headphones, and as I was about to end the live stream, I heard a large crash coming from one of the bedrooms upstairs. Shocked, I stood up immediately to go check it out as the noise came from my little sister's room. But on the way there, I was distracted by a red liquid trail leading all the way to my sister's bedroom. Scared, I walked towards the room and slowly opened the door. As I stepped into the room, I heard the sound of clanking metal and it was followed by searing pain as I felt something sharp and close my leg. I screamed as I fell to the floor. The pain was truly unbearable. I looked down to see my leg clamped by a bear trap. I began to call out to my friends and my little sister for help, but no one was answering me. I then started to look around, hoping to see something I could use to set myself free. But the first thing I saw made me stop and fear. It also made me forget about the pain in my leg for a split second. As I watched in horror, as my little sister Stephanie and the two of my friends, Maxwell and Jack, were dangling from massive hooks attached to an old cupboard. I knew they were all dead as they were impaled near the chest region. The morbid scene in addition to the searing pain made me throw up as I started to scream again. I began to ask myself why this was happening. Why was my little sister and two of my friends killed in a morbidly similar way characters in the DVD game were killed? I began to have a mental breakdown as my mind couldn't take it anymore. It felt like my brain and my body was about to implode, and as I was about to pass out, I heard the words that pulled me back to my senses as someone said, I told you it looks better in real life. I immediately turned over to see someone looming over me. The person was donning the costume of the Trapper character in the DVD game. I was paralyzed with fear, but I remember screaming, Who are you? The man totally ignored my question as he said, You took it away from me. I used it to clear up all the tension I have inside. I streamed that game to show my followers the proper and true form of killing, but you took it away from me by getting me banned. So, I've decided to play a real-life version of the game with the members of your family. I remember feeling really dizzy as the man spoke. I was losing a lot of blood, and I knew I was going to pass out soon. I also remember how he spoke with a really thick accent that I couldn't recognize. But when I heard the word banned, a dreaded feeling of realization rushed through me as I slowly said, Are you? I'm a real killer 12? He didn't answer me as he proceeded to drag me out of the room by my hair. 
The pain increased a thousand times as the bear trap was still clamped to my leg. I started to scream for help, but I knew it was pointless as the only people at home were dead. The man then left me in the center of the hallway as he went downstairs to retrieve something. I tried to move, but my whole body hurt. It didn't take long before I heard him coming back, and when he reached me, I noticed he was now holding a really jagged dagger. He then started to scream. I told you that you were a useless and horrible gamer. You had no form when it came to killing, so I hacked your game and showed you how it's supposed to be done. But you couldn't take it, so you reported me. You reported me! Now watch as I ban you from life! And with that, he gutted me with the dagger. I can still remember the pain I felt and the feeling of the blade inside of me. At that point, I just wanted to die so that the pain would stop. The man removed the blade from my body, and as he was about to stab me in the heart, I heard the words, Open the door! It's the cops! The last thing I saw that night was my attacker running through the window at the end of the hall. As after that, everything around me went dark. I woke up in the hospital, surrounded by the police. The moments that followed were really painful, as I had to retell and relive all that happened that night to the cops, as they needed to further their investigation. When they were done with the questions, the cops left. The doctor came in, and he told me that I was lucky to have been found early, as I had lost a lot of blood, and if my leg hadn't received the immediate treatment, they would have had to carry out an amputation. I stayed in the hospital for two months after the morbid incident. The cops told me and my family they still haven't been able to find the killer. They then told us that the detectives believed my attacker was already an experienced serial killer as nothing was found at our house during the investigation. No fingerprints or anything incriminating. They tried to find his location by tracking the IP address gotten from his gaming profile, but that was equally unsuccessful. They then told us that the case would remain open, but he still hasn't been found to date. Now that my story is out there in the world, I have something to say to the man who killed a member of my family. I hope they find you and bring you to justice. And one day, like the title of the game, I hope you're dead by daylight. Have you ever had to close a food restaurant over the last shift? My name is Alex, and it happened to me while working at Taco Bell. This Taco Bell was pretty special, though. Since it was located in a very secluded town, I'd say it even operated by its own set of rules. Unlike the city Taco Bell, here we had fewer employees because, truth be told, we didn't need them. I was the newest of the bunch, and honestly, I liked the job. I had a good group of people, and everyone was very patient with me, even though I was a little clumsy. Everything was going well. I was learning the job very quickly, until one night I was assigned to the night shift. Since the restaurant was so small, only one person stayed on the night shift to close it, and since I had already been working there for a few months, they trusted me. Closing the place wasn't hard. Just giving everything a final cleaning, putting up the chairs, and locking up. I didn't even have to worry about closing the cash register because that was done by a colleague before leaving. The only rule we had to respect without exception was that we had to leave before 11.15 p.m. It was forbidden. I mean, absolutely forbidden to stay on the premises after midnight. To tell the truth, I thought it was something bureaucratic, but I knew it was more to it than that. The manager used to be a very permissive and carefree person, but regarding this issue, he was categorical. When I asked the rest of the employees what the reason was for this, they seemed to know the answer, but they didn't want to tell me. They would always tell me that it was better to just obey him, that someday they would tell me. I closed a few times on the night shift, always obeying the one rule of not going over time. So I was trusted with the night shift more and more. Everything was going well until one fateful night, when by trusting me and not understanding that the time limit was put in place to protect me, I put my life at risk as I had never done before. That night, the restaurant was full. There was so much work. Luckily, my coworkers helped me. They moved several of my tasks forward so I could leave on time. When they left and the tables began to empty, I must admit that I made a terrible mistake. 
When cleaning the ice cream machine, I accidentally broke it, and the ice cream started pouring out nonstop. To make matters worse, while trying to fix the ice cream machine, I kicked the bucket, flooding the entire restaurant. I felt like the clumsiest person in the world. I couldn't let this mess stay until tomorrow, or I would surely get in trouble. Just for that night, I decided to stay a little longer to tidy up and pretend nothing had happened. My idea was to go over the deadline, but still finish before midnight. I hurried as fast as I could and finished cleaning up pretty quickly. I went on and on, and before I knew it, I was done. There was just one little problem. Oh no, it's 12.15. I wasn't going to tell anyone that this had happened to me, but at the same time, I couldn't stay in the restaurant for another minute. I tried to run to my locker to grab my things, but I tripped on the wet floor and fell to the ground. I hurt my arm in the fall, but that was no big deal. It was just a fall. The only problem was that it wasn't at all, because when I raised my head, something had changed. Suddenly, the good vibes in the restaurant disappeared, giving way to an atmosphere of enormous discomfort and the feeling that something was wrong. I don't know how to explain this, it was as if the air had changed. It was as if something was there with me, and that something was very oppressive. Scared, I raised my head. And that's when I saw it. A human figure, or at least it looked like one. But something was wrong. Its eyes were completely black, absorbing all the light around it, and its body, its body seemed to be withered impossibly. I blinked several times, thinking it was an illusion. Maybe there was a gas leak. Maybe I hurt my head without realizing it. The only thing I knew was that no matter what or who was still there, I should move away, because what was in front of me looked very real, and I didn't want to be a victim of that horrendous being. Before I could try to rationalize what was happening, I could see that the shadow began to move slowly in my direction. My heart was pounding so hard that I thought it would burst out of my chest. I tried to scream, but the words wouldn't come out. I backed away slowly, frozen with fear. That figure was moving its legs, but it had no reason to do so since it was floating. Little by little, it began to get closer and closer. Something prevented me from running as if this twisted and horrifying being was doing something to me. With a lot of effort, I managed to get up from the ground and try to walk, but things got even worse. Suddenly, I began to feel a strange pressure on my knee. The pressure became stronger and stronger and unbearable, and when I couldn't take the pain anymore, in a single second, my knee broke. Ah! I felt oh. I had no more salvation. I started to crawl to the exit while crying in pain, praying that I had enough strength to make it alive for someone to save me. When I almost reached the exit door, my body froze completely. That being that was behind me got too close to me, and now he was only a few centimeters away from me. Having me at its mercy, the monster made a hand movement and suddenly I began to choke. It was as if my throat had temporarily stopped. No air was coming in or going out. I felt like I was going to die that very day. Suddenly, and to my rescue, the entrance door next to me opened violently, and without hesitation, he grabbed me and dragged me out of the room. Seeing his face, I realized it was someone I knew. It was my manager. I told you to get out before midnight. Wasn't I not clear enough? What? What was that? <sighs> we don't know what it is. We only know that it arrives at midnight and attacks whoever is in the place. But how come no one knows? How is this place still open? This is a secret. If you tell anyone, we'll all be out of work, understand? But it's dangerous. Listen to me. We give work here to a lot of people who need it. Most of your colleagues have a family. We need this place. And as long as we respect the rules, Nothing bad will happen. 
My manager's logic may be strange, but I must admit that I partly understood it. The situation of my coworkers and the people in this town is not the best, so having a place like Taco Bell is very good. Besides, I've been here for several months, and to be honest, nothing has ever happened to me before. I kept working there, but I learned to respect the rules. Every night at 11.15 p.m., I would leave everything ready to leave quickly when the time came. It didn't matter if there was any work to be done. I never encountered that entity again. But the lesson was clear. There are things in this world that we cannot understand. And sometimes, it is better not to challenge the unknown. Since then, my mental clock has been set to leave any place before midnight. My name is Charles, and for years, I have been the driver of the last bus. My shift starts at midnight and ends at four in the morning. Working the night shift has its share of loneliness, of course, but I've never experienced anything quite like what happened one autumn night. For the first few hours of my shift, everything went smoothly. A few passengers got on and off. It was around two o'clock in the morning when I arrived at the last stop before turning around and returning to the depot. The stop was located in a dark and desolate part of town, right next to an old cemetery. There were a couple of dim streetlights, but most of the streetlights were out. As usual, no passengers were waiting at the stop. As I waited for the scheduled time before departing, I turned on the interior lights of the bus to check that everything was in order. I was checking my rearview mirror when I saw a flash of movement in the darkness. I turned to look out the rearview mirror, and to my surprise, saw a man running toward the bus. It was not unusual for people to be late in trying to catch the last bus, but the way this man was moving struck me as odd. His movements were jerky and erratic as if he was panicking. When he finally reached the back of the bus, panting and sweating, I could see his face. He was a middle-aged man with a wild, desperate look in his eyes. I decided to slow the bus down so that this man wouldn't miss it. I was never really one of those drivers who enjoy passengers missing the bus to go home, especially at times like that. The man got on the bus and sat in the back of the bus. His disturbing smile never disappeared from his face. I looked through the rearview mirror and noticed that there were no other passengers on the bus at that time. The bus resumed its march, and as we made our way through the empty streets, the man began to hum a haunting song. It was an ominous tune that I did not recognize and his voice had an eerie tone that sent chills down my spine. As we moved on, the man continued his strange behavior. He began mumbling incoherent words and laughed disturbingly. I became increasingly uncomfortable and concerned for my safety. The possibility that I was dealing with a dangerous person became increasingly real. Finally, the man stood up and pressed the button indicating that he was getting off. This stop was completely deserted as usual. When I opened the door for the man to get off, he just stood there and kept smiling. I asked him to get off, but he did not respond. Instead, he began to walk slowly toward the front of the bus. I felt trapped in my seat, watching with growing anxiety as the man advanced toward me. His smile widened even more, revealing crooked yellow teeth. I realized I did not know how to deal with this situation, and the thought of confronting him directly terrified me. When the man was only a few steps away from me, he finally spoke. His voice was an eerie, icy whisper that made me shiver. Do you know who I am, driver? I shook my head, unable to answer. I had no idea who this man was or what he wanted. Don't you remember? I was one of your passengers many years ago, one night, just like this. But you wouldn't let me off. You had fun watching me miss the last bus, didn't you? I had no memory of that incident, but that didn't matter at the time. I was too scared to think clearly. The man moved even closer, his face inches from mine. I could feel his cold, stinking breath on my face. This is your last stop, driver. Today, it's your turn to stay behind. Before I could react, the man pushed me back with enormous force. 
I fell to the ground stunned as he lunged at me. I tried to scream, but his cold, skeletal hand closed over my throat, stifling my words. Looking terrified, I struggled desperately with the man who assaulted me. His eyes, full of fury and madness, were still fixed on mine as his grip grew tighter and tighter. I felt my life slipping away, and an overwhelming panic overcame me. In a last act of survival, I reached for a small flashlight I kept in my jacket pocket. I wielded it with all my strength and hit the man's head with all my might. The impact knocked him back, releasing his hold on my throat. Coughing and gasping, I took the opportunity to pull away from him. As I sat up, I saw the man withering in pain on the ground, holding his head. He looked dazed and confused. Without a second thought, I ran to the driver's door and slammed the safety door of the bus shut making sure he couldn't reach me. Then frantically, I reached for my cell phone and called 911 for help. The emergency operator's voice calmed my nerves. I explained the situation and the location of the bus. I was promised that the police would be dispatched immediately. As I waited, I held the flashlight in one hand and the bus steering wheel in the other, watching the man on the ground. The man began to come to his senses, but instead of trying to open the front door or looking for a way out, he just sat there and stared at me. His haunting smile persisted, and it was bigger than ever. He didn't seem to be in pain or show any normal emotion. When the police officers finally arrived, the man was arrested without much resistance. As they handcuffed the man, he continued to whisper incomprehensible words and laugh which increased my discomfort and fear of him. The officers assured me that an investigation would be conducted and that they would take steps to ensure my safety. After giving my statement to the police, I made my way to the bus stop, shaking and shocked by the experience. I couldn't recall any similar incidents, but the thought of having left someone behind on a night like that haunted me. Eventually, the authorities discovered that the man suffered from severe mental illness and had been wandering the streets for years. He was not one of my former passengers as he had claimed. Although that revelation relieved me to some extent, the experience left me deeply scarred. From that day on, nights working on the bus became even more lonely and terrifying for me. Every shadow in the darkness, every haunting laugh reminded me of that autumn night. The story became an urban legend in the area. My night bus, known as The Last Bus, gained an infamous reputation. Though I tried to move on, that sinister smile and the man's icy whispers never completely disappeared from my thoughts. And my nightlife was changed forever. As parents, there is nothing more disappointing than watching your kids glued to a device. I am a mom of two sons. My elder, Fernando, is 15, and my younger, George, is 5. Fernando is obsessed with video games, especially a game called Five Nights at Freddy's. I'm not sure what you are supposed to do in that game, but all I know is that the game seems a bit creepy. Fernando spends all his free time in front of his computer playing the stupid video game, while George sits beside him looking at the screen. George looked up to his elder brother and wished to do everything his older brother was doing. That's why he too wanted to play the damn game. I tried everything I could to make Fernando play sports or do any other activity. So George too does not want to do anything but sit beside his brother and watch him play the video game. As a single mother doing two jobs, it was tough for me to always keep track of all the things my kids were doing. And most of the time, Fernando used to look after George while I worked. Most of the time, to make up for lost time with my kids, I used to take them both out once a month to buy something they liked. At a young age, Fernando used to love toys like cars, footballs, etc. But now that he is a teenager, he prefers purchasing a cool hoodie or a pair of trending sneakers or such things. That month, however, Fernando ordered a backpack for him online, which meant I had to take only Georgie to the toy store. I tried to get Fernando to come with us, but he refused as he wanted to get to the next level of his beloved video game. And he also had some homework. And Georgie was way too excited to buy a toy. This month, we were planning to buy a remote-controlled car, a Lego set, and another toy I do not remember the name of. 
The moment we got into the store, Georgie went crazy like any other kid, excited to see so many toys at the same time and get a chance to buy any of them. The store was big, but it was owned by a local man instead of being a chain of toy stores. There were plenty of employees working there. I and Georgie first entered the aisle of all the toy cars. He took his own sweet time looking at all the different types of toy cars. I was hoping he would pick one so we could go home soon. But he decided that he wanted to check out other toys as well. So there we were, an hour into our shopping spree, and my son had not yet picked a single toy. This time, he was being a little too picky. I tried to persuade him to buy a random toy, but he wanted something he absolutely loved. Now we were in Teddy Bear and Dow's section. I thought he was over teddy bears, but apparently not. There were teddy bears of several sizes, and honestly, as an adult, it was a bit creepy. I was almost sure that Georgie would get tired of teddy bears and choose a Lego set he had seen earlier. But after looking at a few teddy bears, he looked up to the topmost rack. Up there was an old-looking teddy bear. At first, I could not make out where I had seen the teddy, but it soon clicked. It was the bear from the video game my son played, Five Nights at Freddy's. It was the soft toy version of the animatronic bear who seems to be the leader of those creepy animatronics. Unfortunately, Georgie too had noticed the teddy and asked me to get it for him. The teddy looked too old and dirty, so I told him to get something else instead, but he insisted on having that teddy itself. I was too tired from working all day and had no energy to talk him out of it. So instead of saying anything, I just handed the teddy to him. He was so delighted to have that old, weird-looking teddy bear. I was just happy he had finally found something he liked. Something weird about this bear was that instead of having paws for hands, this bear had fingers. Only three fingers on each hand. I felt it to be a bit creepy, but my son liked it, so who was I to argue? When we took the bear to the checkout, the cashier girl looked at the teddy, then looked at us, then again looked at the teddy, and told us to wait a sec. She got out of her post and ran to the back of the store where the office was situated. A minute later, she walked back to us with an old man in tow. He looked at the teddy in my son's hand. A look of concern appeared on his face. The moment he reached us, he looked at my son and said, uh, Little man, why don't you pick another toy instead of this bear? I'm afraid I can't sell this bear to you. I want this one. Georgie replied to the old man who looked even more concerned now. I'm sorry, ma'am. I cannot sell this teddy bear to you. But before I could ask why, Georgie started right in the middle of the store hugging the bear tightly to his chest. The man was baffled and did not know how to calm him down. I tried my best to stop him from crying, but he cried and cried. The old man tried to take the teddy from him, but Georgie clung to his new toy. Finally, the man gave up and told us that he would sell the toy to us, but only on one condition. He looked me straight in the eyes and said, Don't ever leave your son alone with this teddy. I was so exhausted from the day by that point that all I wanted to do was take Georgie home as soon as possible, have dinner, and go to bed. So I agreed to whatever the man said, and we were on our way back home in no time. When we reached home, Georgie showed his new toy to Fernando, and he was shocked that we found merchandise of his favorite video game. That night, the boys left the teddy in our living room. The next day, I dropped Fernando off at his school and Georgie at the daycare with his new teddy bear. That night, however, Georgie insisted that he slept with his bear by his side, and I didn't mind one bit. The next morning, when I went into Georgie's room to wake him up, his whole bed was covered in red and in the middle of it all, laid a mutilated body of my youngest son. I screamed, and everything after that happened so fast that I could not feel anything besides the loss of a child. The cops arrived and declared my son murder. He was stabbed in his sleep, and there, at the corner of the room, lay the freaking beer, and he too was covered in blood. And this time, instead of three fingers, he had four fingers, one for each kid he killed. 
Now, my elder son and I are both in custody, as the cops think one of us murdered him. But how do I convince them that the freaking bear killed my child? I should have never left him alone with the bear. Christmas is usually one of the best holidays of the year. The kids are always happy. There's food, parties, and presents. It's really that time of year when we can leave all our problems behind and concentrate on being happy, even if it's just for a day or two. The story I'm about to tell you was just before Christmas, in those days when we were getting ready for the holidays and it was all happy times. What neither I nor my children expected was that those moments of happiness would be interrupted because we had an appointment with the unknown. Something we didn't understand at the time and still don't today was stalking us. And you know what? It still is. If you don't know what you're up against, how can you defeat it? It all started on a snowy day. During those days, we decided to take a mini vacation and went to my parents' country house. My wife was hesitant to go since we had a lot of work to do when we got back. But the kids were on vacation from school and insisted all year to go. So we indulged them. It was only a few days before Christmas. We had already put up the Christmas tree and decorated our house in town. But the cabin still lacked some Christmas spirit. We brought some decorations to beautify the cabin a bit. But to my surprise, my parents had left us something. A human-sized Santa Claus. It looked like an animatronic, but it was very strange. It was too thin. Normally, Santa Clauses are similar to the real Santa. Fat with a huge smile. But there was something weird about this one. His look was touching. He looked like some Santa Claus out of some child's nightmares. I was about to put it away, but my kids saw it at the same time I did, and for some reason, they liked it. Kids really do have the weirdest tastes. Other than that, the day continued as normal. We spent the evening watching movies and eating something as a family. The kids seemed very entertained, and my wife and I were very happy about it. Nothing prepared us for what would happen the next day. After spending the night sleeping comfortably, a scream woke my wife and me at the same time. It was the scream of one of our children. As soon as we woke up, we both looked out the window where the scream was coming from. My two children were outside, running through the snow, running away from someone. When I looked back a little further, I clearly saw their attacker. No, it couldn't be true. It was the Santa Claus animatronics I had put up yesterday. This didn't make any sense. As I watched him run in the direction of my children, I could see him walk very naturally. This was not an animatronic or anything like that. It moved like a human, but it was so thin, who could fit into that costume? I told my wife to call the police as soon as possible while I went to get our children and protect them from their attacker. At that point, I didn't care about bundling up or getting a gun. I had to go as soon as possible. As soon as I got out, I did not go in the direction of my children, but towards my attacker, who for some reason was not running, but only walking in the direction of my children. I don't know what this being was or why it was attacking my children, but I knew I had to do something to stop it. With all my strength, I threw myself at him. I still thought that all this must have some explanation. Maybe it was a person disguised as a Santa, Yes, that must be it. That was the only logical explanation. A little confident from the lie I fed myself, I tried to take him down, but that's when despair and desolation took over my whole body. When I was just a few inches away from him, about to knock him down, I was overcome with a horrible feeling of fear and sadness that prevented me from moving forward. Defeated and crying, I fell to the ground, clutching my chest from the pain I felt. This was not the pain of a physical attack. It was not the pain of an illness. It was the pain one feels when one is very nervous or sad. Santa simply ignored me and kept walking in the direction of my children. Whatever it was, he was aware of what was happening to me. Possibly in some way, he caused it, since he didn't flinch an inch from my attack, knowing what was going to happen. After a few seconds that felt like hours, I gathered all my strength to get up and follow him. The pain and sadness I felt at that moment was so great that even though it faded as soon as Santa left, it still haunted me. 
For me, I would have stayed on the ground surrounded by ice crying, but I couldn't afford the luxury. That being was after my children, and I wouldn't let them feel for a second what I felt at that moment, or worse. I got up and ran as fast as I could through the ice. My children and Santa were already far away in the forest, but the sound of their screams guided me on the right path. With every centimeter I ran, I could feel that horrible feeling taking over my body again. The pain in my chest was getting bigger and bigger. I couldn't be far away. The screams became closer than ever until, crying against a tree, I found my two children. In front of them, the strange figure walked slowly in their direction. As soon as I saw this image, I turned to Santa Claus. You would think that nothing had changed from the last time I did it and ended up on the ice crying, but for me, everything had changed. This time, I was watching as the strange being was about to attack my children, and at that moment, I didn't care about anything but protecting them. I ignored the pain, the fear, the sadness, the cold. All I could see was this thing approaching my children. With a war cry, I lunged at it and knocked it to the ice. Blinded by rage, I didn't realize what was really going on. I was just hitting an empty Santa Claus dial. All the feeling of fear and desperation had vanished the moment I made contact with them. Now I was doing nothing more than hitting an inanimate object while my children cried beside me. When I realized this, I stepped aside and went to hug my children while Santa stood destroyed next to us. It was all over. Once we got back, I threw all the parts of that Santa Claus in the trash and put a new one once we got home. I'll be honest with you, the new Santa Claus didn't last more than two days. Maybe I was still a little paranoid, but I could swear that every once in a while, it felt like it wasn't in the same position I left it in. As if his head or limbs were moving when no one was watching. Also, I couldn't shake this feeling. This feeling of paranoia that when I was near him, I was constantly being watched. For their part, my children didn't talk about it, but I could see in their eyes that they were terrified. At first, my wife thought everything I told her was a joke. But over time, she began to believe us, although part of her thinks it's a strange collective paranoia. I can't blame her, and I can't blame you if you don't believe me. Not even in my wildest nightmares could I think something like this could happen. But I guess, as a human, there are things we can never understand. And you know what? It's okay. I don't want to understand what happened that day. I just don't want it to happen again. I just want my family to be safe. Hey guys, my name is Adam, and I have a story to tell you. On the outside, I'm sure I look like a normal person. Someone who doesn't have much to say or just goes through much in this life. What no one knows is that I lived a night that would change anyone's life. And the consequences of what I lived are still haunting me. It all started one night in December. I was driving down a lonely road in the middle of the night. I wasn't really going anywhere. I just like to drive at this time. I know many people will disagree and tell me that it's reckless and dangerous, but... Those comments never bothered me. The drive was going well. It didn't seem to be a very special night, and nothing unusual was happening. But about halfway through, one of the worst possible things that could happen to me. The car started to fail, and soon, it came to a complete stop. I had no cell phone signal and was far from anywhere inhabited. I stood outside the car, waiting for someone to come by. But I knew this was very unlikely, so... So, I left the car on the road and decided to walk in search of help. I walked for a while and found a house at the end of the road. I approached it in the hope that someone might be able to help me. I knocked on the door, thinking about how I could convince them that I wasn't a psychopath or someone dangerous. But to my surprise, I was greeted by a couple who didn't doubt me for a second. They looked friendly, invited me in, offered me food and a place to stay for the night. I admit I started to feel a little uncomfortable. Maybe it was because they were too nice. At that moment, I thought that we were so used to people being cruel or self-serving that when we really see nice people, we get uncomfortable or think something's wrong. As we were eating dinner, I noticed that the food tasted strange, but I didn't say anything for fear of offending my hosts. They were both looking at me with huge grins from ear to ear. 
They seemed to be obsessed with me eating. After a few more bites, I decided to retire to rest in the room they offered me. In the middle of the night, I heard strange noises outside my room. I carefully got up and tried to get out to see what was going on, but I couldn't. The door to the room was locked. I tried not to panic, not to scream, and tried not to break the door down. But while I was thinking about what to do, I began to hear voices from the other side of the- It seems our little guest didn't enjoy his dinner. I know. I'm sure it lacked enough spices. He made me feel very bad. He's ungrateful, but keep in mind he's not in his own house. It makes sense that he's a little uncomfortable. I know, darling. Thank you. At that moment, I relaxed a little. Maybe I was overreacting. I considered going back to sleep and the next day to apologize for the way I left the table. But suddenly, I heard something else. Besides, what does it matter if he enjoyed the dinner or not? We're basically just feeding a piglet. It's true, honey. You have to keep him well fed. Tomorrow, I'll make him a big breakfast. That way, when we open him up, he'll taste better. Hmm, I can't wait to taste it. It sure is delicious. I just don't understand how human flesh is so good. Hearing those last words, my blood froze and I was paralyzed with terror. In that instant, I understood the true nature of this family. They were cannibals. I was in the house of a family of monsters that fed on human beings. My heart was pounding. I, I didn't know what to do. I was trapped in the middle of the night, far from any help. I tried to stay calm, but fear paralyzed me. I activated the location on my cell phone and sent it to my brother, telling him I needed help. I quickly told him that I was kidnapped and that if he didn't act quickly, I would be killed. Before I could do anything else, I heard footsteps approaching. I tried to hide, but before I could, the door was opening. It was one of them, with a cold and sinister look. He grabbed me tightly and dragged me into another room. <laughs> you know, I knew you were listening to everything I was saying. Why do you think I said it out loud? Do you think because we live on the road we don't have cameras? Please, don't eat me. Let me out. Oh, come on. You think after all you heard I'd let you go? I tried to resist, but he was stronger. He drug me down the hall and threw me into a room with extreme ease. And as the wife arrived and joined her husband, I saw something that left me in shock. There were dismembered bodies. Human remains. Everywhere. I tried to escape, struggling with all my might, but they were determined to make me their next victim. Grabbing me roughly, the man sat me on a chair and grabbed both my arms so I couldn't run away. Meanwhile, the woman slowly approached me. She had a huge smile on her face, and in her hands, she had a lighted needle puncher, which was slowly moving toward my head. You know, I was terrified, like I'd never been in my life. But a part of me had some hope. One thing I had noticed since I saw the woman with the hole punch was a strange smell coming from them. It was the smell of wine. At that moment, I felt the man grabbing me somewhat unsteadily and the woman walking towards me in a very slow and meticulous way. But at the same time, erratic. These people knew what they were doing. They had killed before and had every intention of doing it again. But this time, they made a mistake. They were completely drunk. I decided to try and stay calm and loosen my body a little, looking for an opportunity to attack. When the woman was almost at my side, I managed to kick her in the knee. This caused the man to be distracted for a moment, which I took advantage of to get away from him and hit him. As soon as I regained control of the situation, I ran away, without looking back, with my heart beating so hard that I felt it would leave my body. I ran and ran, not knowing where I was going. I was lost in the darkness of the night. I heard their voices behind me, chasing me. No matter how much alcohol they had, 
They were still very dangerous indeed, and if they caught me, they would not forgive me for running away. This was all a nightmare, a nightmare that refused to end. Finally, I saw lights in the distance. I ran towards the direction they were coming from, and then I identified the lights better. I realized that I was on the road and that those lights were the police. I came screaming for help, and when they saw me, one of them asked me if my name was Adam. Apparently, these cops were surrounding the area, looking for me. I told the police everything, and they called for reinforcements and went to the cannibal's house. But they didn't find them in the house. They were probably hiding in the woods from the moment they saw the police sirens. On the other hand, everything I told you proved to be true, since they found the corpses of the previous victims and managed to identify the brutal killers. To be honest, I don't know how the case ended. After giving my testimony, I, to be honest, I don't know how the case ended. After giving my testimony, I decided to stay away from the trial altogether. I know for sure they both received life sentences, but I really didn't want to know anything else about what happened. I didn't want to remember at all what I experienced that night. That was the last night ride I ever took. It may have been a few years ago, but I still dream of that horrible room. When I wake up, I see the eyes of both psychopaths meeting mine. It's as if they never left me, as if they live inside me, refusing to let me go on with my life and mocking me because I ate human flesh that night. How many of you believe in demonic possession? I would say many of you enjoy watching those horror movies, but in real life, hardly anyone believes in things like demonic spirits or ghosts. Until they experience it firsthand. Being a horror freak, I did not miss a single horror movie. You name it, I must have seen it at some point. But like traumatic endings of some horror movies, my life too did not go as I planned, and I ended up working in the Burger King. My job was not even flipping the patties or taking the orders. Nope. I worked as a cleaner. I made sure the Burger King outlet was clean first thing in the morning and last thing in the evening. I mostly worked throughout the day picking up trash and trays left by people on the tables. I wiped the floors whenever necessary and washed the dishes whenever necessary. Every day, hundreds of people visit Burger King. But we have a nurse that works in a hospital opposite to us. She comes here for lunch every afternoon. And with her is her little daughter, Maria. Both of them come here almost every day. The majority of the staff members know these two and their orders by heart. Little Maria won't be more than five. She is a special child, as she has mild autism and needs some medical care. Good for the little girl, her mother is a nurse. So every morning, Mary brings her daughter to the hospital with her for therapy, and every afternoon, they come here to grab a bite. Then she drives little Maria to her grandparents and returns to work. Never before this had I dealt with an autistic child. But Maria is pretty sweet and is friends with most of the staff. So she is not scared of us. But to comfort herself, she carries a little rag doll with her everywhere. They say it's to make her feel comfortable. The rag doll makes her feel grounded and safe in some ways, says her mom. Hell, what do I know? If the doll makes the kid happy, so be it. But now Mary is going to be six and most probably go to school. So her doctor and therapist thought that it's time she lets go of the toy. So for the last few weeks, they have been working on separating the doll from the child. So far, no success. She had the doll since she was born. It was gifted to her by her late grandmother. And by the condition of the doll, you could say that it has seen better days. Although the doctors are patient with the kid, Mary is not. She thought it would be best if she took the doll away from her daughter once and for all. Sure. She would cry and throw a hissy fit, but Mary was ready to handle it. Mary thought that Maria would get bullied in school if she carried a doll everywhere with her. Nonetheless, a very beaten up old doll. So the day Mary planned to do this, she brought Maria to our Burger King and ordered some extra food, especially the items Maria liked. Mary had planned to leave the doll behind in the Burger King and pretend that they had lost the doll so it would hurt Maria less. She had spoken to a few of the staff members about her plan, and we were all going to help Mary distract Maria. I was entrusted with the job of slowly sneaking off with the doll while Maria was busy eating. I had to make sure Maria does not notice me, or, worse, catch me in the act. 
The day comes when we have to execute the plan. Little Maria enters the Burger King with her mother, and she looked tired from her daily therapy. One of her hands was holding her mother's, and the other clutching the damn doll. They sit at their regular table, and the waitress brings their food, the extra cheese fries, and milkshake on its way. Maria is happy to see that her mom is treating her with all her favorite food items. She momentarily forgets her doll, and that's when I go to their table, pretending to take their empty trays, and I pick up the doll, too. Maria was so focused on her food that she did not notice her precious toy missing. But before I could discreetly return the doll to Mary, she got a phone call from the hospital, and she left in a rush, almost dragging little Maria behind her. The poor girl just grabbed her milkshakes and walked away with her mother. No thoughts about the doll. I guess that I was left taking care of the doll for the night. The next day when Maria and Mary would come, I had planned to return the doll to the girl's mother. In the meantime, I decided to keep the doll in the supply closet with all my cleaning stuff. The doll was so dirty that it fit right in there. I continued my shift and paid little attention to the doll. At around 10.30 when all the staff left and I was left with the responsibility to clean the restaurant and lock it up, I walked to the supply closet and opened it to grab my cleaning supplies. But surprisingly, the doll wasn't there. I searched through the closet and found it had fallen at the bottom. Instead of locking up the doll again, I decided to place it on a table and start working. I often clean the kitchen area first as it gets dirtier. Once I finish cleaning one area, I switch off the light and move to the next. I had placed the doll on a table close to the kitchen area, and once I was done cleaning it, I switched off the light, plunging the table into darkness. I continued cleaning, whistling to myself. That's when I see a moment through the corner of my eye. I instantly turn towards the table with the doll and freeze mid-cleaning. The doll was no longer laying flat on the table, but was standing and bent in a weird position. However, what scared me the most were the glowing red, orangish eyes that seemed to pierce through my soul. Next thing I know, the doll's head twists backward, and it's all like it's a horror movie. Instead of being a brave person, I just dropped my supplies and ran home. I did not even bother to lock the Burger King. The next morning when I reached the restaurant, the manager is already at my throat for being so careless and leaving the restaurant open. I explained to him what had happened, and he threw the rag doll which was still on the table at my face and fired me on the spot. But I knew that something was very wrong with the doll, and now I'm sitting on the sidewalk waiting for Mary with the doll in my hand and without a job. Now that I look at it, its button eyes and old frilly clothes are the same as they were before. No sign of any demonic possession. So is the doll really possessed, or is there a problem with my head? Have you ever been to Wendy's? In general, it is a good restaurant. The food is pretty good, and they have more variety than the rest of the burger places. Like McDonald's with Ronald, they also have their own mascot. She is a very cute, red-headed girl. I never knew if she is based on a real person, or if they just created her for the logo. But what I do know is that once, Someone disguised as she tried to kill me. It all started one normal night. On weekends, I have to babysit my son and his favorite place to eat is Wendy's. He used to throw a big tantrum when I didn't take him and over time, it had become our favorite father-son activity. Everything was going well until one day, I noticed something strange. As we left the place, a person disguised as the Wendy's girl greeted us. There was nothing strange about this. What did scare my son was that the whole costume was covered in blood. After we passed her, she walked behind us, still waving at us. My son started to get really scared and started to speed up his pace. I thought about confronting this person, but to tell the truth, I'm a pacifist. I don't know how to fight and I don't want to. I would if it was to defend my son, but what would that accomplish? I would only put him at risk. I decided to pick up the pace and get into the car as soon as possible. Just a few steps away, the girl was still waving at us in a terrifying manner. Several weeks passed and my son was somewhat reluctant to return to the restaurant until one day. I talked to his mother and she convinced him. I was sure nothing would happen. Maybe that was a one-time thing. If this person was stalking all the customers like that, she had probably already been kicked out. With many doubts, my son went with me to the restaurant. Little by little, I could see how the spark began to return. 
There was no trace of the strange woman, and he began to feel more and more comfortable. We spent a great night together eating. It seemed like everything that had happened would be in the past as a bad and bizarre memory. We made our way to the car, and the parking lot was empty. But this was a good thing since our stalker from that time wasn't there either. We got into the car, and I started it up. But at that moment, the thing I was most afraid of happened. In front of the car, preventing us from moving forward, the woman in the costume was waving at us. Her costume was still bloody, and just like last time, looked like fresh blood. Her greetings were much more frenetic than the previous time. This time, she was waving her hand violently. As soon as he saw her, my son began to cry as if he had recalled an event that had kept him awake at night for many nights. I knew it had affected him, but this was much worse than I thought. I honked at her to run, but instead of listening to me, she only came closer, walking in front of the car and even standing on top of it. I quickly put on the seatbelt while I listened as this terrifying woman walked on the roof. I took advantage of the situation to try to speed up the car, but as if sensing that I was going to do it, she laid down and stuck her head inside of the window, showing us a big knife in the process. I accelerated the car. But in a matter of seconds, we lost control and crashed into a pole. All the car's tires were flat. The woman had fallen from the accident, so I took the opportunity to grab my son and run back to the Wendy's. On the way, the woman caught up with me in a matter of seconds and threw me to the ground. My son fell away, and as I yelled at him to go to the restaurant to report what was happening, the woman tried to press her knife against me. She was very strong. Somehow, her strength was equal to mine, which in itself was not much. My arms began to give way, and the knife came closer and closer to my throat until suddenly, it was all over. Some security men threw the woman away from me, and I, terrified, stepped back. I took a deep breath because it was all over, but a battle cry brought me back to reality. The woman was running at full speed, and in one leap, she lunged towards me to plunge her knife into me. The security men caught her in mid-jump, grabbed her knife, and held her until the police arrived. When they took off her mask, my son started crying, and I was shocked. That person was not a Wendy's employee. She was my ex-wife, my son's mother. After a while, she confessed that she was dressing up to scare my son so that he would no longer want to spend time with me or have a bonding activity like she was doing. She had no intention of killing me, but that night, everything went out of control. She had taken drugs that took her out of herself, and because of that, all the subtlety in her plan was gone. She went into a state of euphoria and with the knife already in her hand, tried to kill me and give my son a trauma he would never forget. After that, I kept custody of my son. He still goes to see his mother in prison, but he doesn't want to. I always convince him to do it, to forgive her, but I must tell you the truth. I will never do it. Since that day, every time my son and I go to Wendy's, we are afraid. The food tastes much more bitter, and we are just thinking about leaving. But we keep lying to ourselves that everything we went through didn't affect us. At the end of the day, even though she ended up in jail, my ex-wife, the woman dressed as the little girl at Wendy's, got her way. Hi, my name is Jake. Although my tastes have changed as an adult, as a child, I always went to Wendy's. As my father told you in another story, I almost fell victim to my own mother. You see, since my parents were divorced, she dressed up as the Wendy's girl to scare me. She did it with the firm motive of ruining my happiness by going to Wendy's, all so I wouldn't enjoy being with my dad. But in trying to scare us, everything got out of control. What started out as an attempt for me to spend time with her ended up leaving her in prison and me with a horrible trauma. But you know, the worst had not yet happened to me. My mom may have been behind bars, but the Wendy's girl would continue to haunt me. It all continued a few months after the incident. My father was working and I was on vacation with a lot of free time at home. It was hard to adjust to the new school after what I experienced that night. I had a hard time trusting people since my own mother tried to kill me and my dad. I had taken a short nap and when I woke up, it all came back to me. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was the girl from Wendy's in my room. 
I rubbed my eyes. This had to be a dream. This couldn't be real. She had already been arrested. My mom was in prison. If this wasn't my mother, who was it? The girl from Wendy's slowly approached me with a knife in her hand. I was paralyzed with fear. I couldn't move. I could only cry from despair. Once this person was next to me, he slowly approached me. And face to face, he spoke to me. Did you think it was all over, Jake? I won't leave you alone. I'll come for you soon. And with that said, he just left. I didn't run away. I didn't scream for help. And I didn't even close my door. I just stayed frozen on the bed, crying. I felt something wet on my bed. And when I looked, my bed and my pants were soaked. I had peed. This person may have been disguised just like mom, but he was taller and more imposing. Plus, he had a man's voice. But who could he be? A few minutes later, I heard my dad come home from work, and the energy returned to my body. I ran to him and told him everything, hoping that we would go to the police or that he would do something to stop this person. He seemed concerned, yes, but he didn't believe me. He just checked the house and told me that it was normal for me to be so scared. It is normal for me to see the Wendy's girl in my nightmares, as it had all been very traumatic for me. After telling me to talk about it in therapy, he gave me a hug of concern. I was not pleased. The days went by and I couldn't stop thinking about my encounter with the girl at Wendy's. I was terrified. I was terrified this person swore to come back, swore to kill me, but what could I do? My father didn't believe me and I couldn't just run away from the house. To make it worse, I felt very strange, as if I was being watched all the time. Many times, I would fall asleep and see someone's shadow watching me from the dark. Sometimes I would hear footsteps in the house when I shouldn't have, and other times, I just felt like I wasn't alone. But of course, my dad would deny everything, since he was never around at the same time as my stalker. I was desperate and didn't know what to do, but soon, everything would get worse. One day I heard the sound of someone at the top of the stairs. My dad wasn't there, so I knew there was definitely someone invading my home. Being a kid, I made the worst possible decision. I grabbed a knife and decided to take care of the situation myself. I walked slowly towards the source of the noise. It was in my father's room. With the knife raised, I decided to investigate. The room was empty. The man was probably gone. I saw some papers on dad's desk and when I tried to put them away, there it was. It was the mask of the girl from Wendy's. At that moment, I understood everything. Why wasn't the man ever there at the same time as my father? Besides, they both had the same height and a similar voice. My father was disguised as the girl from Wendy's. But why? After that day, everything changed between me and my father. I felt that everything he did was suspicious. Little by little, we began to distance ourselves. He tried to talk to me and told me that he didn't understand what was wrong with me. I admit that he made me doubt, but even so, it would have been dangerous to trust him. All this came to its worst on a Sunday. That day, I was at the table, waiting for my father to come and eat with me. The food in the oven was almost ready, but he wasn't coming. I got up from the table to see what was going on, and as soon as I took a step... I saw her. The Wendy's girl was standing in front of me. Now that I saw her in person, she really had my father's height and build. Again, she started walking towards me. Terrified, I could only retreat backward, crying until I bumped into a chair and fell down. We both know you know who I am, Jake. So why pretend? You know, things have been bad between us lately. Why don't we resolve them with a big, big hug? The Wendy's girl approached me with her knife raised. She was ready to kill me, and there was nothing I could do. Just watch my father in disguise get rid of me. When she was a few inches away from reaching me, the unthinkable happened. My father rammed the Wendy's girl from behind. He was tied to a chair, and his mouth was taped. But it looked like he had somehow untied his feet. My dad started kicking the Wendy's girl on the floor while pointing at me, crying and telling me to run to the neighbor's house. Not knowing what to do, I listened to him and ran as fast as I could. 
I told the neighbors everything and while one of them called the police, two others went to help my dad. I didn't understand what was happening. One minute I was fine, but all of a sudden I heard a loud noise and someone was holding me. It was the girl from Wendy's. She had caught me. She ran as fast as she could and headed for a white van, but suddenly I felt another impact. The neighbors who had gone to help my dad had knocked her down and were holding her back. I fell to the ground, crying, while another of my neighbors hugged me. When the police arrived, they arrested the Wendy's girl. When they took off her mask, I was shocked by the surprise. She was a tall, sturdy person with very marked features. It was a person I didn't know. Why was he doing this to us? Why was he impersonating my father? At the same time as the police, an ambulance arrived. The ambulance drove to my house and after a while, they took someone away in a black bag. A short time later, I found out that it was my father, that he had died. Shortly after that, I moved in with my father's sister and partner. Today, after 10 years, they are like parents to me. The police made the man who killed my father, the man dressed as the Wendy's girl, confess. I may not have known him, but he knew me. He was my mother's lover, and everything that happened was a plan gone wrong. They wanted me to believe that my father had gone crazy and that he was the new girl at Wendy's. They wanted me to distance myself from him. They wanted me to distance myself from him, and that day when it all happened, my mother's lover was going to give me the scare of my life. And then he was going to kill my dad, making it look like a suicide. What they did not plan was that my father was going to untie his feet and attack him, giving his life for me to escape, again saving me. I never saw or spoke to my mother again. Eventually, I was encouraged to go back to Wendy's. Make no mistake, every time I see the Wendy's girl, I feel dread. But that was my favorite restaurant and I had to overcome my fear. My mother's obsession had already taken too much out of me in my life. I wasn't going to let it take anything more out of me. My name is Anthony Smith, and I was an employee at the Burger King restaurant in Houston, Texas. My reason for writing this is to share with the public the horrific activities that have occurred at Burger King for the past couple of years involving the disappearance of multiple Burger King employees with no information as to where they had gone, and my personal traumatic experience with the infamous Burger King. I interviewed for the job at Burger King on the 21st of November, 2017. At the time, I was 21 years old and just looking for a way to get some money while I looked for a better job. The man who interviewed me was named Donald, and since the job didn't require any past experience or anything like that, it was more him giving me the restaurant's rules and guidelines than actually asking me questions. The rule he emphasized the most was kind of odd to me. He made sure I understood the manager and manager's office were strictly off limits and any issues I had should be taken up with him, the assistant manager, as the manager was a very private man and did not like to be disturbed. Now, it seemed odd to me that the manager wouldn't want to interact with the employees at all, but it didn't seem like a problem at the time, and I was just glad I had gotten the job. The first few weeks working at Burger King were tiring. I was constantly doing dishes all day, and at night, when I was done with the dishes, I'd have to clean the whole place alone. I wasn't sure if I'd keep the job for much longer, but I did because I needed the money. Eventually, I got used to the routine, and I began bonding with the cooks and a girl named Becky, who always stayed late to lock up. While cooking at night, I couldn't help but always glance at the manager's door and wonder how no one had seen him or if he even cared what went on in the restaurant. One day, while doing the dishes, I decided to ask the cooks if any of them ever met the manager. Hey. This is kind of a weird question, but have any of you ever met the manager? A silence followed before Gerald, the head chef, looked at me and said, Well, I haven't met him, but I've seen him. The silence remained as Gerald continued with, It was back when I was still kind of new here. I was working the night shift when I heard his door shut. Obviously, I wanted to know what he looked like, so I stopped and had a look. Gerald paused as if trying to build up the tension. He laughed and continued, <laughs> I've told everyone already, he's a pretty normal guy. There's no mystery. There's no secret. Just a man that likes his privacy. So 
Don't go looking for answers where there are no questions, Smith. He patted me on the back and walked away. We were open pretty late that night, but eventually everyone had gone home, and the only one I was left with was Becky. I decided to ask her about the manager as I couldn't believe Gerald's story. Can I ask you something? I asked as I cleaned down the last table. Whatever you want, Smith. She replied, so I continued with, What do you think about our manager? I stopped cleaning and looked at her, trying to see if she had any reaction like the cooks. But she didn't seem even slightly bothered by my question. She just looked up at me and said, You mean the manager that doesn't exist? Honestly, I've never cared enough to ask questions. I just get paid and go home. I responded with, So you didn't find it even slightly strange? What if it's something illegal? She laughed and kept looking at her phone. Yeah, sure, Smith. Maybe Burger King is a drug lab or a... She was cut off by the sound of a shutting door coming from the back. Nobody else was with us and the only offices at the back were Donald's and the managers. Did you hear that? I said, wondering who was around this late. Becky didn't seem to care as she just replied, Relax! It's probably just Donald. He stays late sometimes. I was basically done cleaning, so I decided to check it out. I walked out to the back, and no one was there. So I decided it'd be better to just finish up and leave. I didn't see Donald, I said as I returned to the dining area. It's cool. I saw who it was. Becky said, still clearly unbothered. Really? Who was it? I asked. We were both pretty tired and I figured I was keeping Becky by wasting time, so I told her I was done and left her to lock up. That night in bed, I thought for a while about what both Gerald and Becky said and decided whoever the manager was, I shouldn't care as long as I did my job and got paid. As I walked to Burger King the next morning, I could see a small crowd forming around the restaurant and a couple of cop cars and police officers trying to disperse the crowd, a lot of which were Burger King employees. I figured someone had broken in and stolen something, but but as I got closer, I realized the truth was far more worse than that. My heart fell to my stomach as I saw Becky sighted up against the door with her head tilted over. There was a large amount of blood on her head and some had run down her arms and face. The police questioned all the employees on their whereabouts last night and eventually it came up that I was the last person to see Becky alive so I was taken into custody to be questioned. I told the police everything about how Becky and I usually stayed late together every night and this wasn't a one-time thing. They asked me to think hard as even the smallest detail could be the answer to this question and it didn't take that much thinking to remember the only thing I found odd last night. There was a noise, I said. A noise? The officer replied as that detail seemed to have interested him. Yeah, a noise. It came from the back. The officer interrupted with, The back like, out back? No, I replied. Not outside. It's where the offices and stores are. At least, that's what I thought. But when I went to check it out, no one was there. I continued with, Becky said she saw someone though. The officer's eyes lit up when I said that. Did she say who it was? No. All she said was he was really tall. That's it. The officer said, visibly disappointed. Nothing else. He continued. Listen, young man, we understand you're probably very emotional right now, and we get it. But a young lady was killed right in front of your workplace. Nothing was stolen, and she wasn't sexually assaulted. Do you understand what that means? It means either your friend Becky kept some bad company, or we have a very sick individual running around killing people. So if there's anything you're keeping from us, I suggest you say it. To be honest, I was trying to understand what had happened just as much as the police wanted to, and I don't know why, but I was certain the manager had something to do with Becky's death. I told the police I didn't know anything else, and after some more questions, they let me go. I was told not to travel out of the city, and that I would be contacted again shortly. I didn't think I would be a suspect, but it made sense seeing I was the last person to see her alive. I thought about what to do for a while. I was already the leading suspect in this case and would be prosecuted if the police didn't find the actual killers or any evidence proving otherwise. I thought hard and back to that night, wondering if I had missed anything, 
All I could remember was the noise of the shutting door. It didn't make any sense how whoever it was left without me seeing them. I laid in bed thinking for hours before deciding I had to find out for myself what really happened that night. I walked over to Burger King at night with only one thing on my mind. Who was the tall man Becky saw? It wasn't hard getting past the police tape and getting in through the back door. The place was quiet. I couldn't help but notice how being in here alone filled the Burger King with an eerie feeling. I silenced my phone and lowered the brightness before walking straight over to where the offices were. And standing in front of the manager's office, sort of preparing myself for a reveal of some sort, I got the sense of tension as chills ran down my spine. I opened the door and almost immediately something caught my eye. It was a door right at the back of his office. A door, I'm guessing, leads outside. It seemed to explain everything, but I couldn't help but still feel confused. I decided to look around the office and see if I'd find answers. It was quite a small office. It had a lot of paperwork and didn't have anything out of place. I figured the door was enough to prove the manager had something to do with Becky's death and would eventually help the cops figure out the rest of the story. But as I was about to leave, I heard something faint, but it got louder and I soon realized they were footsteps. I quickly turned my phone's flashlight off and hid under the desk right when the door slowly creaked open. The person walked into the room and there was silence for a minute. Fear was the only thing I could feel at that moment as I wondered if I would end up like Becky. There was no movement or sound, almost like whoever it was simply stood in the room with me. But then he said, You can choose to remain hidden, but the outcome won't be any different, Smith. His voice cut through the silence, but I remained quiet. He sounded old. I'd figured you'd be more enthusiastic than this when you finally got to meet me. Don't you want answers to your questions? I decided at this point, he obviously knew I was in the room, so there was no point hiding. I hit emergency call on my phone, slipped it in my pocket, and got out from under the table. I was met with an almost seven feet tall man completely bald with huge eyes that had completely sagged eye bags under them. He had a slight hunch forward and was skinny. You knew I'd come? I was wondering how he found out I was here. Yes, you aren't a very smart individual. He replied with no expression on his face. Why do you kill her? I asked, hoping the cops would get here before he killed me too. No, I didn't kill her, Smith. You did. He said, pointing at me. What? No, I didn't. Yes, you did. He screamed, interrupting me. You killed her, Smith. Your questions killed her. You couldn't just work like everyone else, could you? Well, that's what killed her. You know, someone like you always comes around eventually, asking questions they're not meant to. Far too inquisitive for their own good. And then... We have to kill them. I was both scared and confused at this point. Was he killing people for just trying to find out who he was and... What did he mean by we? What kind of sick man kills people because they want to know what he looks like? I took a few steps back after asking the question, as I didn't know if I would be getting a reply, he would just get bored and kill me. Look, Smith, a long time ago, probably before you could even say a word... I was part of a greater mission to keep the world how it is. To be rid of all the purges and mistakes on this earth. I was a member of the second clan of the KKK. A group with only one goal, to cleanse the world. But instead, we were seen as evil by this weak society and deemed belittling names such as white supremacists and hate groups. Unfortunately, I was arrested and put on death row. That was until some members of my clan broke me out, of course. We had to leave our home, but don't be mistaken. We took our mission with us. I am a very wanted man, and where better to hide than the place this society sees as a safe place? He continued. Do you understand, Smith? People like you are a risk to me and my clan as a whole. We tried to warn you not to ask questions, but you blatantly disregarded our warning. The sickening look in his eyes couldn't be described, 
but I knew he was going to kill me. I didn't want to die, so I asked one last question as my final attempt to buy time. But why Becky? I asked, crying. He wore a sickened smile on his face as he said, A part of me would like to say it's because she saw me, but that's not true. Despite her nonchalance toward the situation, she was an abomination. Her color of her skin and her supposed sexual orientation had doomed her already. My skin crawled just seeing her walk around every day. It was all just a matter of time. He paused, then continued with, Now, if you're done buying time, sadly, Smith, I can't have you around anymore. I ran for the door at the back, but it was locked. My heart was pounding, and tears began filling my eyes. I turned and watched as he picked a hammer from the shelf before lunging at me. Fighting back was the only option I had, and I had to take it. I grabbed his hands midair and we began struggling. He was oddly powerful for an elderly man, and as he hit my nose with his head, I let go of him. I was disoriented for a few seconds, and that's when I felt the hammer hit my head. I immediately hit the floor as I was barely conscious and could feel the pool of blood forming around my head as I closed my eyes. In the distance, I could hear sirens, and the last thing I saw was the manager's feet move past me as he unlocked the back door and left. I woke up days later in the hospital and was informed I was almost dead by the time I arrived at the hospital. The manager was identified to be Griffith Theodore, a notorious and wanted leader of the second clan white supremacists. It was revealed both Donald and Gerald have supported and aided him for years and were never identified by the authorities. Griffith, Donald, and Gerald had escaped the police and were reported to have already fled the state. The following years after that were difficult. I suffered a traumatic brain injury from the blow to the head and had to undergo therapy and rehabilitation for traumatic brain injury. Burger King ruined my life and there's a shiver that runs down my spine every time I walk past one. I can't help but always wonder if there's a deeper meaning to the restaurant's infamous slogan. Have it your way. From a very young age, the kids of my town were asked to stay away from the woods. I remember my grandma telling me to play in the park where all the other kids were, rather than venturing into the woods, especially in the evening or at night. I grew up with a fear of the woods and what lurked inside them. The fear only got prominent as I became older. So when I took up the job of a firefighter in our town's fire department, I knew one of these days I would be forced to go into the woods. My grandma used to tell me stories about the woods and how an evil lived inside it. It was rumored that she killed and ate anyone who crossed her path. So not even the elders of the town went into the forest. Our town was small and surrounded by forest from three sides. All the people in the town avoided the forest like a plague and only entered to get wood sometimes. Over the years, my grandma had told me many stories about the witch. The first time I stepped into the forest was on a very stressful day. The south side of the forest was on fire and the fire was spreading pretty fast. It was my job to scout the woods and warn the hikers to get back to the town as soon as possible. I was terrified as hell, but decided to step into the forest nonetheless. The forest had many unmarked trails and I decided to stick to the one that seemed the biggest of them all. I had a dirt bike which I rode into the forest slowly looking for the hikers. As I kept going on into the interior of the forest, the trees around me got thicker. The sunlight did not reach the ground due to dense overhanging branches, which made the forest floor dark. I remembered my training and kept my cool as I rode inside. There was no trace of any hikers, so I knew they must be deep in the forest. I needed to reach them before it was too late. The radio I was using to communicate with my team had lost range a few meters back, but I kept on proceeding. A mile after that, I spotted a small wooden house. The house looked like someone lived in it. My first thought was that maybe a hunter had built a cabin to live out here while he was busy chopping wood or maybe it was a resting spot for the hikers. I parked my dirt bike against a tree and walked near the house. The door to the house was shut and a metal chain was wrapped around the handle to prevent anyone from entering. However, the window beside the door was made up of glass and I peeked through it. The house was one big room and it looked like someone had lived in it recently. 
There was a small bed in one corner and an old wooden table. There was no separate kitchen but a small stove in another corner. It seemed like an ordinary hunting cabin until I spotted a small shelf tucked beside the bed that had several jars filled with murky liquid and what was stored in the jars scared the shit out of me. Inside each jar was a small portion of human body parts. One of the jars had a finger. The other had an ear. One of them had an eye while another had a nose. I was repelled by looking at it and I instantly knew I hadn't stumbled upon a hunter's pad. Rather, it was the witch's home. As soon as that realization hit me, I ran towards my dirt bike, hopped on it, and drove off. A few meters away in the tree line, I spotted a white wild cat running parallel to my bike. If I sped up, it sped up. If I slowed down, the cat slowed down too. It was weird as animals in the forest generally run away from people. But this cat seemed to follow me. I kept my cool and thought about the hikers I needed to reach. I kept on riding my bike, and suddenly the cat ran faster as it seemed to be moving in my direction rather than parallel to me. It was running a few meters away from me, and it leapt upon a big tree that was 15 meters ahead of me. The cat climbed the tree and sat on the branch that hung right above the path of my dirt bike. Now I was forced to pass from below it. The cat stared at me with its big yellow eyes. It did not meow, rather it hissed at me. It was a very weird cat. I stood there looking at it for several minutes and then finally decided to keep moving. The cat did not take its eyes off me while I passed from the road below. As soon as I passed the cat, I sped up and rushed forward. However, a part of me was compelled to look behind. I turned around and what I saw was enough to knock me off my dirt bike. Perched on the same branch was a freckled old woman wearing a black tunic with long black matted hair looking at me. I barely managed to balance my dirt bike and marched ahead with all I had in me. I had just encountered the witch my grandma had warned me about and she could shapeshift. With sweat running down my forehead and my hands barely managing to hold the handle, I tried my best and kept riding for a few kilometers. Finally, Around noon, I found the hikers I was looking for. I asked them to wait by the checkpoint where a rescue team was going to pick them up. But now, I had to return through the same route I came from, which meant there was the chance I would encounter the witch again. I started to recite prayers and rode my bike at a much slower pace, trying my best to avoid the witch and her home. But there was no other way out. I had to meet up with the other members of my team on a pre-decided spot. As I came closer, I could see the old wooden house in the tree line, but there was no woman nor a cat anywhere to be seen. My first instinct was to look up at the trees, but the tree line was devoid of any animal, human or even bird. I continued praying and sped up once more. As I came near the house, there was pin drop silence, except for the roar of my dirt bike. As I was just about to pass the house, the front wheel of my bike got stuck in a branch and I fell off my bike. Ah! Within minutes, the woman was behind me. She threw a rope around my neck trying to choke me. I was struggling to free myself, but she was more powerful. She was slowly dragging me towards her house and I was losing consciousness. But at that moment, before I lost my breath forever, I remembered the pocket knife I had in my back pocket. I removed it and stabbed the witch in her thigh. Her scream echoed through the forest and for a split second, she let go of the rope, clutching her bleeding thigh. I freed myself and stood up, still feeling a bit dazed due to the lack of oxygen. I did not pick up my bike, nor did I bother to take my pocket knife, which was still buried in her thigh. I started to run as fast as I could. I could hear rapid footsteps behind me, and as I turned, a big white feral cat was running behind me, waiting to jump on me. However, she wasn't as fast as before, as one of her feet was bleeding profoundly. I managed to cross a distance of a few meters and suddenly the footsteps stopped. I turned around, and the witch was standing in between two big trees glaring at me. It seemed like she couldn't cross the threshold of those trees. 
She was trapped in that part of that forest, and anyone who passed through it was her victim. I was crying tears of relief. Soon, my radio picked up the signal, and I heard one of my teammates say that the fire was contained. I immediately informed them that the hikers were safe and that I needed some assistance to get back to town. Two days later, I woke up in a hospital with my family all around me. I asked for my grandma before speaking to anyone else. I wanted to know the witch's story. For the first time, my grandma told me the truth about the forest witch and why she attacked people. Turns out, she was the daughter of one of the founding members of our town. She was an introverted girl with a speaking disability, which made her a great disappointment to her family. Many kids in town mocked and bullied her. But as she got older, she found solace in the woods. But on one evening while she was strolling in the woods, some kids from the village played a prank on her, due to which she fell from a tree and hurt her head pretty badly. She did recover physically, but the fall had traumatized her to the extent that she hated the sight of people and started practicing black magic. As the years passed, she moved into the forest and hardly ever came out. She perceived all the people as a threat, and that's why she attacked anyone who passed through her territory. She kills people and eats their flesh, and stores their body parts in the jar for her rituals. People call her a witch as she is a cannibal and had dark powers. Years have passed since my encounter with the forest witch, but to date, people go missing in the forest. And I still think about what would have been my fate if I wasn't able to escape. To be continued. Trends are everywhere nowadays. It's all over social media, on every social platform basically, all over the internet. And while trends are things that seem to be fun, one of these trends ruined my life. My name is Mason Phillips, and this is my story. I used to be a YouTuber, and while not a huge one, I had a pretty decent following. My channel consisted of me and my little brother Todd doing pranks, challenges, basically everything normal YouTubers do. It happened on the 14th of June. I and my little brother Todd decided to do the 24-hour YouTube DoorDash challenge trend. We got so hyped for it, and by the numbers of people talking about it in the comments, we could tell our viewers did too. We started at 6 a.m., as that was when we went live on YouTube. We weren't really getting many orders when it was early, but soon as it reached 9 a.m., we started getting a lot. We didn't have a cameraman, so we just interchanged the camera, the camera being my phone, at intervals between each other. To keep things interesting, we'd do silly things between takes like a backflip or prank calls, all while still delivering every order we got. Around 3 p.m., we had like around 300 viewers on our YouTube Live. I remember being really happy about it, as it was one of the biggest numbers we'd ever got. As time passed, we kept on making numerous deliveries, and before we knew it, the sun was going down, and it was nearing the evening time. We had started running out of orders, and our viewers were dwindling. We were also getting tired as we'd been out since morning, but I was determined to keep the remaining viewers entertained, so we began to do more hilarious stuff in between orders, like screaming at strangers or just saying ridiculous stuff. But the more interesting content we tried to make, the more tired we became, and once it was nighttime, our viewers had reduced to only 20 people. So we decided to take a break for a while. We then entered a nearby restaurant. I didn't know where we were at the time because we had driven around so much that day. So we basically had no idea where we ended up. Even though we weren't doing anything funny, we kept the live going for the remaining 20 people who were watching. I began to feel sleepy now, and I knew my little brother was feeling sleepy too, so I asked him, you want some coffee, Todd? My brother then said, you know I don't like that crap, Mason. With all that had gone on that day, I'd forgotten my little brother didn't like coffee, so I said, oh, I forgot about that, but we need to stay awake, dude. So do you need to take some? He then said, Nah, dude, I'd rather have an energy drink or something. So we called the waitress, and I asked for some food, some coffee, and an energy drink. As she went to get our food, I checked our live. We weren't doing anything interesting, so I wasn't surprised when I saw the number of people watching had dwindled to 10. It was nearing 11 p.m., so I assumed everyone watching had gone to bed. We also weren't getting many orders now because 
No one really ordered food this late at night. As the waitress brought our food, the first thing I noticed was the energy drink they brought for my kid brother. It was called Power, and that was the only word that was written in English on the can. Everything else, like the ingredients, were written in a foreign language. I remember asking her, What kind of energy drink is this? I've never heard of this brand before. She then told me it was an imported brand and that it was the only one she could find. My kid brother, who apparently didn't care where it was from, popped the cap open and began to drink. I remember him saying, It's fine, Mason. These energy drinks are all the same. I then thanked the waitress for the food as she left. After we finished our food, my kid brother Todd started acting weird. His eyes were bloodshot red and he began to shout the words, Let's do this! Shocked, I asked, Are you okay, Todd? My brother then replied, saying, I'm fine, bro. You worry too much. I was about to say something else when the weirdest thing happened. We had received an order. Now, this was really strange to me as it was 1 a.m. in the morning. The message read, I'm really hungry and you guys are the only people that are still active around this area. I just need some burgers and a Coke. I didn't want to do it, but Todd, who was still hyperactive, said, Come on, man, we have to. So I ignored the bad feeling in my gut and I agreed to do it. We were already at a restaurant, so we just ordered the food there. As I said before, I really had no idea where we were, so I just turned on my location and used Google Maps to guide me. After a while, we finally reached the neighborhood and everything was deathly quiet. There were barely any lights on, apart from the dim streetlights. Plus, all the houses looked the same, so I didn't know where to go. I tried calling and messaging the person who ordered the food, but I didn't get any reply. I then told Todd, who was still hyperactive, what was going on. So he got out of the car and said, What about that house? Now, even though I couldn't see well, I could tell the house he pointed at looked pretty abandoned, and I knew no one in their right minds would live there, so I said, Nah, dude, that house looks old. I'm sure no one lives there. Now, I wasn't ready for what happened next, and I'm pretty sure the reason why my kid brother did what he did was because of the strange energy drink he had earlier. Because Todd then slowly looked at me and said, Well, we'll never know unless we find out. He then screamed the words, Dash, dash, dash! At the top of his lungs, and he bolted straight to the house. To be honest, at that moment, I'd forgotten that YouTube Live was still going on as I bolted right after him with my phone still in hand. He was fast and I couldn't catch up to him before he got to the house. The wooden exterior of the house was really old and the place smelled really bad, but none of this was affecting my little brother as he just kept incessantly ringing the surprisingly working doorbell. I remember telling him, let's go dude, no one is here. But Todd completely ignored me and kept on ringing the doorbell. I eventually had enough of his antics and I was about to drag him out of there when it suddenly happened. A huge man broke through the house's wooden door and I instantly felt numerous shards of wood from the broken door pieces through my skin. It felt like a thousand splinters and the force made me fall back on my butt. I then looked up to see a huge man holding a metal rod. Todd, my little brother, had received the full force of the impact because he was standing directly behind the door. He tried to run, but the man struck him on his leg with the rod and I heard my brother's bone break. My brother began to scream out in pain, and the man then proceeded to do something that scarred me for life. He began to repeatedly break my little brother's leg by continuously striking him on the legs with a metal rod. I can still hear every single crack till today. It didn't take long before my brother began to scream my name. Mason! Mason, help me! But I didn't do anything, and it's not because I didn't want to. It was because I couldn't do anything. I was completely paralyzed with fear as I watched that man break my little brother's bones to pieces. Todd's screams continued to get louder, and I could tell this was irritating his attacker. So the man made what seemed to be an animal noise, and he began to hit Todd on the head. It didn't take long before Todd stopped moving, as I could see his head had cracked open. After a while, the man stopped his attacks. Todd's corpse was all bloodied and disfigured now. The man then looked at me as he started to approach. I didn't run because, at that moment, I wanted to die. I'd cowardly let someone murder my kid brother, and I knew if I had survived, I wouldn't be able to face my parents. I was meant to protect them, and I didn't do so. I told myself that it'd be better if we both died here. By now, 
the man was already above me. He hit me on my face with the rod and I felt my nose break. He was about to strike me again when two gunshots were fired and I saw the man drop to the floor. Before I could figure out what happened, I was immediately surrounded by the cops and the last thing I remember from that night was watching the paramedics carry my brother's body as I passed out. I woke up in the hospital to see my parents above me. They had teary eyes and it didn't take long before I began to cry as they both hugged me. The cops came in and asked me for a statement, so I told them everything that happened. When I asked them how they found me, they said they received a call from one of the three remaining viewers who witnessed everything as the YouTube live session was still on. They then told me that since my location was on, all they had to do was track my phone and find me. I had no idea that people were still watching the live. But to whoever you are, thank you for saving my life. Although the man who killed Todd was dead, my parents still asked for his identity, and the cops said they didn't know who he was, as when they ran his prints through the database, the man had no background or identity in the U.S. Again, even though Todd's attacker was brought to justice, losing Todd still hurt me in an unimaginable way. I couldn't help feeling that it was all my fault, and I know I'll keep on feeling this way for the rest of my life. It's been two years since this incident, and it still seems like it happened just yesterday. I have since quit and deleted my YouTube channel in order to deal with the trauma. Most days when I go online, I still see people doing these trends or challenges on social media. And my message to you all is, be careful out there because you never know when something as nice and fun as these trends could ruin your life the same way it ruined mine. Hi guys, my name is Isle. Many in the town I used to live in may not know this, but I'm a hero. Without me, my two innocent little boys would have been victims of something terrible. A being so dark and strange that if it weren't for that being attacking my children, I wouldn't have had the courage to face it face to face. To tell you the truth, I always considered myself a hero. As a kid, I was always the least popular in school. My schoolmates treated me very badly and the adults much worse. My parents were not at all proud of me. They told me that I was going to be a failure and that I was never going to achieve anything. But with hard work and effort, I proved them wrong. Eventually, I got married and had two beautiful children. As soon as I finished high school, I went to college in Antigua. But working in the big city was always something that made me uncomfortable. After a while, I decided to go back to the farm and take care of it. I may not have had an ostentatious life anymore, but you know what? I was happy. And as long as my wife and two children felt that way too, there was no way I could regret this huge decision. I still remember perfectly the day I became a hero. It all happened one morning when I was returning from shopping for my two children. Their mom was at home waiting for me to make lunch, but when I parked the truck, I noticed something was wrong. The boys were running into the cornfield, which I have always strictly forbidden them to do, as I lose sight of them. I was worried they were ignoring me and there had been many children missing in the last few weeks. I headed in their direction to scold them. But first, I was going to leave all the things from the store inside the house. Halfway there, the things I bought fell out of my surprise. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The scarecrow had moved on its own. It was impossible. Its bizarre straw face turned and began to look at me, then came to life and walked in the direction of the children. Oh my God, did you just see what I saw? No, it had to be a mistake. Is there a person inside the scarecrow? Honey, that's impossible. It's been there all day with a stick through it. Oh no, the children. Where are they? I just saw them running. Whatever it is, maybe it's behind them. Oh no, go save them. I'll call the police. Immediately after I saw that, I ran towards the farmyard shouting at the children. I saw them in the distance and they saw me. But for some reason, they panicked and ran even more. I didn't understand why they were so scared to see me. But when I turned around, I realized they weren't looking at me. Behind me, the scarecrow was standing imposingly. Somehow the strange being grabbed me with its soft hand and lifted me up smoothly. It began to choke me with a strength that I could not even consider human. Slowly losing my vision, I was fainting from lack of air. Suddenly, the scarecrow threw me to the ground and with brutal force used his hand to lift me up and slam me to the ground over and over again. I felt like my back was going to break. If I landed too badly on one of those falls, 
I could break my skull. If this being wanted to kill me, it could have done it while it was choking me, but it didn't. This being, whatever it had, could have killed me. This being, whatever he had in front of him, was cruel. He wanted to hurt me. He wanted to make me suffer. I had to get rid of him. I could not allow such a monster to be in front of my children. Suddenly, the scarecrow let go of me and tried to hang me to the ground. But this time, I was ready. With one big kick, I managed to knock him down and make him retreat a few centimeters. I took advantage of this small respite to run in the direction of my children. The trees were too high and I couldn't see them, but they started shouting so I could guess where they were. Dad, please, help us. Someone is after us. Behind me, I heard many noises. I was being followed by this being. I didn't know what it was. I didn't understand how it could be alive, but I didn't care. I just wanted to protect my children. I got almost to the end of the field and found them on the side crying. Hey boys, don't cry. It's all over. I'll take you home and we'll have a nice meal. That scary monster won't hurt you, I promise. Please, get away from us. Daddy is coming. Don't hurt us. Poor kids. They were really shocked. They didn't even recognize me. I tried to grab them by the hands, but I felt something grab me from behind and threw me back against the masonry. I thought it was the scarecrow again. I was ready to fight for my children. But no, it was an ordinary man. My children ran to him. For some reason, they called him daddy. Had they gone crazy? The man stood guard, waiting to attack me if I went first. But soon after, he was joined by other men I recognized from the neighborhood. They all grabbed me and started holding me. Did they think I was the one attacking the children? My own children? The men kicked me to the ground and held me against the fence. I don't know why these people that I'd grown up with, my own neighbors that I've known all my life, were doing something like this to me. But I didn't care. I was not going to let these people kidnap my children. Nothing was going to get me away from my children. In a moment of energy, I managed to free myself from the men who were pressing me against the fence, and I jumped towards the children with a huge leap. In any case, I was going to hug them and take them as far away as possible, no matter how far I had to run to get them out of danger. Suddenly, the man my children called their father caught me before I could get to the children. Once he caught me, we both fell to the ground and started fighting. Everyone was trying to separate us, but at the same time, they were trying to hit me. Little by little, I began to lose strength and the will to fight. I couldn't resist anymore. I had failed my children. I began to lose consciousness as I saw how behind all these people, the scarecrow was standing, staring at me with a huge smile. Soon after, the police arrived and they took me into custody. I told them everything that had happened and for some reason, they didn't believe me. To make it worse, they went to my house and found a room with my 10 other children. I told them that they were my children, like the ones I had saved that day, but they didn't believe me. They took me to court and concluded that I have to go to a center for crazy people to recover. The doctors told me that I have a problem in my head called schizophrenia. I was told that I see and hear things that aren't really there, like the scarecrow. They also told me that I tend to take someone else's children and take them with me, and that with time, I will get better. How dare they tell me that my life is a lie? that I don't really have a wife or children and that everything happens inside my head. I always tell them, yes, and pretend they are right. Only I know the truth, and the truth is that I am a hero. The world is not ready to know that there are things beyond their knowledge. I just hope that Scary Scarecrow doesn't attack again. As soon as I am free, I'm going to keep being a hero. I'm going to save as many children as I can. Hey, my name is Robbie, and I'm a huge horror movie fan. When I say I'm a horror fan, I don't just mean the latest movies, like The Conjuring or Annabelle. No, I really am a living encyclopedia of horror movies. Like any big horror fan, my favorite movie is The Exorcist. I've lost count of the number of times I've seen that movie. I remember everything about it. Every scare, every scene, every dialogue, everything. Some people said I was obsessed with the movie, and to be honest, they might be right. The problem was when my obsession perhaps went too far, and knowing what I was in for, I opened a door that should have never been opened. 
That night, I allowed something evil and cruel to take advantage of my curiosity, and from what I saw that night, I could have suffered a fate far worse than death. It all began on an August afternoon. It was a completely normal day. I didn't expect anything special to happen. I was simply going to take advantage of my day off from work to go run and rest. I didn't really have many motivations. I didn't have a partner, I didn't have many projects, and I lived alone in a huge house since my parents had died in a traffic accident a few years ago. All I wanted to do was watch horror movies, and I was happy with that. I had already had breakfast and was about to go for a run when suddenly, something caught my attention. I received a strange email from an email composed of random letters and a domain I didn't know. The email had written, as requested, here's the original cut of The Exorcist. Underneath, there was a link. I know a little bit about computers, and I knew that opening an unknown link from a strange email would be a bad idea. But I was very curious, and to be honest, I asked them to send me the link. A few days ago, I was on Reddit, and a user was saying that he had the cassette of the original cut of The Exorcist before they made the last edition to take it to the movies. He said he couldn't send us the cassette, but he filmed the whole movie with his camera. I was one of the few people who asked him for it, and to tell the truth, I didn't think he was going to send it to me. Almost hypnotized, I opened the link, praying that my computer would not be invaded by a virus. But to my surprise, nothing of the sort happened. The link took me to a movie ready to play, and when I did, I sat down and watched as The Exorcist began. I transferred from the computer to the television and plopped down on my couch to watch it. At first, the movie was exactly the same as the original. There were a few mistakes and a few scenes out of place. I noticed that the color of the movie was a little different. The sound was also strange, but that was because the person who sent the link was filming a television. The whole movie went normally until, in the middle of the movie, something strange started to happen. Since the scenes with Regan being possessed started to become frequent, I started to feel a strange vibe in the house. As if the sound of the demon's voice was spreading and echoing throughout the dining room of my own house. I felt quite uncomfortable since in all the times I had seen the movie, I never felt this way. It was like watching the movie for the first time. Suddenly, the screen flickered and turned off. I was left in total darkness, all alone. The rain pounded on the window, creating a monotonous sound that accentuated my loneliness. At what point did it start raining? I was about to go for a run. The day was totally clear. I tried to turn on the lights, but they didn't work. My breathing became rapid and shallow as I fought the growing sense of panic. Then a dim light illuminated the dining room. I looked up at the TV screen, which came on by itself, but something was wrong. The movie continued, but it was impossible. The computer was off, and what I saw on the TV was supposed to be broadcasting from there. <laughs> Out of absolute nowhere, a soft giggle echoed in the room. A giggle that didn't come from the movie. This laughter was just like the sounds I heard before only louder. At that moment, I realized that the sounds from before were not coming from the computer. They were coming from my house. The atmosphere became denser as if the air itself was charged with oppressive energy. My muscles tensed and I felt a pressure in my chest as if something invisible was squeezing me. The light on the screen flickered again and this time a blurred figure appeared behind my own reflection. It was a dark shadow, a presence that had no definite shape. It was as if Pazuzu, the same demon I was watching in the movie, was now in my living room watching me. I tried to get up and run, but my body did not respond. I was paralyzed, watching helplessly as the shadow slowly approached. I felt an icy breath on my neck and my skin crawled. The malevolent laughter echoed in my ears, drowning out any other sound. At that moment, the temperature in the room dropped sharply. I could see my own breath in the air, forming small white clouds. The shadow materialized in front of me, fully assuming Pazuzu's form. Its eyes glowed with a demonic light, and its smile was twisted and malicious. I didn't know what to do. I thought 
this was the end. From the dining room, still paralyzed in my seat, I could hear the doors opening violently throughout the house. From the kitchen, I could hear the dishes fall violently from the cupboard, and the glass of the windows began to crack and even break. Pazuzu's silhouette began to slowly float in my direction. It seemed to be enjoying my fear. It was as if it knew it could take its time with me, that I could do nothing to run away or to defend myself. Once I had the figure next to me, he slowly approached me and whispered something in my ear. As soon as he finished speaking, my body froze and I started to cry. I wanted to vomit so badly, but I held it in and stayed on the floor in the fetal position. You wonder what he said in my ear, don't you? To be honest, I have no idea what he said. It's as if whatever he said was lost from my memory as soon as he finished uttering the last letter. I lay on the floor, crying for a while longer. Seconds, minutes, hours passed. The cold of the room was gone, and I was alone. I don't know what had happened with the demon. I just lay on the floor, confused, not aware of where I was or what was happening. Suddenly, the movie titles appeared, and I regained consciousness. It had only been an hour, but it felt like days. As soon as I woke up, I deleted the email where I had received the link to the movie and turned off the computer. I had had enough of The Exorcist for that day. I can imagine what you are thinking. Am I possessed? The answer is no. In the few months that have passed, nothing has happened to me that would lead me to believe such a thing. What I can inform is that since that day, misfortune has followed me. I was fired from my job and I never got a job again. I basically live on my savings. I had several traffic accidents, some more complicated than others, and many of my family members began to die. Any person, be it a girlfriend or a friend who tries to get into my life, starts to go through the same thing I did, so they end up distancing themselves from me. Since that day, I have felt alone, scared, and depressed. It's as if my life is being consumed with each passing second. I really don't know what I saw that day. But I feel that, just like the actors and people who worked on The Exorcist, I am now cursed. Urban legends and myths have always been something my friends and I used to have a lot of fun with while growing up. We would occasionally scare or prank each other, but apart from this childish interest, we never really took any steps to find out if these myths were real or not. That was until our last week in high school when we decided it was time to take the next step. My friend Jason and I had watched a couple of YouTube videos where people played games summoning myths and demons. From Charlie Charlie to Bloody Mary, the idea of encountering a supernatural being or spirit intrigued us and left us asking if these myths were truly myths or actual reality. A question that would eventually leave us all wishing we never asked. It was our last week of high school, and while most people our age were out partying and planning, I decided what my friends and I needed to do together before leaving for college was something we'd always wanted to do. My parents were out of town that week, so I figured there was no better time. I got on my computer and looked up some of the most popular urban myths to summon, but most instructions were either unclear or too complicated to carry out in my home. Eventually, I found a site that had listed numerous urban legends, stories, and instructions on how to summon, although warning against it. I spent a while on the site till I eventually found a game I had never heard of. One Man Hide and Seek. The next day I told my friends about the plan. Sophie was skeptical at first, but Jason and I helped her relax and I told them to come over later that day so I could explain the rules and what I would need from each of them. Okay guys, this is called one man hide and seek, and the rules of the game are simple. I continued. First, we need a doll that doesn't look human but has limbs. So Sophie, I think one of your rag dolls as a kid should work. Next, we cut the doll open with a needle, removing its stuffing and filling it with rice. I was interrupted by Jason saying, Sorry, did you say rice? I replied, Yes, the rice attracts the demon. Then we clip our nails and put them in with the rice. We aren't supposed to put the nails of other people or else they might get hurt. After that, 
we take a piece of red thread and sew the dial back up without cutting off the extra length. Instead, we take the extra length and tie it around the dowel before tying the two ends together. Um, the site said this represents the dowel's blood vessels and traps the spirit into the dowel. I was interrupted again by Sophie and Jason laughing, but I couldn't understand why they found it a bit funny. So I continued reading the instructions. We filled the bathtub with water and put the dowel in there to separate the spirit world from the real world. Then we find a room with a TV to hide in. So I was thinking the living room. We purify the room we're hiding in. Jason, your mom still has those instant candles she uses for yoga, right? Jason simply nodded and I continued. We'll place a cup of salt water and the needle in the room. Then we give the doll a name. Not ours and not anyone we know. Jason raised his hand before saying, Lucia. Sophie and I didn't seem to have any issues with the name, so I continued giving instructions. It was getting a bit late now, so I decided to hurry up. After that, we turn off all the lights and devices apart from the TV. Then we say to the doll three times, we are the first it. Then we run to the room, turn on the TV, and stay as quiet as possible. Sophie then said, hold on, why does the TV have to be on and what happens if we aren't quiet enough? Are you scared? He said laughing. I responded with, the room went silent for a while, but I continued. We close our eyes and count to 10. Once we're done, we get the needle, go back to the bathtub and say to the doll, we have found you, Lucia. Then we cut the thread, binding the doll and say three times, Lucia, you are the next it. We turn the doll to the tub and hide in the room. We remain as silent as possible, fill our mouths with salt water and search for Lucia. Most times it remains in the bathroom, so no need to worry. When we find the doll, we spray the salt water from our mouths on its face and say, we have found you. Then we burn the doll and discard its remains. I looked up to see a worried look on Sophie's face and she eventually said, so what happens if it's not in the bathroom and we can't find it? I didn't have an answer to that, so I responded with, the site doesn't say anything about that, but that's why we have to keep the salt water on us as protection. That's it. The concern on their faces became more obvious, and a part of me began to think, maybe it wasn't such a good idea. But I brushed the feeling off, and they simply went home agreeing to be back at mine by midnight. Sophie returned around 11 p.m., as she said. She didn't want to be out on the streets by midnight, while Jason, on the other hand, didn't arrive until 1 in the morning. I wasn't sure we had enough time to set up, as the game had to be played at exactly 3 a.m., but immediately, Jason arrived we had it all set up in around 30 minutes. The rag doll Sophie had gotten was green and was also missing one of its button eyes, but we didn't think that would be a problem as the doll didn't look human at all and that was all that mattered. Eventually, it was almost 3 a.m. and it seemed Jason had gotten over his paranoia if he had any, as no one was more excited than him to play the game. At around 2.58 a.m., we turned the lights off, turned on the TV, and before we knew it, it was time. We all walked into the bathroom, and the sight of a floating rag doll in a bathtub filled with water wasn't as creepy as I thought it would be. Jason walked up to Lucia, picked her up, and said, Jason, Sophie, and Mark are the first it. Jason, Sophie, and Mark are the first it. Jason, Sophie, and Mark are the first it. He returned the doll to the tub, and we all moved back to the living room. Nothing out of the ordinary was happening, so we closed our eyes and began counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Before I could say 10, I heard a thud followed by a light scream. So I immediately opened my eyes to see Jason holding on to Sophie and laughing. We stayed laughing for a while before eventually deciding to finish the game. I returned to the bathroom to see the doll still floating in the tub. At this point, I was feeling more comfortable now, so I picked up the doll and cut the thread with the needle before saying, We have found you. You are the next it, Lucia. It was only as I said those words, I realized something strange. Despite being submerged in water for a while now, the doll in my hand was nowhere near wet. In fact, 
it almost felt completely dry. I returned the doll to the tub and we immediately went back to the living room, to the living room and filled our mouths with salt water. After waiting for a while, once again, nothing strange happened and I could see relief on Sophie's face. At this point, I decided it was time to finally end the game. But as we began walking towards the bathroom, Jason spat the water from his mouth and said, <laughs> This was fun, guys, but it was obviously all a load of crap. I opened the door once again, expecting to see the funny sight of a ragdoll floating in my tub for the third time that night. But all I felt that instant were chills run down my spine. Literally. The bathroom was eerily cold, and I could almost hear my heartbeat as I was met by the sight of the bathtub filled with nothing but completely still water. What the hell? Jason said. But before he could say more, he heard a loud sound come from the living room. We slowly walked back into the living room to see the TV randomly changing channels from one to another before eventually losing audio and then switching off plunging the room into darkness. I immediately rushed to turn on the lights. A look of fear was all over Sophie and Jason's face, and I couldn't help but wonder if I had made a terrible mistake making them play the game. Guys, let's just calm down, find the doll, and spray the salt water on its face. As long as we stay together, we should be fine. Sophie responded with, Why can't we just leave and go home? I could tell she was completely bothered now, so I replied calmly, the site warned us against leaving because our nails are in the dial. It won't just let us go on with our lives. So relax. Come on. Let's just find the dial. We looked around the house for about an hour. All the while, hearing loud thuds and sounds that didn't seem normal to anyone. The phones had lost all signal and leaving the house wasn't an option. The longer we took, the more things we began to hear. And eventually... We could hear what seemed like laughter coming from all around the house. It was a deep laugh, and we couldn't tell exactly which direction it was coming from. That was until the voice finally spoke. Mark, Sophie, Jason, if what you seek is to return me to my realm, then come find me upstairs. But I warn you, I will not return alone. A soul must come back with me. The voice was strangely deep, and the house felt extremely cold now. What does that mean? Sophie said. Jason responded with, You know what it means. They looked at me as if asking what next to do, but I was completely scared now, and I could tell they were too. Let's go find it. Here. I said, handing them the glass of salt water. No matter what, don't let the salt water out of your mouths and let's stay together. Immediately, we walked upstairs. We could feel the temperature drop and more laughter filled the house. Only this time, it was obviously coming from my parents' room. Jason began walking towards the room while we followed behind. And as we arrived at the door, everything went completely silent. Jason slowly pushed the door open, but before we could walk in, he was pulled in and the door slammed behind him. I immediately began banging on the door, but it was as if someone was holding it firmly in place. I kept kicking and kicking till eventually it broke, and I walked into the horrific sight of Lucia seated on Jason. His hands appeared to be pinned to the floor, and although Lucia's hands weren't even close to Jason, huge claw-like marks were all over his chest. I stood frozen, looking at the horrific scene of my best friend Jason being mutilated by a doll. The doll abruptly paused and looked at me for a second. I could almost see a smile on its face, but before I could react, it was immediately covered in salt water from Sophie's mouth. Later that night, I burnt the doll and discarded its remains. The phone started working not long after the doll was burnt, and Sophie quickly called an ambulance. Jason survived the encounter, and no matter how many times we tried to explain the situation, there was no way the police were going to be convinced what we were saying was actually the truth. The police tried for months to make sense of the case, as the marks on Jason didn't seem human at all, and his story correlated with ours, but eventually they closed the case, stating we had been under the influence and Jason was probably attacked by an animal that night. A conclusion I could only wish was true. After that night, 
our curiosity for urban myths and legends completely faded, and sadly, so did our friendship. I am a father now, and I still spend hours wondering why the demon left Jason alive. The sleepless nights are less now, but I'll never forgive myself for putting their lives in danger, all in the name of an urban myth. Despite my experience, I wouldn't tell you all urban myths have some truth behind them, but I know for a fact that you should never play the game. One man, hide and seek. Even though some men use it, the truth is that the ones who almost always create content are women. I never created content, nor was it public from the people who do. So when my girlfriend told me she had a new job, I never imagined it was only fans. Not that there's anything wrong with that. The bad thing is that under my nose was something so dark and sinister that you only expect it to happen in your worst nightmares. I remember everything that happened as if it was yesterday. And how could I not remember it? It was a Wednesday morning. Anna, my girlfriend, was looking for a new job after quitting a heavy office job that took her 10 hours and six days a week. And her salary was pretty bad. Anna had always been very good with computers. That year, she had finished a degree in web programming and was ready to enter the job market. But Anna's most characteristic trait was her curiosity. Her curiosity always allowed her to learn to do new things and start many new projects. But this time, her curiosity would ruin her life. It all started well. At first, Anna just told me that she got a job, and that's why we were seeing each other a little less. She told me that she didn't want to talk about it much, and honestly, I understood her. She was quite shy, and I knew I had to respect her time to talk and tell things. Anyway, I was preparing for a lot of exams, and I also had a lot of work to do. So time was also against me. Before we left the cafeteria where we were, Anna also paid my part of the bill. I remember that I offered to pay, which she flatly refused, and with a smile, she asked to take care of it. This made me very happy. Not because of the money I saved, but because Anna was doing well. That was the last time I saw her for almost two weeks. I know there are couples who see each other that often, but with Anna, it was different. We used to see each other almost every day. And now that we don't see each other, even on her day off, was very strange to me. I thought about going to her house and paying her a surprise visit. I didn't really expect to find her with another man or anything similar. I believed in her word and trusted her. That's why I was so surprised by what I found when I used the copy of the keys she gave me to enter her house. As soon as I entered, her house had changed. In the center of the dining room were a large amount of cameras and a lot of lighting tools. In the middle of all this setup was her, made up and in her underwear. As soon as she saw me, she panicked and almost got angry, asking me what I was doing there. In response, I told her that I wanted to pay her a surprise visit. At that moment, the one who really got angry was me. Not because she had opened an OnlyFans without telling me, but because she lied to me. She told me that she had found a programming job and that it took most of her time. At first, she told me that she had found a programming job and that she was doing this on her day off. But I knew Anna. I knew she was lying to me, and if it wasn't so serious, she would never have brought lighting and cameras as good as the ones she had. Crying, she apologized and promised not to lie to me again. She told me that she had her reasons and that she had to do it. She also told me that she couldn't tell me, but that I should trust her. I was angry sitting there talking to her while I was thinking about whether I should go home or not when suddenly I saw that she was not paying attention to me. Instead of listening to me, she was answering someone on the computer with a forced, awkward smile. That was enough. I was furious. I stood up and told her I was going to leave when suddenly I felt a metal object hit me from behind. She had hit me in the head with something. I found it harder and harder to keep my balance and fell to the ground seeing Anna crying with a frying pan in her hand. When I woke up, I felt like I had slept a lot. My head hurt so much from the blow Anna had given me. I tried to get up and leave, but I was tied to a chair. Suddenly, 
Anna appeared in front of me and walked slowly towards me. She had a huge knife in her hand and was looking at me, crying as if asking for forgiveness. I tried to scream, but my mouth was taped shut. I was desperate. I knew there was nothing I could do. Anna was about to kill me, and I didn't know why. When she was in front of me, she raised the knife and tried to stab me in the chest. But before she did, she stopped. I can't. I can't do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Anna took the tape off of my mouth and told me I had to get out of there as soon as possible. She told me to call the police and to warn her family. Suddenly, the light in her house went out and Anna screamed in terror. Only the notebook was on and Anna ran to close it. Confused, I asked her what was going on and she explained everything. This job, this wasn't only fans. And not only was she not working, she was a hostage. A few weeks earlier, she was applying for several web programming jobs. After a few hours, she got bored and opened her Tor browser to explore the deep web. She had been there before, but never before had she dared to go so deep into the web. Her curiosity led her to keep exploring until she found a lot more than she expected. She found a red room. Immediately after witnessing it, her computer rebooted itself and her camera turned on. She didn't know how to turn it off because even after formatting it, the camera kept turning on. A few days later, she received a message that left her bewildered. In those messages were pictures of her family, her brothers leaving school, and her mother leaving work. There were even pictures of me in my apartment. And that's it. They're paying me to do live shows, but this is not OnlyFans. If I don't log on for one of the live shows, all my loved ones are going to die. <laughs> They told me to kill you, but I couldn't. And now, I will suffer the consequences. <laughs> Anna, no. I won't let anything happen to you. You're a good man. I wish I could believe you. Immediately after telling me that, Anna hugged me in tears, telling me that she was terrified for her family's life. Immediately after that, we both began to see shadows walking by the dark window of her house. The shadows came and went. They were surrounding us. The glass in the house began to break at the same time. Anna stayed hugging me. She never hugged me so tight. She hugged me as if it was the last time I would ever do it in my life. And indeed, it was. Through the windows, terrifying men in jungle animal masks entered. Without mercy, one of them brutally beat me before I could defend myself while the other two lifted Anna by the arms and carried her away. All I could do was listen to her crying, asking me to please protect her parents and not to try to find her. Meanwhile, the man continued to beat me mercilessly. When his other two companions had left, he simply stopped, turned around, and left. He showed me no anger, happiness, amusement, nothing. He just kicked me like I was garbage, and when necessary, left me on the floor, bloody and crying for Anna. As quickly as those terrifying men entered and occupied the entire house, they simply left. The house was totally empty with no light. I took out my cell phone to call the police, but it was gone. Surely that man must have stolen it while he was beating me. I ran desperately and rang all the doorbells on the block. But they all turned off the lights and ignored me. I was desperate, screaming for help until one person opened up and let me use his phone. Once the police arrived and I told them everything that happened, they didn't really believe me. For a few hours, I was a suspect in Anna's disappearance. But after the truth was revealed by watching some street cameras, I was cleared of all suspicion. Once the family found out everything that happened, they confessed to me that Anna made a very strange phone call the same day, and that next day, they were going to go see her. They took her word for it, and to take care of the children, they moved. As I told you before, I never saw Anna again. Today, I am still afraid that whoever took her will keep their word and come after me too. I must tell you, I would even like that to happen so I can see the faces of those who kidnapped her. My name is Timothy Malone. 
And this is a story about how a fast food restaurant I barely went to nearly ended my life in just one visit. One night, about four months ago, my girlfriend Monica and I had been out with some friends until around 11 p.m. On our drive, we both talked about how we were extremely hungry and would like to find something to eat. Not long after, we found a Wendy's close by, and although I had only been to Wendy's a few times, we parked and walked in to get some food. Now at the time, there was no one else in the restaurant, except one single employee who was working that night. The employee was a middle-aged man with a beard. He looked extremely skinny for his age, and his eyes were glassy and looked like he had been on some sort of drug. After we walked in, my girlfriend decided she was going to use the restroom, leaving me alone with the man to order. As I ordered our meals, something about the man seemed frightening to me. He uncomfortably held eye contact, and not once did he say a single word. I figured I was just being paranoid as strangers always seemed creepier to me at night. About 15 minutes passed and I began to worry as my girlfriend still hadn't come back from the toilet, so I decided to go check and see if she was okay. I knocked on the door, but there was no response from Monica. I was about to go in when I noticed flashing lights coming from the crack under the door, and not long after, Monica walked out, pale-faced, with dead eyes. Hey, what took you so long? Are you okay? I said. Monica simply walked past me and back to where our food was. I immediately followed her and stood in front of her to make sure she was fine. Monica still didn't respond to me. She simply looked over at the man, and they both shared an eerie strange look as if they had an understanding of sorts. That's when Monica suddenly grabbed a knife from across the counter and swung it at me, cutting my chest. I was completely shocked and in pain as I let out a loud scream. Monica then began to swing the knife frantically at me, cutting me on my arm a couple of times. I eventually managed to grab her arm and hit the knife out of her hand before hitting her on the head and saying, What are you doing? Me hitting her seemed to snap her out of whatever trance she was in, and before I could even begin to contemplate what had just happened, the Wendy's employee quickly ran to the back and out of the store. After talking with Monica and explaining what had happened, Monica informed me she couldn't remember even walking out of the toilet and decided to look in the toilet. We walked in to check what was in there, and I discovered the source of the flashing lights I had seen earlier was an old box TV that had a weird video on loop. The video displayed different random shapes, colors, and images. We quickly called the police, and in a few minutes, they arrived. The head officer in charge was shocked by our story. He explained that in the first place, that particular Wendy's was supposed to be closed throughout the week, and the man we had described did not have any prior records that might lead them to him. He also explained some form of hypnosis had been used on Monica, but until they took the time to look deeper into that, there was nothing much he could do. We drove back later that night, paranoid and worried about the strange man following us. Ever since that day, Neither my girlfriend nor I have been to another Wendy's fast food restaurant. And quite frankly, we never will. For as long as I can remember, I have seen many horror videos where the most terrifying Uber driver stalks, looking for victims to kill. Everyone has a story with an Uber. But you know what? I have more stories than you do. You see, I'm not the passenger. I'm the Uber driver. I understand that it may seem a little scary to get into a stranger's car, but Uber notifies passengers of all my information and the number of rides I've taken. On the other hand, imagine how scary it is to have not just one stranger, but dozens of strangers get into your car every day. And you know what is worse than that? When that stranger inside the car is not a passenger or a human. This happened on a Sunday night. I had finished making all the trips for the night and was ready to go home, so I turned off the app before finishing the last trip. When I dropped the girl off at her house, I took the avenue road to get home quickly. The avenue used to be the fastest way, but there was always a lot of traffic. Luckily, at this time of the morning, it was completely empty. I continued driving home. I may have become confident in the fact that the avenue was empty, so calmness took over my body and I started to fall asleep. Working at this time is usually pretty good if you are an Uber driver. Sundays are usually very busy as many people visit their families and come back at night. I was trying hard not to fall asleep until suddenly something forced me to wake up. A girl was in the middle of the avenue. I reacted as fast as I could to swerve to avoid her, but I couldn't do it in time. I was sure I had hit her. 
that something very strange was happening. I didn't feel the impact of the body in the car. I didn't hear the girl or her body falling on the road either. Could it be that she had dodged me in time? But that was impossible. No one could move that fast. I braked the car as fast as I could as I got out to inspect if the girl was hurt, but nothing. The avenue was totally empty. I looked under the car and found no one either. There was no girl, no person, nothing. It was as if the girl had never been here. Confused and considering that maybe it was all because I had fallen asleep, I got into the car, ready to go to sleep and never come back to work so late. I started the car again and began to drive. A few meters later, I came to a red light. There would be nothing wrong with the driving. The avenue was empty, but I wanted to respect the rules. I had already had too big a scare with the little girl. Suddenly, I felt that something was wrong, like a cold going through my spine. I felt I had to look in the rearview mirror, but if I did, I would surely regret it. Against my better judgment, I decided to appeal to logic and look in the driver's door mirror. What was the worst that could happen? Maybe I would run into the girl on the road. I thought that would be strange for sure, but at least I would know that she was alive and maybe lost. I gathered all my courage and looked into the rearview mirror. But not to my surprise, there was no one there. Just an empty avenue. I took a breath, now much calmer, when I saw how the traffic light was still red. The strange thing is that I still felt that strange feeling of terror in my back. At that moment, the corner of my eye drifted almost reflexively to the mirror in the center of the car. And when I saw what was in the passenger seat, I gave a dry scream. In the passenger seat, which had not opened and all the windows were closed, I saw the girl from the road. She was in a schoolgirl uniform. Her hair was very long and covered half of her face. I could only see one of her two eyes, but that was enough to freeze me with fear in a way nothing else ever had. Her gaze was piercing, cold and terrifying. She wasn't looking at me angrily, but her eye was as wide open as physically possible. I turned around quickly, but the same thing I had seen in the mirror, I could not see with my eyes. Behind me, there was no one. I looked in the rearview mirror again and the girl was still there, staring at me in the same position. This didn't make any sense at all. I turned around and in confusion. Ah! The girl was behind me. She was slowly coming towards me. I tried to open my car door to escape, but suddenly it was locked. I had never locked it before. It didn't make any sense. I tried to roll down the car windows but they were locked. I grabbed my keys and unlocked the door as fast as I could. As I did so, I looked back. The girl was gone. But I wasn't going to stay in that car for one more second. As soon as I got out, I started running home. I ran and ran as fast as I could. Minutes passed and I was still running. My house was almost five kilometers away from where I was, but I ran all of them without considering sitting down to rest even for a second. I got into my house and went straight to bed. With all the lights on and the TV on, I started crying. From that day on, nothing was the same. For the first weeks, nothing happened. I even allowed myself to try to forget what had happened, but I couldn't help but feel that something was wrong. I sent a tow truck to pick up my car, which I sold for a ridiculously low price in a very short time. But I'm afraid... It wasn't the car that was the problem. Every night I wake up at the same time. The time I almost ran over that little girl. When I do, I feel like I'm not alone in the house. It is as if someone or something is watching me in the dark. Even when I leave the lights on, when I wake up, they are off. I tried sleeping at a friend's house or with someone at my house, but nothing changed. I feel that one of these days, whatever is chasing me will catch me and I can do absolutely nothing to avoid it.